Chapter Thirteen, Part Two of Rural Rides. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Rural Rides by William Cobbett. Chapter Thirteen, Part Two. Thursley, Surrey, Thursday, seventh August. I got a boy at Selborne to show me along the lanes out into Woolmer Forest on my way to Headley. The lanes were very deep. The wet malm, just about the colour of rye meal mixed up with water, and just about as clammy, came in many places very nearly up to my horse's belly. There was this comfort, however, that I was sure that there was a bottom, which is by no means the case when you are among clays or quicksands. After going through these lanes, and along between some fir plantations, I came out upon Wilmer Forest, and to my great satisfaction soon found myself on the side of those identical plantations which have been made under the orders of the smooth Mr. Huskisson, and which I noticed last year in my ride from Hambledon to this place. These plantations are of fir, or at least I could see nothing else, and they never can be of any more use to the nation than the sprigs of heath which cover the rest of the forest. Is there nobody to inquire what becomes of the income of the Crown lands? No, and there never will be, until the whole system be changed. I have seldom ridden on pleasanter ground, than that which I found between Wilmer Forest and this beautiful village of Thursley. The day has been fine too, notwithstanding I saw the judges' terrific wigs as I came up upon the turnpike road from the village of Itchen. I had but one little scud during the day, just enough for St. Swithin to swear by, but when I was upon the hills I saw some showers going about the country. From Selborne I had first to come to Headley, about five miles. I came to the identical public-house where I took my blind guide last year, who took me such a dance to the southward, and led me up to the top of Hindhead at last. I had no business there. My route was through a sort of hamlet called Chert, which lies along on the side and towards the foot of the north of Hindhead, on which side also lies the village of Thursley. A line is hardly more straight than is the road from Headley to Thursley, and a prettier ride I never had in the course of my life. It was not the less interesting from the circumstance of its giving me all the way a full view of Crooksbury Hill, the grand scene of my exploits, when I was a taker of the nests of crows and magpies. At Chert I had, upon my left, three hills out upon the common, called the Devil's Jumps. The Unitarians will not believe in the Trinity, because they cannot account for it. Will they come here to Chert, go and look at these Devil's Jumps, and account to me for the placing of these three hills, in the shape of three rather squat sugar-loaves, along in a line upon this heath, or the placing of a rock-stone upon the top of one of them, as big as a church tower? For my part, I cannot account for this placing of these hills. That they should have been formed by mere chance is hardly to be believed. How could waters rolling about have formed such hills? How could such hills have bubbled up from beneath? But in short, it is all wonderful alike. The stripes of loam running down through the chalk hills, the circular parcels of loam in the midst of chalk hills, the lines of flint running parallel with each other horizontally along the chalk hills the flints placed in circles as true as a hair in the chalk hills, the layers of stone at the bottom of hills of loam, the chalk first soft, then some miles further on, becoming chalk stone, then after another distance becoming burr stone, as they call it, and at last becoming hard white stone fit for any buildings, the sandstone at Hindhead becoming harder and harder, till it becomes very nearly iron in Herefordshire, and quite iron in Wales, but indeed they once dug iron out of this very Hindhead, the clouds coming and settling upon the hills, sinking down and creeping along, at last coming out again in springs, and those becoming rivers, why it is all equally wonderful, and as to not believing in this or that, because the thing cannot be proved by logical deduction, why is any man to believe in the existence of a god any more than he is to believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? For my part I think the devil's jumps, as the people here call them, full as wonderful and no more wonderful than hundreds and hundreds of other wonderful things. It is a strange taste which our ancestors had, to ascribe no inconsiderable part of these wonders of nature to the devil. Not far from the devil's jumps is that singular place, which resembles a sugar-loaf inverted, hollowed out, and an outside rim only left. This is called the devil's punch-bowl, and it is very well known in Wiltshire, that the forming, or perhaps it is the breaking up, of Stonehenge, is ascribed to the devil, and that the mark of one of his feet, is now said to be seen in one of the stones. I got to Thursley about sunset, and without experiencing any inconvenience from the wet. I have mentioned the state of the corn as far as Selborne, 
On this side of that village I find it much forwarder than I found it, between Selborne and Ropley Dean. I am here got into some of the very best barley land in the kingdom, a fine, buttery, stoneless loam, upon a bottom of sand or sandstone. Finer barley and turnip land it is impossible to see. All the corn is good here, the wheat not a heavy crop, but not a light one, and the barley all the way along from Headley to this place, as fine if not finer than I ever saw it in my life. Indeed, I have not seen a bad field of barley since I left the wind. The corn is not so forward here as under Ports Down Hill, but some farmers intend to begin reaping wheat in a few days. It is monstrous to suppose that the price of corn will not come down. It must come down, good weather or bad weather. If the weather be bad, it will be so much the worse for the farmer, as well as for the nation at large, and can be of no benefit to any human being but the Quakers, who must now be pretty busy measuring the crops all over the kingdom. It will be recollected that in the report of the Agricultural Committee of 1821, it appeared from the evidence of one Hodgson, a partner of Cropper, Benson and Co. Quakers of Liverpool, that these Quakers sent a set of corn-gauges into the several counties, just before every harvest, that these fellows stopped here and there, went into the fields, measured off square yards of wheat, clipped off the ears, and carried them off. These they afterwards packed up and sent off to Cropper and Co. at Liverpool. When the whole of the packets were got together, they were rubbed out, measured, weighed, and an estimate made of the amount of the coming crop. This, according to the confession of Hodgson himself, enabled these Quakers to speculate in corn, with the greater chance of gain. This has been done by these men for many years. Their disregard of worldly things, their desire to lay up treasures in heaven, their implicit yielding to the spirit, these have induced them to send their corn gauges over the country regularly year after year, and I will engage that they are at it at this moment. The farmers will bear in mind that the new trespass law, though clearly not intended for any such purpose, enables them to go and seize by the throat any of these gauges that they may catch in their fields. They could not do this formally. To cut off standing corn was merely a trespass, for which satisfaction was to be attained by action at law. But now you can seize the caitiff who has come as a spy amongst your corn. Before he could be off and leave you to find out his name as you could. But now you can lay hold of him, as Mr. Deller did of the Duke's man, and bring him before a magistrate at once. I do hope that the farmers will look sharp out for these fellows, who are neither more nor less than so many spies. They hold a great deal of corn, they want blight, mildew, rain, hurricanes, but happy I am to see that they will get no blight, at any rate. The grain is formed. Everywhere everybody tells me that there is no blight in any sort of corn, except in the beans. I have not gone through much of a bean country. The beans that I have seen are some of them pretty good, more of them but middling, and still more of them very indifferent. I am very happy to hear that that beautiful little bird, the American partridge, has been introduced with success to this neighbourhood, by Mr. Leach at Lee. I am told that they have been heard whistling this summer, that they have been frequently seen, and that there is no doubt that they have broods of young ones. I tried several times to import some of these birds, but I always lost them, by some means or other, before the time arrived for turning them out. They are a beautiful little partridge, and extremely interesting in all their manner. Some persons call them quail. If any one will take a quail and compare it with one of these birds, he will see that they cannot be of the same sort. In my year's residence in America I have, I think, clearly proved that these birds are partridges, and not quails. In the United States, north of New Jersey, they are called quail. South and southwest of New Jersey, they are called partridges. They have been called quails solely on account of their size, for they have none of the manners of quail belonging to them. Quails assemble in flocks like larks, starlings, or rooks. Partridges keep in distinct coveys. That is to say, the brood lives distinct from all other broods, until the ensuing spring, when it forms itself into pairs and separates. Nothing can be a distinction more clear than this. Our own partridges stick to the same spot from the time that they are hatched, to the time that they pair off, and these American partridges do the same. Quails, like larks, get together in flocks at the approach of winter, and move about according to the season, to a greater or less distance from the place where they were bred. These, therefore, which have been brought to Thursley, are partridges, and if they be suffered to live quietly for a season or two, they will stock the whole of that part of the country, where the delightful intermixture of cornfields, coppices, heaths, furze fields, ponds, and rivulets, is singularly favourable to their increase. The turnips cannot fail to be good in such a season and in such land, yet the farmers are most dreadfully tormented with the weeds, and with the superabundant turnips. Here, my lord Liverpool, is overproduction indeed. They have sown their fields broadcast, 
they have no means of destroying the weeds by the plough, they have no intervals to bury them in, and they hoe or scratch, as Mr. Tull calls it, and then comes St. Swithin and sets the weeds and the hoed-up turnips again. Then there is another hoeing or scratching, and then comes St. Swithin again, so that there is ho, ho, muddle, muddle, and such a fretching and stewing, such a looking up to Hindhead to see when it is going to be fine, when, if that beautiful field of twenty acres, which I have now before my eyes, and wherein I see half a dozen men hoeing and poking and muddling, looking up to see how long it is before they must take to their heels, to get under the trees to obtain shelter from the coming shower. When, I say, if that beautiful field had been sowed upon ridges, at four feet apart, according to the plan in my year's residence, not a weed would have been to be seen in the field. The turnip plants would have been three times the size that they now are. The expense would have not been a fourth part of that which has already taken place. And all the muddling and poking about of weeds, and all the fretting and all the stewing, would have been spared. And as to the amount of the crop, I am now looking at the best land in England for Swedish turnips, and I have no scruple to assert that if it had been sown after my manner, it would have had a crop double the weight of that which it now will have. I think I know of a field of turnips, sown much later than the field now before me, and sown in rows at nearly four feet apart, which have a crop double the weight of that which will be produced in yon beautiful field. Rygate, Surrey, Friday, 8th August At the end of a long, twisting-about ride, but a most delightful ride, I got to this place about nine o'clock in the evening. From Thursley I came to Brook, and there crossed the turnpike road from London to Chichester, through Godalming and Midhurst. Thence I came on, turning upon the left upon the sand-hills of Hambledon, in Surrey, mind. On one of these hills is one of those precious jobs called semaphores. For what reason this pretty name is given to a sort of telegraph-house, stuck up at public expense upon a high hill? For what reason this outlandish name is given to the thing, I must leave the reader to guess. But as to the thing itself, I know that it means this. A pretence for giving a good sum of the public money away every year, to some one that the borough system has condemned this labouring and toiling nation to provide for. The dead weight of nearly about six million sterling a year, that is to say, this curse entailed upon the country, on account of the late wars against the liberties of the French people, this dead weight is, however, falling in part at least, upon the landed jolterheads, who were so eager to create it, and who thought that no part of it would fall upon themselves. Theirs has been a grand mistake. They saw the war carried on without any loss or any cost to themselves. By the means of paper money and loans, the labouring classes were made to pay the whole of the expenses of the war. When the war was over, the jolterheads thought they would get gold back again to make all secure. And some of them really said, I am told, that it was high time to put an end to the gains of the paper money people. The jolterheads quite overlooked the circumstance that, in returning to gold, they doubled and trebled what they had to pay on account of the debt, and that at last they were bringing the burden upon themselves. Grand also was the mistake of the jolterheads when they approved of the squanderings upon the dead weight. They thought that the labouring classes were going to pay the whole of the expenses of the knights of Waterloo, and of the other heroes of the war. The jolterheads thought that they should have none of this to pay. Some of them had relations belonging to the dead weight, and all of them were willing to make the labouring classes toil like asses for the support of those who had what was called fought and bled, for Gatton and old Sarum. The jolterheads have now found, however, that a pretty good share of the expense is to fall upon themselves. Their mortgagees are letting them know that semaphores and such pretty things cost something, and that it is unreasonable for a loyal country gentleman, a friend of social order and of the blessed comforts of religion, to expect to have semaphores and to keep his estate too. This dead weight is unquestionably a thing such as the world never saw before. Here are not only a tribe of pensioned naval and military officers, commissaries, quartermasters, pursers, and God knows what besides. Not only these, but their wives and children are to be pensioned, after the death of the heroes themselves. Nor does it signify, it seems, whether the hero were married before he became part of the dead weight or since. Upon the death of the man the pension is to begin with the wife, and a pension for each child, so that if there be a large family of children, the family in many cases actually gains by the death of the father. Was such a thing as this ever before heard of in the world? Any man that is going to die has nothing to do but to marry a girl, to give her a pension for life, to be paid out of the sweat of the people. And it was distinctly stated during the session of Parliament before the last, that the widows and children of insane officers were to have the same treatment as the rest. Here is the envy of surrounding nations and the admiration of the world. 
In addition, then, to twenty thousand parsons, more than twenty thousand stockbrokers and stock-jobbers, perhaps, forty or fifty thousand tax-gatherers, thousands upon thousands of military and naval officers in full pay, in addition to all these, here are the thousands upon thousands of pairs of this dead weight, all busily engaged in breeding gentlemen and ladies, and all while Malthus is wanting to put a check upon the breeding of the labouring classes, all receiving a premium for breeding. Where is Malthus? Where is this check population parson? Where are his friends, the Edinburgh reviewers? Faith, I believe they have given him up. They begin to be ashamed of giving countenance to a man who wants to check the breeding of those who labour, while he says not a word about those two hundred thousand breeding pairs whose offspring are necessarily to be maintained at the public charge. Well may these fatteners upon the labour of others rail against the radicals. Let them once take the fan to their hand, and they will, I warrant it, thoroughly purge the floor. However, it is a consolation to know that the jolterheads who have been the promoters of the measures that have led to these heavy charges, it is a consolation to know that the jolterheads have now to bear part of the charges, and that they cannot any longer make them fall exclusively upon the shoulders of the labouring classes. The disgust that one feels at seeing the whiskers and hearing the copper heels rattle is in some measure compensated for by the reflection that the expense of them is now beginning to fall upon the malignant and tyrannical jolterheads who are the principal cause of their being created. Bidding the semaphore good-bye, I came along by the church at Hambledon, and then crossed a little common and the turnpike road from London to Chichester through Godalming and Petworth, not Midhurst as before. The turnpike road here is one of the best that I ever saw. It is like the road upon Hawley Common near Worth, and like that between Godston and East Grinstead, and the cause of this is that it is made of precisely the same sort of stone which, they tell me, is brought in some cases even from Blackdown Hill, which cannot be less, I should think, than twelve miles distant. This stone is brought in great lumps and then cracked into little pieces. The next village I came to after Hambledon was Hascombe, famous for its beach, insomuch that it is called Hascombe Beach. There are two lofty hills here, between which you go out of the sandy country, down into the weald. Here are hills of all heights and forms. Whether they came in consequence of a boiling of the earth, I know not, but in form they very much resemble the bubbles upon the top of the water of a pot which is violently boiling. The soil is a beautiful loam upon a bed of sand. Springs start here and there at the feet of the hills, and little rivulets pour away in all directions. The roads are difficult merely on account of the extreme unevenness. The bottom is everywhere sound, and everything that meets the eye is beautiful. Trees, coppices, cornfields, meadows, and then the distant views in every direction. From one spot I saw this morning Hindhead, Blackdown Hill, Lord Egremont's house and park at Petworth, Donnington Hill, over which I went to go on the South Downs, the South Downs near Lewis, the forest at Worth, Turner's Hill, and then all the way round into Kent and back to the Surrey Hills at Godston. From Hascombe I began to descend into the low country. I had Leith Hill before me, but my plan was not to go over it or any part of it, but to go along below it in the real weald of Surrey. A little way back from Hascombe I had seen a field of carrots, and now I was descending into a country where, strictly speaking, only three things will grow well, grass, wheat, and oak trees. At Goose Green I crossed a turnpike road leading from Guildford to Horsham and Arundel. I next came, after crossing a canal, to a common called Smithwood Common. Leith Hill was full in front of me, but I turned away to the right, and went through the lanes to come to Ewhurst, leaving Crawley to my right. Before I got to Ewhurst I crossed another turnpike road, leading from Guildford to Horsham, and going on to Worthing or some of those towns. At Ewhurst, which is a very pretty village, and the church of which is most delightfully situated, I treated my horse to some oats, and myself to a rasher of bacon. I had now to come, according to my project, round among the lanes at about a couple of miles' distance from the foot of Leith Hill, in order to get first to Ockley, then to Holmwood, and then to Reigate. From Ewhurst, the first three miles was the deepest clay that I ever saw, to the best of my recollection. I was warned of the difficulty of getting along, but I was not to be frightened at the sound of clay. Wagons, too, had been dragged along the lanes by some means or another, and where a wagon-horse could go, my horse could go. It took me, however, a good hour and a half to get along these three miles. Now mind, this is the real weald, where the clay is bottomless, where there is no stone of any sort underneath, as at Worth and all along from Crawley to Billingshurst, through Horsham. This clayey land is fed with water soaking from the sand-hills, and in this particular place from the immense hill of Leith. All along here the oak-woods are beautiful. 
I saw scores of acres by the roadside where the young oaks stood as regularly as if they had been planted. The orchards are not bad along here, and perhaps they are a good deal indebted to the shelter they receive. The wheat very good, all through the wheel, but backward. At Ockley I passed the house of a Mr. Steer, who has a great quantity of hayland, which is very pretty. Here I came along the turnpike road that leads from Dorking to Horsham. When I got within about two or three miles of Dorking, I turned off to the right, came across a homewood, into the lanes leading down to Gadbrook Common, which has of late years been enclosed. It is all clay here, but in the whole of my ride I have not seen much finer fields of wheat than I saw here. Out of these lanes I turned up to Betchworth, I believe it is, and from Betchworth came along a chalk hill to my left, and the sand hills to my right, till I got to this place. When? Sunday, 10th August. I stayed at Rygate yesterday, and came to the Wen to-day, every step of the way in a rain, as good a soaking as any devotee of St. Swithin ever underwent for his sake. I promised that I would give an account of the effect which the soaking on the South Downs, on Saturday the second instant, had upon the hooping cough. I do not recommend the remedy to others. But this I will say, that I had a spell of the hooping cough, the day before I got that soaking, and that I have not had a single spell since, though I have slept in several different beds, and got a second soaking in going from Botley to Easton. The truth is, I believe, that rain upon the South Downs, or at any place near the sea, is by no means the same thing with rain in the interior. No man ever catches cold from getting wet with sea-water, and indeed I have never known an instance of a man catching cold at sea. The air upon the South Downs is saltish, I dare say, and the clouds may bring something a little partaking of the nature of sea-water. At Thursley I left the turnip hoers poking and pulling and muddling about the weeds, and wholly incapable, after all, of putting the turnips in anything like the state in which they ought to be. The weeds that had been hoed up twice were growing again, and it was the same with the turnips that had been hoed up. In leaving Reigate this morning, it was with great pleasure that I saw a field of Swedish turnips, drilled upon ridges at about four feet distance, the whole field as clean as the cleanest of garden ground. The turnips standing at equal distances in the row, and having the appearance of being in every respect in a prosperous state. I should not be afraid to bet that these turnips, thus standing in rows at nearly four feet distance, will be a crop twice as large as any in the parish of Thursley, though there is, I imagine, some of the finest turnip land in the kingdom. It seems strange that men are not to be convinced of the advantage of the row culture for turnips. They will insist upon believing that there is some ground lost. They will also insist upon believing that the row culture is the most expensive. How can there be ground lost if the crop be larger? And as to the expense, take one year with another, the broadcast method must be twice as expensive as the other. Wet as it has been to-day, I took time to look well about me as I came along. The wheat, even in this ragamuffin part of the country, is good, with the exception of one piece, which lies on your left hand as you come down from Banstead down. It is very good at Banstead itself, though that is a country sufficiently poor. Just on the other side of Sutton there is a little good land, and in a place or two I thought I saw the wheat a little blighted. A labouring man told me that it was where the heaps of dung had been laid. The barley here is most beautiful, as indeed it is all over the country. Between Sutton and the Wen there is, in fact, little besides houses, gardens, grass plats, and other matters to accommodate the Jews and jobbers, and the mistresses and bastards that are put out a keeping. But in a dell which the turnpike road crosses about a mile on this side of Sutton, there are two fields of as stiff land, I think, as I ever saw in my life. In summer time this land bakes so hard that they cannot plough it unless it be wet. When you have ploughed it and the sun comes again, it bakes again. One of these fields had been thus ploughed and cross-ploughed, in the month of June, and I saw the ground when it was lying in lumps of the size of portmanteaus, and not very small ones either. It would have been impossible to reduce this ground to small particles, except by the means of sledge-hammers. The two fields to which I alluded just now are alongside of this ploughed field, and they are now in wheat. The heavy rain of to-day, aided by the south-west wind, made the wheat bend pretty nearly to lying down, but you shall rarely see two finer fields of wheat. It is red wheat, a coarseish kind, and the straw stout and strong, but the ears are long, broad, and full, and I did not perceive anything approaching towards a speck in the straw. Such land as this, such very stiff land, seldom carries a very large crop, but I should think that these fields would exceed four quarters to an acre, and the wheat is by no means so backward as it is in some places. There is no corn that I recollect from the spot just spoken of to almost the street of Kensington. I came up by Earl's Court, where there is, amongst the market gardens, a field of wheat. 
one would suppose that this must be the finest wheat in the world. By no means. It rained hard, to be sure, and I had not much time for being particular in my survey, but this field appears to me to have some blight in it, and as to crop, whether of corn or of straw, it is nothing to compare to the general run of the wheat in the wheels of Sussex or of Surrey. What then is it, if compared with the wheat on the South Downs, under Portsdown Hill, on the sea-flats at Haven and at Titchfield, and along on the banks of the Itchen? Thus I have concluded this rural ride, from the Wen and back again to the Wen, being, taking in all the turnings and windings, as near as can be, two hundred miles in length. My objects were to ascertain the state of the crops, both of hops and of corn. The hop affair is soon settled, for there will be no hops. As to the corn, my remark is this, that on all the clays, on all the stiff lands upon the chalk, on all the rich lands indeed, but more especially on all the stiff lands, the wheat is as good as I recollect ever to have seen it, and has as much straw. On all the light lands and poor lands the wheat is thin, and, though not short, by no means good. The oats are pretty good almost everywhere, and I have not seen a bad field of barley during the whole of my ride, though there is no species of soil in England except that of the fens, over which I have not passed. The state of the farmers is much worse than it was last year, notwithstanding the ridiculous falsehoods of the London newspapers, and the more ridiculous delusion of the jolterheads. In numerous instances the farmers, who continue in their farms, have ceased to farm for themselves, and merely hold the land for the landlords. The delusion caused by the rise of the price of corn has pretty nearly vanished already. And if St. Swithin would but get out of the way with his drippings for about a month, this delusion would disappear, never to return. In the meanwhile, however, the London newspapers are doing what they can to keep up the delusion, and in a paper called Bell's Weekly Messenger, edited, I am told by a place-hunting lawyer, in that stupid paper of this day I find the following passage. So late as January last, the average price of wheat was thirty-nine shillings per quarter, and on the twenty-ninth ultimate it was above sixty-two shillings. As it has been rising ever since, it may now be quoted as little under sixty-five shillings, so that in this article alone there is a rise of more than thirty-five per cent. Under these circumstances it is not likely that we shall hear anything of agricultural distress. A writer of considerable talents, but no profit, had frightened the kingdom by a confident prediction that wheat, after the first of May, would sink to four shillings per bushel, and that under the effects of Mr. Peel's bill, and the payments in cash by the Bank of England, it would never again exceed that price. Nay, so assured was Mr. Cobbett, of the mathematical certainty of his deductions on the subject, that he did not hesitate to make use of the following language. And further, if what I say do not come to pass, I will give any one leave to broil me on a gridiron, and for that purpose I will get one of the best gridirons I can possibly get made, and it shall be hung out as near to my premises as possible in the strand, so that it shall be seen by everybody as they pass along. The first of May has now passed, Mr. Peel's bill has not been repealed, and the Bank of England has paid its notes in cash, and yet wheat has risen nearly forty per cent. Here's a tissue of falsehoods. But only think of a country being frightened by the prospect of a low price of provisions. When such an idea can possibly find its way even into the shallow brain of a crack skull lawyer, when such an idea can possibly be put into print at any rate, there must be something totally wrong in the state of the country. Here is this lawyer telling his readers that I had frightened the kingdom by saying that wheat would be sold at four shillings a bushel. Again I say that there must be something wrong, something greatly out of place, some great disease at work in the community, or such an idea as this could never have found its way into print. Into the head of a crack skull lawyer it might, perhaps, have entered at any time. But for it to find its way into print there must be something in the state of society wholly out of joint. As to the rest of this article, it is a tissue of downright lies. The writer says that the price of wheat is sixty-five shillings a quarter. The fact is that on the second instant the price was fifty-nine shillings and sevenpence, and it is now about two shillings less than that. Then again, this writer must know that I never said that wheat would not rise above four shillings a bushel, but that, on the contrary, I always expressly said that the price would be affected by the seasons, and that I thought that the price would vibrate between three shillings a bushel and seven shillings a bushel. Then again, Peel's bill has, in part, been repealed. If it had not, there could have been no small note in circulation at this day, so that this lawyer is all lie. In obedience to the wishes of a lady, I have been reading about the plans of Mr. Owen, and though I do not as yet see my way clear as to how we can arrange matters with regard to the young girls and the young fellows, I am quite clear that his institution would be most excellent for the disposal of the lawyers. One of his squares would be at a great distance from all other habitations. In the midst of Lord Erskine's estate, for instance, 
mentioned by me in a former ride. And nothing could be so fitting, his lordship long having been called the father of the bar. In the midst of this estate, with no town or village within miles of them, we might have one of Mr. Owen's squares, and set the bobtail brotherhood most effectually at work. Pray can any one pretend to say that a spade or shovel would not become the hands of this blunder-headed editor of Bell's Messenger better than a pen? However, these miserable falsehoods can cause the delusion to exist but for a very short space of time. The quantity of the harvest will be great. If the quality be bad, owing to wet weather, the price will be still lower than it would have been in case of dry weather. The price, therefore, must come down. And if the newspapers were conducted by men who had any sense of honour or shame, those men must be covered with confusion. End of chapter 13, part 2《1823. I have so often described the soil, and other matters appertaining to the country between the Wen and this place, that my readers will rejoice at being spared the repetition here. As to the harvest, however, I find that they were deluged here on Tuesday last, though we got but little, comparatively, at Kensington. Between Mitcham and Sutton they were making wheat ricks. The corn has not been injured here worth notice. Now and then an ear in the butts groan, and grown wheat is a sad thing. You may almost as well be without wheat altogether. However, very little harm has been done here as yet. At Walton Heath I saw a man who had suffered most terribly from the game laws. He saw me going by, and came out to tell me his story. And a horrible story it is, as the public will find, when it shall come regularly and fully before them. Apropos of game works, I asked who was the judge at the Somersetshire Assizes the other day. A correspondent tells me that it was Judge Borough. I am well aware that, as this correspondent observes, gamekeepers ought not to be shot at. This is not the point. It is not a gamekeeper in the usual sense of that word. It is a man seizing another without a warrant. That is what it is, and this and old Ellenborough's Act are new things in England, and things of which the laws of England, the birthright of Englishmen, knew nothing. Yet Farmer Volk ought not to have shot at the gamekeeper or Caesar without warrant. He ought not to have shot at him. And he would not, had it not been for the law that put him in danger of being transported on the evidence of this man. So that it is clearly the terrible law that, in these cases, produces the violence. Yet admire with me, reader, the singular turn of the mind of Sir James Mackintosh, whose whole soul appears to have been long bent on the amelioration of the penal code, and who has never said one single word about this new and most terrible part of it. Sir James, after years of incessant toil, has, I believe, succeeded in getting a repeal of the laws for the punishment of witchcraft, of the very existence of which laws the nation was unacquainted. But the devil a word has he said about the game laws, which put into the jails a full third part of the prisoners, and to hold which prisoners the jails have actually been enlarged in all parts of the country. Singular turn of mind! Singular humanity! Ah! Sir James knows very well what he is at. He understands the state of his constituents at Narrisborough too well to meddle with game laws. He has a friend, I dare say, who knows more about game laws than he does. However, the poor witches are safe. Thanks, Sir James, for that. Mr. Carlyle's sister and Mrs. Wright are in jail, and may be there for life, but the poor witches are safe. No hypocrite, no base pretender to religion, no atrocious, savage, black-hearted wretch who would murder half mankind rather than not live on the labours of others. No monster of this kind can now persecute the poor witches, thanks to Sir James, who has obtained security for them in all their rides through the air and in all their sailings upon the horse-ponds. Tunbridge Wells, Kent, Saturday, 30th August I came from Worth about seven this morning, passed through East Grinstead, over Holt High Common, through Ashurst, and thence to this place. The morning was very fine, and I left them at Worth, making a wheat rick. There was no show for rain till about one o'clock, as I was approaching Ashurst. 
the shattering that came at first i thought nothing of but the clouds soon grew up all round and the rain set in for the afternoon the buildings at hashurst which is the first parish in kent on quitting sussex are a mill an alehouse a church and about six or seven other houses i stopped at the alehouse to bait my horse and for want of bacon was compelled to put up with bread and cheese for myself i waited in vain for the rain to cease or to slacken and the want of bacon made me fear as to a bed so about five o'clock i without greatcoat got upon my horse and came to this place just as fast and no faster than if it had been fine weather a very fine soaking if the south downs have left any little remnant of the hooping cough this will take it away to be sure i made not the least haste to get out of the rain i stopped here and there as usual and asked questions about the corn the hops and other things but the moment i got in i got a good fire and set about the work of drying in good earnest it costing me nothing for drink i can afford to have plenty of fire i have not been in the house an hour and all my clothes are now as dry as if they had never been wet it is not getting wet that hurts you if you keep moving while you are wet it is the suffering of yourself to be inactive while the wet clothes are on your back the country that i have come over to-day is a very pretty one the soil is a pale yellow loam looking like brick earth but rather sandy but the bottom is a softish stone now and then where you go through hollow ways as at east grinstead the sides are solid rock and indeed the rocks sometimes on the sides of hills show themselves above ground and mixed amongst the woods make very interesting objects on the road from the wen to brighton through godston and over turner's hill and which road i crossed this morning in coming from worth to east grinstead on that road which goes through linfield and which is by far the pleasantest coach road from the wen to brighton on the side of this road on which coaches now go from the wen to brighton there is a long chain of rocks or rather rocky hills with trees growing amongst the rocks or apparently out of them as they do in the woods near ross in herefordshire and as they do in the blue mountains in america where you can see no earth at all where all seems rock and yet where the trees grow most beautifully at the place of which i am now speaking that is to say by the side of this pleasant road to brighton and between turner's hill and linfield there is a rock which they call big upon little that is to say a rock upon another having nothing else to rest upon and the top one being longer and wider than the top of the one it lies on this big rock is no trifling concern being as big perhaps as a not very small house how then came this big upon little what lifted up the big it balances itself naturally enough but what tossed it up i do not like to pay a parson for teaching me while i have god's own word to teach me but if any parson will tell me how big came upon little i do not know that i shall grudge him a trifle and if he cannot tell me this if he say all that we have to do is to admire and adore then i tell him that i can admire and adore without his aid and that i will keep my money in my pocket to return to the soil of this country it is such a loam as i have described with this stone beneath sometimes the top soil is lighter and sometimes heavier sometimes the stone is harder and sometimes softer but this is the general character of it all the way from worth to tunbridge wells this land is what may be called the middle kind the wheat crop about twenty to twenty four bushels to an acre on an average of years the grass fields not bad and all the fields will grow grass i mean make upland meadows the woods good though not of the finest the land seems to be about thus divided three tenths woods two tenths grass a tenth of a tenth hops and the rest corn land these make very pretty surface especially as it is a rarity to see a pollard tree and as nobody is so beastly as to trim trees up like the elms near the wen the country has no flat spot in it yet the hills are not high my road was a gentle rise or a gentle descent all the way continual new views strike the eye but there is little variety in them all is pretty but nothing strikingly beautiful the labouring people look pretty well they have pigs they invariably do best in the woodland and forest and wild countries where the mighty grasper has all under his eye they can get but little these are cross roads mere parish roads but they are very good while i was at the alehouse at ashurst i heard some labouring men talking about the roads and they having observed that the parish roads had become so wonderfully better within the last seven or eight years i put in my word and said it is odd enough too that the parish roads should become better and better as the farmers become poorer and poorer they looked at one another and put on a sort of expecting look 
for my observation seemed to ask for information. At last one of them said, Why, it is because the farmers have not the money to employ men, and so they are put on the roads. Yes, said I, but they must pay them there. They said no more, and only looked hard at one another. They had probably never thought about this before. They seemed puzzled by it, and well they might, for it has bothered the wigs of boroughmongers, parsons, and lawyers, and will bother them yet. Yet this country now contains a body of occupiers of the land, who suffer the land to go to decay for want of means to pay a sufficiency of labourers, and at the same time are compelled to pay those labourers for doing that which is of no use to the occupiers. Their collective wisdom! Go, brag of that! Call that the envy of surrounding nations, and the admiration of the world. This is a great nut here. I saw them hanging very thick on the wayside, during a great part of this day's ride, and they put me in mind of the old saying, that a great nut here is a great year for that class whom the lawyers, in their Latin phrase, call the sons and daughters of nobody. I once asked a farmer, who had often been overseer of the poor, whether he really thought that there was any ground for this old saying, or whether he thought it was mere banter. He said that he was sure that there were good grounds for it, and he even cited instances in proof, and mentioned one particular year when there were four times as many of this class as ever had been born in a year in the parish before, an effect which he ascribed solely to the crop of nuts of the year before. Now if this be the case, ought not Parson Malthus, Lawyer Scarlet, and the rest of that tribe, to turn their attention to the nut-trees? The Vice Society, too, with that holy man Wilberforce at its head, ought to look out sharp after these mischievous nut-trees. A law to cause them all to be grubbed up and thrown into the fire would certainly be far less unreasonable than many things which we have seen and heard of. The corn from Worth to this place is pretty good. The farmers say it is a small crop. Other people, and especially the labourers, say that it is a good crop. I think it is not large and not small. About an average crop, perhaps rather less, for the land is rather light, and this is not a year for light lands. But there is no blight, no mildew, in spite of all the prayers of the loyal. The wheat about a third cut, and none carried. No other corn begun upon. Hops very bad till I came within a few miles of this place, when I saw some which I should suppose would bear about six hundred weight to the acre. The orchards, no great things along here. Some apples here and there, but small and stunted. I do not know that I have seen to-day any one tree well loaded with fine apples. Tenterden, Kent, Sunday, 31st August. Here I am, after a most delightful ride of twenty-four miles, through Frant, Lamberhurst, Goodhurst, Milkhouse Street, Benenden, and Rolvenden. By making a great stir in rousing waiters and boots and maids, and by leaving behind me the name of a damned, noisy, troublesome fellow, I got clear of the wells and out of the contagion of its wind-engendered inhabitants, time enough to meet the first rays of the sun, on the hill that you come up in order to get to Frant, which is a most beautiful little village at about two miles from the wells. Here the land belongs, I suppose, to Lord Abergavenny, who has a mansion and park here. A very pretty place, and kept seemingly in very nice order. I saw here what I never saw before, the bloom of the common heath we wholly overlook. But it is a very pretty thing, and here, when the plantations were made, and as they grew up, heath was left to grow on the sides of the roads in the plantations. The heath is not so much of a dwarf as we suppose. This is four feet high, and being in full bloom, it makes the prettiest border that can be imagined. This place of Lord Abergavenny is altogether a very pretty place, and so far from grudging him the possession of it, I should feel pleasure at seeing it in his possession, and should pray God to preserve it to him, and from the unholy and ruthless touch of the Jews and jobbers. But I cannot forget this Lord's sinecure. I cannot forget that he has, for doing nothing, received of the public money more than sufficient to buy such an estate as this. I cannot forget that this estate may, perhaps, have actually been bought with that money. Not being able to forget this, and with my mind filled with reflections of this sort, I got up to the church at Frant, and just by I saw a schoolhouse with this motto on it, Train up a child as he should walk, etc. That is to say, try to breed up the boys and girls of this village, in such a way that they may never know anything about Lord Abergavenny's sinecure, or knowing about it, that they may think it right that he should roll in wealth coming to him in such a way. The projectors deceive nobody but themselves. They are working for the destruction of their own system. In looking back over the wells, I cannot but admire the operation of the gambling system. This little toadstool is a thing created entirely by the gamble, and the means have hitherto come out of the wages of labour. These means are now coming out of the farmer's capital, 
and out of the landlord's estate. The labourers are stripped. They can give no more. The saddle is now fixing itself upon the right back. In quitting Frant, I descended into a country more woody than that behind me. I asked a man whose fine woods those were that I pointed to, and I fairly gave a start when he said the Marquis Camden's. Milton talks of the Leviathan in a way to make one draw in one's shoulders with fear, and I appeal to any one who has been at sea when a whale has come near the ship, whether he has not, at the first sight of the monster, made a sort of involuntary movement, as if to get out of the way. Such was the movement that I now made. However, soon coming to myself, on I walked my horse by the side of my pedestrian informant. It is Bayham Abbey that this great and awful sinecure placeman owns in this part of the county. Another great estate he owns near Sevenoaks. But here alone he spreads his length and breadth over more, they say, than ten or twelve thousand acres of land, great part of which consists of oak woods. But indeed, what estates might he not purchase? Not much less than thirty years he held a place, a sinecure place, that yielded him about thirty thousand pounds a year. At any rate, he, according to parliamentary accounts, has received of public money little short of a million of guineas. These, at thirty guineas an acre, would buy thirty thousand acres of land. And what did he have all this money for? Answer me that question, Wilberforce, you who called him a bright star, when he gave up a part of his enormous sinecure. He gave up all but the trifling sum of nearly three thousand pounds a year. What a bright star! And when did he give it up? When the radical had made the country ring with it, when his name was by their means getting into every mouth in the kingdom, when every radical speech and petition contained the name of Camden, then it was, and not till then, that this bright star let fall part of its brilliancy, so that Wilberforce ought to have thanked the radicals and not Camden. When he let go his grasp, he talked of the merits of his father. His father was a lawyer who was exceedingly well paid for what he did without a million of money being given to his son. But there is something rather out of commonplace to be observed about this father. This father was the contemporary of York, who became Lord Hardwick. Pratt and York, and the merit of Pratt, was that he was constantly opposed to the principles of York. York was called a Tory, and Pratt a Whig. But the devil of it was, both got to be lords. And in one shape or another the families of both have, from that day to this, been receiving great parcels of the public money. Beautiful system. The Tories were for rewarding York. The Whigs were for rewarding Pratt. The ministers, all in good time, humoured both parties, and the stupid people, divided into tools of two factions, actually applauded now one part of them, and now the other part of them, the squandering away of their substance. They were like the man and his wife in the fable, who, despite one another, gave away to the cunning mumper the whole of their dinner bit by bit. This species of folly is over, at any rate. The people are no longer fools enough to be partisans. They make no distinctions. The nonsense about court party and country party is at an end. Who thinks anything more of the name of Erskine than of that of Scott? As the people told the two factions at Maidstone when they, with Camden at their head, met to congratulate the regent on the marriage of his daughter, they are all tarred with the same brush, and tarred with the same brush they must be, until there be a real reform of the Parliament. However, the people are no longer deceived. They are not duped. They know that the thing is that which it is. The people of the present day would laugh at disputes, carried on with so much gravity, about the principles of Pratt and the principles of York. You are all tarred with the same brush, said the sensible people of Maidstone, and in those words they expressed the opinion of the whole country, boroughmongers and tax-eaters excepted. The country from Fran to Lamberhurst is very woody, I should think five-tenths woods and three grass. The corn, what there is of it, is about the same as further back. I saw a hop-garden just before I got to Lamberhurst, which will have about two or three hundred weight to the acre. This Lamberhurst is a very pretty place. It lies in a valley with beautiful hills round it. The pastures about here are very fine, and the roads are as smooth and as handsome as those in Windsor Park. From the last-mentioned place I had three miles to come to Goodhurst, the tower of the church of which is pretty lofty of itself, and the church stands upon the very summit of one of the steepest and highest hills in this part of the country. The churchyard has a view of about twenty-five miles in diameter, and the whole is over a very fine country, though the character of the country differs little from that which I have before described. Before I got to Goodhurst I passed by the side of a village called Horsenden, and saw some very large hop-grounds away to my right. I should suppose there were fifty acres, and they appeared to me to look pretty well. 
I found that they belong to a Mr. Springate, and people say that it will grow half as many hops as he grew last year, while people in general will not grow a tenth part so many. This hop-growing and dealing have always been a gamble, and this puts me in mind of the horrible treatment which Mr. Waddington received on account of what was called his forestalling in hops. It is useless to talk. As long as that gentleman remains uncompensated for his sufferings, there can be no hope of better days. Ellenborough was his counsel, he afterwards became judge, but nothing was ever done to undo what Kenyon had done. However, Mr. Waddington will, I trust, yet live to obtain justice. He has in the meanwhile given the thing now and then a blow, and he has the satisfaction to see it reel about like a drunken man. I got to Goodhurst to breakfast, and as I heard that the Dean of Rochester was to preach a sermon in behalf of the national schools, I stopped to hear him. In waiting for his reverence I went to the Methodist meeting-house, where I found the Sunday school boys and girls assembled, to the almost filling of the place, which was about thirty feet long and eighteen wide. The minister was not come, and the schoolmaster was reading to the children out of a tract book, and shaking the brimstone bag at them most furiously. This schoolmaster was a sleek-looking young fellow, his skin perfectly tight, well fed I'll warrant him, and he has discovered the way of living without work, on the labour of those that do work. There were thirty-six little fellows in smock-frocks, and about as many girls listening to him, and I dare say he eats as much meat as any ten of them. By this time the dean, I thought, would be coming on, and therefore to the church I went. But to my great disappointment I found that the parson was operating, preparatory to the appearance of the dean, who was to come on in the afternoon, when I, agreeably to my plan, must be off. The sermon was from 2 Chronicles, chapter 31, verse 21, and the words of this text describe King Hezekiah as a most zealous man, doing whatever he did with all his heart. I write from memory, mind, and therefore I do not pretend to quote exact words, and I may be a little in error, perhaps, as to chapter or verse. The object of the preacher was to hold up to his hearers the example of Hezekiah, and particularly in the case of the school affair. He called upon them to subscribe with all their hearts. But, alas, how little of persuasive power was there in what he said! No effort to make them see the use of the schools. No inducement proved to exist. No argument, in short, nor anything to move. No appeal either to the reason or to the feeling. All was general, commonplace, cold observation, and that too in language which the far greater part of the hearers could not understand. This church is about a hundred and ten feet long and seventy feet wide in the clear. It would hold three thousand people, and it had in it two hundred and fourteen, besides fifty-three Sunday school or national school boys. And these sat together in a sort of lodge up in a corner, sixteen feet long and ten feet wide. Now, will any Parson Malthus, or anybody else, have the impudence to tell me that this church was built for the use of a population not more numerous than the present? To be sure, when this church was built, there could be no idea of a Methodist meeting coming to assist the church, and as little, I dare say, was it expected that the preachers in the church would ever call upon the faithful to subscribe money to be sent up to one Joshua Watson, living in a wen, to be by him laid out in promoting Christian knowledge. But at any rate the Methodists cannot take away above four or five hundred. And what then was this great church built for, if there were no more people in those days at Goodhurst than there are now? It is very true that the labouring people have, in a great measure, ceased to go to church. There was scarcely any of that class at this great country church to-day. I do not believe there were ten. I can remember when they were so numerous that the parson could not attempt to begin, till the rattling of their nailed shoes ceased. I have seen, I am sure, five hundred boys and men in smock-frocks coming out of church at one time. To-day has been a fine day. There would have been many at church to-day, if ever there are. And here I have another to add to the many things that convince me that the labouring classes have in great part ceased to go to church, that their way of thinking and feeling with regard to both church and clergy are totally changed, and that there is now very little moral hold which the latter possess. This preaching for money to support the schools is a most curious affair altogether. The king sends a circular letter to the bishops, as I understand it, to cause subscriptions for the schools, and the bishops, if I am rightly told, tell the parish clergy to send the money when collected to Joshua Watson, the treasurer of a society in the Wen, for promoting Christian knowledge. What? The church and all its clergy put into motion to get money from the people to send up to one Joshua Watson, a wine merchant, or later wine merchant, in Mincing Lane, Fenchurch Street, London, in order that the said wine merchant may apply the money to the promoting of Christian knowledge? What? 
all the deacons priests curates perpetual vicars rectors prebends doctors deans archdeacons and fathers in god right reverend and most reverend all yea all engage in getting money together to send to a wine merchant that he may lay it out in the promoting of christian knowledge in their own flocks o oh, brave wine merchant what a prince of godliness must this wine merchant be i say wine merchant or late wine merchant of mincing lane fenchurch street london and for god's sake some good parson do send me up a copy of the king's circular and also of the bishop's order to send the money to joshua watson for some precious sport we will have with joshua and his society before we have done with them after service i mounted my horse and jogged on through milkhouse street to benenden where i passed through the estate and in sight of the house of mr hodges he keeps it very neat and has planted a good deal his ash do very well but the chestnut do not as it seems to me he ought to have the american chestnut if he have any if i could discover an everlasting hop pole and one too that would grow faster even than the ash would not these kentish hop planters put me in the calendar along with their famous st thomas of canterbury we shall see this one of these days coming through the village of benenden i heard a man at my right talking very loud about houses 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 it was a methodist parson in a house close by the roadside i pulled up and stood still in the middle of the road but looking in silent soberness into the window which was open of the room in which the preacher was at work i believe my stopping rather disconcerted him for he got into shocking repetition do you know said he laying great stress on the word no do you know that you have ready for you houses houses i say i say do you know do you know that you have houses in the heavens not made with hands do you know this from experience has the blessed jesus told you so and on he went to say that if jesus had told them so they would be saved and that if he had not and did not they would be damned some girls whom i saw in the room plump and rosy as could be did not seem at all daunted by these menaces and indeed they appeared to me to be thinking much more about getting houses for themselves in this world first just to see a little before they entered or endeavoured to enter or even thought much about those houses of which the parson was speaking houses with pigsties and little snug gardens attached to them together with all the other domestic and conjugal circumstances these girls seem to me to be preparing themselves for the truth is these fellows have no powers on the minds of any but the miserable scarcely had i proceeded a hundred yards from the place where this fellow was bawling when i came to the very situation which he ought to have occupied i mean the stocks which the people of benenden have with singular humanity fitted up with a bench so that the patient while he is receiving the benefit of the remedy is not exposed to the danger of catching cold by sitting as in other places upon the ground always damp and sometimes actually wet but i would ask the people of benenden what is the use of this humane precaution and indeed what is the use of the stocks themselves if while a fellow is ranting and bawling in the manner just described at the distance of a hundred yards from the stocks the stocks as is here actually the case are almost hidden by grass and nettles this however is the case all over the country not nettles and grass indeed smothering the stocks but i never see any feet peeping through the holes anywhere though i find methodist parsons everywhere and though the law compels the parishes to keep up all the pairs of stocks that exist in all parts of them and in some parishes they have to keep up several pairs i am aware that a good part of the use of the stocks is the terror they ought to produce i am not supposing that they are of no use because not continually furnished with legs but there is a wide difference between always and never and it is clear that a fellow who has had the stocks under his eye all his lifetime and has never seen a pair of feet peeping through them will stand no more in awe of the stocks than rooks do of an old shoyhoy or than the ministers or their agents do of hobhouse and burdett stocks that never pinch a pair of ankles are like ministerial responsibility a thing to talk about but for no other use a mere mockery a thing laughed at by those whom it is intended to keep in check it is time that the stocks were again in use or that the expense of keeping them up were put an end to this mild this gentle this good-humoured sort of correction is not enough for our present rulers but mark the consequence jails ten times as big as formerly houses of correction treadmills the hulks and the country filled with spies of one sort and another game spies or other spies and if a hare or pheasant come to an untimely death police officers from the wen are not unfrequently called down to find out and secure the bloody offender mark this englishman mark how we take to those things which we formerly ridiculed in the french and take them up to just as that brave and spirited people have shaken them off i saw not long ago an account of a wen police officer being sent into the country where he assumed a disguise joined some poachers as they are called 
got into their secrets, went out in the night with them, and then, having laid his plans with the game people, assisted to take them and convict them. What, is this England? Is this the land of manly hearts? Is this the country that laughed at the French for their submissions? What are police officers kept for this? Does the law say so? However, thank God Almighty, the estates are passing away into the hands of those who have had borrowed from them the money to uphold this monster of a system. The debt, the blessed debt, will at last restore to us freedom. Just after I quitted Benenden, I saw some bunches of straw lying upon the quickset hedge of a cottage garden. I found upon inquiry that they were bunches of the straw of grass. Seeing a face through the window of the cottage, I called out, and asked what the straw was for. The person within said it was to make leghorn plat with. I asked him, it was a young man, how he knew how to do it. He said he had got a little book that had been made by Mr. Cobbett. I told him that I was the man, and should like to see some of his work, and asked him to bring it out to me, I being afraid to tie my horse. He told me that he was a cripple, and that he could not come out. At last I went in, leaving my horse to be held by a little girl. I found a young man who has been a cripple for fourteen years. Some ladies in the neighbourhood had got him the book, and his family had got him the grass. He had made some very nice plan, and he had knitted the greater part of the crown of a bonnet, and had done the whole very nicely, though, as to the knitting, he had proceeded in a way to make it very tedious. He was knitting upon a block. However, these little matters will soon be set to rights. There will soon be persons to teach knitting in all parts of the country. I left this unfortunate young man with the pleasing reflection that I had in all likelihood been the cause of his gaining a good living by his labour during the rest of his life. How long will it be before my calumniators, the false and infamous London press, will take the whole of it together and leave out its evil, do as much good as my pen has done in this one instance? How long will it be ere the ruffians, the base hirelings, the infamous traders, who own and who conduct that press, how long ere one of them, or all of them together, shall cause a cottage to smile, shall add one ounce to the meal of the labouring man. Rolvenden was my next village, and thence I could see the lofty church of Tenterden on the top of a hill at three miles distance. This Rolvenden is a very beautiful village, and indeed such are all the places along here. These villages are not like those in the iron counties, as I call them, that is the counties of Flint and Chalk. Here the houses have gardens in front of them, as well as behind, and there is a good deal of show and finery about them and their gardens. The high roads are without a stone in them, and everything looks like gentility. At this place I saw several arbutuses in one garden, and much finer than we see them in general, though mine this is no proof of a mild climate, for the arbutus is a native of one much colder than that of England, and indeed than that of Scotland. Coming from Benedon to Rolvenden, I saw some Swedish turnips, and strange as the reader will think it, the first I saw after leaving Worth. The reason I take to be this, the farms are all furnished with grass-fields as in Devonshire about Honiton. These grass-fields give hay for the sheep and cattle in winter, or at any rate they do all that is not done by the white turnips. It may be a question whether it would be more profitable to break up and sow Swedes, but this is the reason of their not being cultivated along here. White turnips are more easily got than Swedes, they may be sown later, and with good hay they will fat cattle and sheep but the Swedes will do this business without hay. In Norfolk and Suffolk the land is not generally of a nature to make hay-fields, therefore the people there resort to Swedes. This has been a sad time for these hay-farmers, however, all along here. They have but just finished hay-making, and I see all along my way from East Grinstead to this place, hay-ricks the colour of dirt, and smoking like dung-heaps. Just before I got to this place, Tenterden, I crossed a bit of marsh-land which I found upon inquiry, is a sort of little branch or spray, running out of that immense and famous tract of country called Romney Marsh, which, I find, I have to cross to-morrow, in order to get to Dover along by the seaside, through Hythe and Folkestone. This Tenterden is a market town, and a singularly bright spot. It consists of one street, which is, in some places, more, perhaps, than two hundred feet wide. On one side of the street the houses have gardens before them, from twenty to seventy feet deep. The town is upon a hill, the afternoon was very fine, and just as I rose the hill and entered the street, the people had come out of church and were moving along towards their houses. It was a very fine sight. Shabbily dressed people do not go to church. I saw, in short, drawn out before me the dress and beauty of the town, and a great many very, very pretty girls I saw, and saw them too in their best attire. I remember the girls in the Pays de Caux, and really I think those of Tenterden resemble them. I do not know why they should not, 
for there is the pays de Caux only just over the water, just opposite this very place. The hops about here are not so very bad. They say that one man near this town will have eight tons of hops upon ten acres of land. This is a great crop any year, a very great crop. This man may perhaps sell his hops for sixteen hundred pounds. What a gambling concern it is! However, such hop-growing always was, and always must be. It is a thing of perfect hazard. The church at this place is a very large and fine old building. The tower stands upon a base thirty feet square. Like the church at Goodhurst, it will hold three thousand people. And let it be observed that when these churches were built, people had not yet thought of cramming them with pews, as a stable is filled with stalls. Those who built these churches had no idea that worshipping God meant going to sit to hear a man talk out what he called preaching. By worship they meant very different things, and above all things, when they had made a fine and noble building, they did not dream of disfiguring the inside of it by filling its floor with large and deep boxes made of deal boards. In short, the floor was the place for the worshippers to stand or to kneel, and there was no distinction, no high place and no low place. All were upon a level before God, at any rate. Some were not stuck into pews lined with green or red cloth, while others were crammed into corners to stand erect or sit on the floor. These odious distinctions are of Protestant origin and growth. This lazy lolling in pews we owe to what is called the Reformation. A place filled with benches and boxes looks like an eating or a drinking place, but certainly not like a place of worship. A Frenchman, who had been driven from St. Domingo to Philadelphia by the Wilberforces of France, went to church along with me one Sunday. He had never been in a Protestant place of worship before. Upon looking round him and seeing everybody comfortably seated, while a couple of good stoves were keeping the place as warm as a slack oven, he exclaimed, Pardi, on se dire bien à son aise ici. That is egad. They serve God very much at their ease here. I always think of this when I see a church full of pews, as, indeed, is now always the case with our churches. Those who built these churches had no idea of this. They made their calculations as to the people to be contained in them, not making any allowance for deal boards. I often wonder how it is that the present parsons are not ashamed to call the churches theirs. They must know the origin of them, and how they can look at them and at the same time revile the Catholics is astonishing to me. This evening I have been to the Methodist meeting-house. I was attracted, fairly drawn all down the street, by the singing. When I came to the place the parson was got into prayer. His hands were clenched together and held up, his face turned up and back so as to be nearly parallel with the ceiling, and he was bawling away with his do thou and mayest thou and may be, enough to stun one. Noisy, however, as he was, he was unable to fix the attention of a parcel of girls in the gallery, whose eyes were all over the place, while his eyes were so devoutly shut up. After a deal of this rigmarole called prayer came the preachy, as the negroes call it, and a preachy it really was. Such a mixture of whining cant and of foppish affectation I scarcely ever heard in my life. The text was, I speak from memory, one of St. Peter's epistles, if he have more than one, the fourth chapter and eighteenth verse. The words were to this amount, that, as the righteous would be saved with difficulty, what must become of the ungodly and the sinner? After as neat a dish of nonsense and of impertinences as one could wish to have served up, came the distinction between the ungodly and the sinner. The sinner was one who did moral wrong, the ungodly one who did no moral wrong, but who was not regenerated. Both, he positively told us, were to be damned, one was just as bad as the other. Moral rectitude was to do nothing in saving the man. He was to be damned unless born again. And how was he to be born again unless he came to the regeneration shop and gave the fellows money? He distinctly told us that a man perfectly moral might be damned, and that the vilest of the vile and the basest of the base, I quote his very words, would be saved if they became regenerate, and that colliers whose souls had been as black as their coals had by regeneration become bright as the saints, that sing before God and the Lamb. And will the Edinburgh reviewers again find fault with me for cutting at this bawling, canting crew? Monstrous it is to think that the clergy of the church really encourage these roving fanatics. The church seems aware of its loss of credit and of power. It seems willing to lean even upon these men who, be it observed, seem on their part to have taken the church under their protection. They always pray for the ministry, I mean the ministry at Whitehall. They are most loyal souls. The thing protects them, and they lend their aid in upholding the thing. What silly, nay, what base creatures those must be who really give their money, give their pennies which ought to buy bread for their own children, who thus give their money to these lazy and impudent fellows, who call themselves ministers of God, who prowl about the country living easy and jovial lives, 
upon the fruit of the labour of other people. However, it is in some measure these people's fault. If they did not give, the others could not receive. I wish to see every labouring man well fed and well clad. But really the man who gives any portion of his earnings to these fellows deserves to want. He deserves to be pinched with hunger. Misery is the just reward of this worst species of prodigality. The singing makes a great part of what passes in these meeting-houses. A number of women and girls singing together make very sweet sounds. Few men there are who have not felt the power of sounds of this sort. Men are sometimes pretty nearly bewitched without knowing how. Eyes do a good deal, but tongues do more. We may talk of sparkling eyes and snowy bosoms as long as we please, but what are these with a croaking masculine voice? The parson seemed to be fully aware of the importance of this part of the service. The subject of his hymn was something about love, Christian love, love of Jesus, but still it was about love, and the parson read or gave out the verses in a singularly soft and sighing voice, with his head on one side and giving it rather a swing. I am satisfied that the singing forms great part of the attraction. Young girls like to sing, and young men like to hear them. Nay, old ones too. And as I have just said, it was the singing that drew me three hundred yards down the street at Tenterden to enter this meeting-house. By the by, I wrote some hymns myself and published them in Tuppenny Trash. I will give any Methodist parson leave to put them into his hymn-book. Folkestone, Kent, Monday noon, 1st September. I have had a fine ride, and I suppose the Quakers have had a fine time of it at Mark Lane. From Tenterden I set off at five o'clock, and got to Appledore after a most delightful ride, the high land upon my right, and the low land on my left. The fog was so thick and white along some of the low land, that I should have taken it for water, if little hills and trees had not risen up through it here and there. Indeed the view was very much like those which are presented in the deep valleys near the great rivers in New Brunswick, North America, at the time when the snows melt in the spring, and when, in sailing over those valleys, you look down from the side of your canoe, and see the lofty woods beneath you. I once went in a log canoe across a sylvan sea of this description, the canoe being paddled by two Yankees. We started in a stream, and the stream became a wide water, and that water got deeper and deeper, as I could see by the trees, all was woods, till we got to sail amongst the top branches of the trees. By and by we got into a large open space, a piece of water a mile or two, or three or four wide, with the woods under us. A fog with the tops of trees rising through it is very much like this, and such was the fog that I saw this morning in my ride to Appledore. The church at Appledore is very large, big enough to hold three thousand people, and the place does not seem to contain half a thousand old enough to go to church. In coming along I saw a wheat trick making, though I hardly think the wheat can be dry under the bands. The corn is all good here, and I am told they give twelve shillings an acre for reaping wheat. In quitting this apple door I crossed a canal and entered on Romney Marsh. This was grassland on both sides of me to a great distance. The flocks and herds immense. The sheep are of a breed that takes its name from the marsh. They are called Romney Marsh sheep, very pretty and large. The weathers, when fat, weigh about twelve stone or one hundred pounds. The faces of these sheep are white, and indeed the whole sheep is as white as a piece of writing paper. The wool does not look dirty and oily like that of other sheep. The cattle appear to be all of the Sussex breed, red, loose-limbed, and they say a great deal better than the Devonshire. How curious is the natural economy of a country! The forests of Sussex, those miserable tracts of heath and fern and bushes and sand, called Ashdown Forest and St. Leonard's Forest, to which latter Lord Erskine's estate belongs, these wretched tracts and the not much less wretched farms in their neighbourhood breed the cattle which we see fatting in Romney Marsh. They are calved in the spring, they are weaned in a little bit of grassland, they are then put into stubbles and about in the fallows for the first summer. They are brought into the yard to winter on rough hay, peasholm or barley straw, and the next two summers they spend in the rough woods or in the forest. The two winters they live on straw, they then pass another summer on the forest or at work, and then they come here or go elsewhere to be fatted. With cattle of this kind and with sheep such as I have spoken of before, this marsh abounds in every part of it and the sight is most beautiful. At three miles from Appledore I came through Snargate, a village with five houses, and with a church capable of containing two thousand people. The vagabonds tell us, however, that we have a wonderful increase of population. These vagabonds will be hanged by and by, or else justice will have fled from the face of the earth. At Brenzett, a mile further on, I with great difficulty got a rasher of bacon for breakfast. The few houses that there are are miserable in the extreme. The church here, only a mile from the last, nearly as large, and nobody to go to it. 
What, will the vagabonds attempt to make us believe that these churches were built for nothing? Dark ages indeed those must have been if these churches were erected without there being any more people than there are now. But who built them? Where did the means, where did the hands come from? This place presents another proof of the truth of my old observation, rich land and poor labourers. From the window of the house, in which I could scarcely get a rasher of bacon and not an egg, I saw numberless flocks and herds fatting, and the fields loaded with corn. The next village, which was two miles further on, was Old Romney, and along here I had, for great part of the way, cornfields on one side of me, and grassland on the other. I asked what the amount of the crop of wheat would be. They told me better than five quarters to the acre. I thought so myself. I have a sample of the red wheat and another of the white. They are both very fine. They reap the wheat here nearly two feet from the ground, and even then they cut it three feet long. I never saw corn like this before. It very far exceeds the corn under Portsdown Hill, that at Gosport and Titchfield. They have here about eight hundred large, very large sheaves to an acre. I wonder how long it will be after the end of the world before Mr. Burbeck will see the American prairies half so good as this marsh. In a garden here I saw some very fine onions and a prodigious crop, sure sign of most excellent land. At this old Romney there is a church, two miles only from the last mind, fit to contain one thousand five hundred people, and there are, for the people of the parish to live in, twenty-two or twenty-three houses. And yet the vagabonds have the impudence to tell us that the population of England has vastly increased. Curious system that depopulates Romney Marsh and people's bagshot heath. It is an unnatural system. It is the vagabond system. It is a system that must be destroyed or that will destroy the country. The rotten borough of New Romney came next in my way, and here to my great surprise I found myself upon the sea beach, for I had not looked at a map of Kent for years, and perhaps never. I had got a list of places from a friend in Sussex, whom I asked to give me a route to Dover, and to send me through those parts of Kent which he thought would be most interesting to me. Never was I so much surprised as when I saw a sail. This place, now that the squanderings of the thing are over, is, they say, become miserably poor. From New Romney to Dimchurch is about four miles. All along I had the sea beach on my right and on my left, sometimes grassland and sometimes cornland. They told me here, and also further back in the marsh, that they were to have fifteen shillings an acre for reaping wheat. From Dimchurch to Hythe you go on the sea beach, and nearly the same from Hythe to Sandgate, from which last place you come over the hill to Folkestone. But let me look back. Here has been the squandering. Here has been the pauper-making work. Here we see some of these causes that are now sending some farmers to the workhouse, and driving others to flee the country or to cut their throats. I had baited my horse at New Romney, and was coming jogging along very soberly, now looking at the sea, then looking at the cattle, then the corn, when my eye in swinging round lighted upon a great round building standing upon the beach. I had scarcely had time to think about what it could be when twenty or thirty others, standing along the coast, caught my eye, and if any one had been behind me he might have heard me exclaim, in a voice that made my horse bound. The Martello Towers by— Oh, Lord! To think that I should be destined to behold these monuments of the wisdom of Pitt and Dundas and Percival! Good God! Here they are, piles of bricks in a circular form, about three hundred feet, guess, circumference at the base, about forty feet high, and about one hundred and fifty feet circumference at the top. There's a doorway about midway up in each, and each has two windows, cannons were to be fired from the top of these things in order to defend the country against the french jacobins i think i've counted along here upwards of thirty of these ridiculous things which i dare say cost five perhaps ten thousand pounds each and one of which i am told sold on the coast of sussex the other day for two hundred pounds there's they say a chain of these things all the way to hastings i dare say they cost millions but far indeed are these from being all or half or a quarter of the squanderings along here Hi, this half barracks, the hills are covered with barracks, and barracks most expensive, most squandering, fill up the side of the hill. Here is a canal, I crossed it at Appledore, made for the length of thirty miles from Hythe in Kent to Rye in Sussex, to keep out the French, for those armies who had so often crossed the Rhine and the Danube were to be kept back by a canal made by Pitt thirty feet wide at the most. All along the coast there are works of some sort or other, incessant sinks of money, walls of immense dimensions, masses of stone brought and put into piles. Then you see some of the walls and buildings falling down, some that have never been finished. The whole thing all taken together looks as if a spell had been all of a sudden set upon the workmen, or in the words of the scripture, 
here is the desolation of abominations standing in high places however all is right these things were made with the hearty goodwill of those who are now coming to ruin in consequence of the debt contracted for the purpose of making these things this is all just the load will come at last upon the right shoulders between hythe and sandgate a village at about two miles from hythe i first saw the french coast the chalk cliffs at calais are as plain to the view as possible and also the land which they tell me is near boulogne folkestone lies under a hill here as reigate does in surrey only here the sea is open to your right as you come along the corn is very early here and very fine all cut even the beans and they will be ready to cart in a day or two folkestone is now a little place probably a quarter part as big as it was formerly here is a church one hundred and twenty feet long and fifty feet wide it is a sort of little cathedral the churchyard has evidently been three times as large as it is now before i got into folkestone i saw no less than eighty-four men women and boys and girls gleaning or leasing in a field of about ten acres the people all along here complain most bitterly of the change of times the truth is that the squandered millions are gone the nation has now to suffer for this squandering the money served to silence some to make others bawl to cause the good to be oppressed to cause the bad to be exalted to crush the jacobins and what is the result what is the end the end is not yet come but as to the result thus far go ask the families of those farmers who after having for so many years threatened to shoot jacobins have in instances not a few shot themselves go ask the ghosts of pitt and of castlereagh what has thus far been the result go ask the hampshire farmer who not many months since actually blowed out his own brains with one of those very pistols which he had long carried in his yeomanry cavalry holsters to be ready to keep down the jacobins and radicals o oh god inscrutable are thy ways but thou art just and of thy justice what a complete proof have we in the case of these very martello towers they were erected to keep out the jacobin french lest they should come and assist the jacobin english the loyal people of this coast were fattened by the building of them pitt and his loyal sink ports waged interminable war against jacobins these very towers are now used to keep these loyal sink ports themselves in order these towers are now used to lodge men whose business it is to sally forth not upon jacobins but upon smugglers thus after having sucked up millions of the nation's money these loyal sink ports are squeezed again kept in order kept down by the very towers which they rejoice to see rise to keep down the jacobins dover monday september first evening i got here this evening about six o'clock having come to-day thirty-six miles but i must defer my remarks on the country between folkestone and this place a most interesting spot and well worthy of particular attention what place i shall date from after dover i am by no means certain but be it from what place it may the continuation of my journal shall be published in due course if the atlantic ocean could not cut off the communication between me and my readers a mere strip of water not much wider than an american river will hardly do it i am in real truth undecided as yet whether i shall go on to france or back to the wen i think i shall when i go out of this inn toss the bridle upon my horse's neck and let him decide for me i am sure he is more fit to decide on such a point than our ministers are to decide on any point connected with the happiness greatness and honour of this kingdom End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of rural rides this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee rural rides by william cobbett chapter fifteen rural ride from dover through the isle of thanet by canterbury and faversham across to maidstone up to tunbridge through the weald of kent and over the hills by westerham and hayes to the wen dover wednesday september third eighteen twenty three evening on monday i was balancing in my own mind whether i should go to france or not to-day i have decided the question in the negative and shall set off this evening for the isle of thanet that spot so famous for corn i broke off without giving an account of the country between folkestone and dover which is a very interesting one in itself and was peculiarly interesting to me on many accounts i have often mentioned in describing the parts of the country over which i have travelled i have often mentioned the chalk ridge and also the sand ridge which i had traced running parallel with each other 
from about Farnham in Surrey to Sevenoaks in Kent. The reader must remember how particular I have been to observe that, in going up from Chilworth and Albury, through Dorking, Reigate, Godston, and so on, the two chains or ridges approach so near to each other, that in many places you actually have a chalk bank to your right, and a sand bank to your left, at not more than forty yards from each other. In some places these chains of hills run off from each other to a great distance, even to a distance of twenty miles. They then approach again towards each other, and so they go on. I was always desirous to ascertain whether these chains or ridges continued on thus to the sea. I have now found that they do. And, if you go out into the channel at Folkestone, there you see a sand-cliff and a chalk-cliff. Folkestone stands upon the sand, in a little dell about seven hundred or eight hundred yards from the very termination of the ridge. All the way along the chalk ridge is the most lofty, until you come to Leith Hill and Hindhead, and here, at Folkestone, the sand ridge tapers off in a sort of flat towards the sea. The land is like what it is at Reigate, a very steep hill, a hill of full a mile high and bending exactly in the same manner as the hill at Reigate does. The turnpike road winds up it and goes over it in exactly the same manner as that at Reigate. The land to the south of the hill begins a poor thin white loam upon the chalk, soon gets to be a very fine rich loam upon the chalk, goes on till it mingles the chalky loam with the sandy loam, and thus it goes on down to the sea beach, or to the edge of the cliff. It is a beautiful bed of earth here, resembling in extent that on the south side of Portsdown Hill, rather than that of Reigate. The crops here are always good, if they are good anywhere. A large part of this fine tract of land, as well as the little town of Sandgate, which is a beautiful little place upon the beach itself, and also a great part of the town of Folkestone belong, they tell me, to Lord Radnor, who takes his title of Viscount from Folkestone. Upon the hill begins, and continues on for some miles, that stiff red loam approaching to a clay, which I have several times described as forming the soil at the top of this chalk ridge. I spoke of it in the register of the 16th of August last, page 409, and I then said that it was like the land on the top of this very ridge at Ashmansworth, in the north of Hampshire. At Reigate you find precisely the same soil upon the top of the hill, a very red, clayey sort of loam, with big yellow flint stones in it. Everywhere the soil is the same upon the top of the high part of this ridge. I have now found it to be the same on the edge of the sea that I found it on the northeast corner of Hampshire. From the hill you keep descending all the way to Dover, a distance of about six miles, and it is absolutely six miles of downhill. On your right you have the lofty land which forms a series of chalk cliffs, from the top of which you look into the sea. On your left you have ground that goes rising up from you in the same sort of way. The turnpike road goes down the middle of a valley, each side of which, as far as you can see, may be about a mile and a half. It is six miles long, you will remember, and here, therefore, with very little interruption, very few chasms, there are eighteen square miles of corn. It is a patch such as you very seldom see, and especially of corn so good as it is here. I should think that the wheat all along here would average pretty nearly four quarters to the acre. A few oats are sown, a great deal of barley, and that a very fine crop. The town of Dover is like other seaport towns, but really much more clean, and with less blackguard people in it, than I ever observed in any seaport before. It is a most picturesque place, to be sure. On one side of it rises, upon the top of a very steep hill, the old castle, with all its fortifications. On the other side of it there is another chalk hill, the side of which is pretty nearly perpendicular, and rises up from sixty to a hundred feet higher than the tops of the houses, which stand pretty nearly close to the foot of the hill. I got into Dover rather late. It was dusk when I was going down the street towards the quay. I happened to look up and was quite astonished to perceive cows grazing upon a spot apparently fifty feet above the tops of the houses, and measuring horizontally not perhaps more than ten or twenty feet from a line which would have formed a continuation into the air. I went up to the same spot the next day myself, and you actually look down upon the houses, as you look out of a window upon people in the street. The valley that runs down from Folkestone is, when it gets to Dover, crossed by another valley that runs down from Canterbury, or at least from the Canterbury direction. It is in the gorge of this cross valley that Dover is built. The two chalk hills jut out into the sea, and the water that comes up between them forms a harbour for this ancient, most interesting and beautiful place. On the hill to the north stands the castle of Dover, which is fortified in the ancient manner except on the sea side, where it has the steep cliff for fortification. On the south side of the town the hill is, I believe, rather more lofty than that on the north side, 
and here is that cliff which is described by Shakespeare in the play of King Lear. It is fearfully steep, certainly, very nearly perpendicular for a considerable distance. The grass grows well to the very tip of the cliff, and you see cows and sheep grazing there with as much unconcern as if grazing in the bottom of a valley. It was not, however, these natural curiosities that took me over this hill. I went to see, with my own eyes, something of the sorts of means that I had been made use of, to squander away countless millions of money. Here is a hill containing, probably, a couple of square miles or more, hollowed like a honeycomb. Here are line upon line, trench upon trench, cavern upon cavern, bomb-proof upon bomb-proof. In short, the very sight of the thing convinces you that either madness the most humiliating, or profligacy the most scandalous, must have been at work here for years. The question that every man of sense asks is, what reason had you to suppose that the French could ever come to this hill to attack it, while the rest of the country was so much more easy to assail? However, let any man of good plain understanding go and look at the works that have here been performed, and that are now all tumbling into ruin. Let him ask what this cabin was for, what that ditch was for, what this tank was for, and why all these horrible holes and hiding-places at an expense of millions upon millions. Let this scene be brought and placed under the eyes of the people of England, and let them be told that Pitt and Dundas and Percival had these things done to prevent the country from being conquered, with voice unanimous the nation would instantly exclaim, Let the French or let the devil take us, rather than let us resort to means of defence like these. This is perhaps the only set of fortifications in the world ever framed for mere hiding. There is no appearance of any intention to annoy an enemy. It is a parcel of holes made in a hill, to hide Englishmen from Frenchmen, just as if the Frenchmen would come to this hill, just as if they would not go if they came at all, and land in Romney Marsh, or on Pevensey Level, or anywhere else rather than come to this hill, rather than come to crawl up Shakespeare's cliff. All the way along the coast, from this very hill to Portsmouth, or pretty nearly all the way, is a flat. What the devil should they come to this hill for, then? And when you ask this question, they tell you that it is to have an army here behind the French, after they had marched into the country. And for a purpose like this, for a purpose so stupid, so senseless, so mad as this, and withal so scandalously disgraceful, more brick and stone have been buried in this hill than would go to build a neat new cottage for every labouring man in the counties of Kent and of Sussex. Dreadful is the scourge of such ministers. However, those who supported them will now have to suffer. The money must have been squandered purposely, and for the worst ends. Fool as Pitt was, unfit as an old hack of a lawyer like Dundas was to judge of the means of defending the country, stupid as both these fellows were, and as their brother lawyer Percival was too, unfit as these lawyers were to judge in any such a case, they must have known that this was an useless expenditure of money. They must have known that, and therefore their general folly, their general ignorance, is no apology for their conduct. What they wanted was to prevent the landing not of Frenchmen, but of French principles, that is to say, to prevent the example of the French from being alluring to the people of England. The devil a bit did they care for the Bourbons. They rejoiced at the killing of the king. They rejoiced at the atheistical decree. They rejoiced at everything calculated to alarm the timid and to excite horror in the people of England in general. They wanted to keep out of England those principles which had a natural tendency to destroy boroughmongering and to put an end to peculation and plunder. No matter whether by the means of martello towers, making a great chalk hill a honeycomb, cutting a canal thirty feet wide to stop the march of the armies of the Danube and the Rhine, no matter how they squandered the money, so that it silenced some and made others bawl to answer their great purpose of preventing French example from having an influence in England. Simply their object was this, to make the French people miserable, to force back the Bourbons upon them as a means of making them miserable, to degrade France, to make the people wretched, and then to have to say to the people of England, look there, see what they have got by their attempts to obtain liberty. This was the object. They did not want martello towers and honeycomb chalk hills and mad canals. They did not want these to keep out the French armies. The boroughmongers and the parsons cared nothing about the French armies. It was the French example that the lawyers, boroughmongers and parsons wished to keep out. And what have they done? It is impossible to be upon this honeycombed hill, upon this enormous mass of anti-Jacobin expenditure, without seeing the chalk cliffs of Calais and the cornfields of France. At this season it is impossible to see those fields, without knowing that the farmers are getting in their corn there, as well as here, and it is impossible to think of that fact without reflecting, at the same time, on the example which the farmers of France hold out to the farmers of England. Looking down from this very anti-Jacobin hill this day, 
I saw the parson's shocks of wheat and barley, left in the field after the farmer had taken his away. Turning my head and looking across the channel, there, said I, pointing to France, there the spirited and sensible people have ridded themselves of this burden, of which our farmers so bitterly complain. It is impossible not to recollect here, that in numerous petitions, sent up too by the loyal, complaints have been made that the English farmer has to carry on a competition against the French farmer, who has no tithes to pay. Well, loyal gentlemen, why do not you petition, then, to be relieved from tithes? What do you mean else? Do you mean to call upon our big gentlemen at Whitehall for them to compel the French to pay tithes? Oh, you loyal fools! Better hold your tongues about the French not paying tithes. Better do that, at any rate, for never will they pay tithes again. Here is a large tract of land upon these hills at Dover, which is the property of the public, having been purchased at an enormous expense. This is now let out as pasture-land to people of the town. I dare say that the letting of this land is a curious affair. If there were a member for Dover who would do what he ought to do, he would soon get before the public a list of the tenants, and of the rents paid by them. I should like very much to see such list. Butterworth, the bookseller in Fleet Street, he who is a sort of metropolitan of the Methodists, is one of the members for Dover. The other is, I believe, that Wilbraham or Bootle, or Bootle Wilbraham or some such name, that is a Lancashire magistrate, so that Dover is prettily set up. However, there is nothing of this sort that can in the present state of things be deemed to be of any real consequence. As long as the people at Whitehall can go on paying the interest of the debt in full, so long will there be no change worth the attention of any rational man. In the meanwhile the French nation will be going on rising over us, and our ministers will be cringing and crawling to every nation upon earth who is known to possess a cannon or a barrel of powder. This very day I read Mr. Canning's speech at Liverpool, with a Yankee consul sitting on his right hand. Not a word now about the bits of bunting and the fur frigates. But now America is the lovely daughter who in a moment of excessive love has gone off with a lover, to wit, the French, and left the tender mother to mourn. What a fop! And this is the man that talks so big and so bold. This is the clever, the profound, the blustering too, and above all things the high-spirited Mr. Canning. However, more of this hereafter. I must get from this Dover as fast as I can. Sandwich, Wednesday, 3rd September, night. I got to this place about half an hour after the ringing of the eight o'clock bell, or curfew, which I heard at about two miles' distance from the place. From the town of Dover you come up the Castle Hill, and have a most beautiful view from the top of it. You have the sea, the chalk cliffs of Calais, the high land at Boulogne, the town of Dover just under you, the valley towards Folkestone, and the much more beautiful valley towards Canterbury, and going on a little further you have the Downs and the Essex or Suffolk coast in full view, with a most beautiful corn country to ride along through. The corn was chiefly cut between Dover and Walmer, the barley almost all cut and tied up in sheaf. Nothing but the beans seem to remain standing along here. They are not quite so good as the rest of the corn, but they are by no means bad. When I came to the village of Walmer, I inquired for the castle, that famous place where Pitt, Dundas, Percival, and all the whole tribe of plotters against the French Revolution had carried on their plots. After coming through the village of Walmer, you see the entrance of the castle away to the right. It is situated pretty nearly on the water's edge, and at the bottom of a little dell, about a furlong or so from the turnpike road. This is now the habitation of our great minister, Robert Banks Jenkinson, son of Charles of that name. When I was told, by a girl who was leasing in a field by the roadside, that that was Walmer Castle, I stopped short, pulled my horse round, looked steadfastly at the gateway, and could not help exclaiming, O oh, thou who inhabitest that famous dwelling! Thou who hast always been in place, let who might be out of place, O oh, thou everlasting place-man, thou sage of overproduction, do but cast thine eyes upon this barley-field, where, if I am not greatly deceived, they are from seven to eight quarters upon the acre. O oh, thou whose courier newspaper has just informed its readers that wheat will be seventy shillings the quarter in the month of November, O oh, thou wise man, I pray thee come forth from thy castle, and tell me what thou wilt do if wheat should happen to be, at the appointed time, Thirty-five shillings, instead of seventy shillings the quarter. Sage of overproduction, farewell. If thou hast life, thou wilt be minister, as long as thou canst pay the interest of the debt in full, but not one moment longer. The moment thou ceasest to be able to squeeze from the Normans a sufficiency to count down to the Jews their full tale, that moment, thou great stern path of duty man, thou wilt begin to be taught the true meaning of the words ministerial responsibility. Deal is a most villainous place. It is full of filthy-looking people. Great desolation of abomination has been going on here. 
tremendous barracks partly pulled down and partly tumbling down and partly occupied by soldiers everything seems upon the perish i was glad to hurry along through it and to leave its inns and public-houses to be occupied by the tarred and trousered and blue and buff crew whose very vicinage i always detest from deal you come along to upper deal which it seems was the original village thence upon a beautiful road to sandwich which is a rotten borough rottenness putridity is excellent for land but bad for boroughs this place which is as villainous a hole as one would wish to see is surrounded by some of the finest land in the world along on one side of it lies a marsh on the other sides of it is land which they tell me bears seven quarters of wheat to an acre it is certainly very fine for i saw large pieces of radish seed on the roadside this seed is grown for the seedsmen in london and it will grow on none but rich land all the corn is carried here except some beans and some barley canterbury thursday afternoon fourth september in quitting sandwich you immediately cross a river up which vessels bring coals from the sea this marsh is about a couple of miles wide it begins at the sea beach opposite the downs to my right hand coming from sandwich and it wheels round to my left and ends at the sea beach opposite margate roads this marsh was formerly covered with the sea very likely and hence the land within this sort of semicircle the name of which is thanet was called an isle it is in fact an island now for the same reason that portsea is an island and that new york is an island for there certainly is the water in this river that goes round and connects one part of the sea with the other i had to cross this river and to cross the marsh before i got into the famous isle of thanet which it was my intention to cross soon after crossing the river i passed by a place for making salt and could not help recollecting that there are no excise men in these salt-making places in france that before the revolution the french were most cruelly oppressed by the duties on salt that they had to endure on that account the most horrid tyranny that ever was known except perhaps that practised in an exchequer that shall here be nameless that thousands and thousands of men and women were every year sent to the galleys for what was called smuggling salt that the fathers and even the mothers were imprisoned or whipped if the children were detected in smuggling salt i could not help reflecting with delight as i looked at these salt pans in the isle of thanet i could not help reflecting that in spite of pitt dundas percival and the rest of the crew in spite of the caverns of dover and the martello towers in romney marsh in spite of all the spies and all the bayonets and the six hundred millions of debt and the hundred and fifty millions of dead weight and the two hundred millions of poor rates that are now squeezing the borough-mongers squeezing the farmers puzzling the fellows at whitehall and making mark lane a scene of greater interest than the chamber of the privy council with delight as i jogged along under the first beams of the sun i reflected that in spite of all the malignant measures that had brought so much misery upon england the gallant french people had ridded themselves of the tyranny which sent them to the galleys for endeavouring to use without tax the salt which god sent upon their shores can any man tell why we should still be paying five or six or seven shillings a bushel for salt instead of one we did pay fifteen shillings a bushel tax and why is two shillings a bushel kept on because if they were taken off the salt tax gathering crew must be discharged this tax of two shillings a bushel causes the consumer to pay five at the least more than he would if there were no tax at all when great god when shall we be allowed to enjoy god's gifts in freedom as the people of france enjoy them on the marsh i found the same sort of sheep as on romney marsh but the cattle here are chiefly welsh black and called runts they are nice hardy cattle and i am told that this is the description of cattle that they fat all the way up on this north side of kent when i got upon the corn-land in the isle of thanet i got into a garden indeed there is hardly any fallow comparatively few turnips it is a country of corn most of the harvest is in but there are some fields of wheat and of barley not yet housed a great many pieces of lucerne and all of them very fine i left ramsgate to my right about three miles and went right across the island to margate but that place is so thickly settled with stock jobbing cuckolds at this time of the year that having no fancy to get their horns stuck into me i turned away to my left when i got within about half a mile of the town i got to a little hamlet where i breakfasted but could get no corn for my horse and no bacon for myself all was corn around me barns i should think two hundred feet long ricks of enormous size and most numerous crops of wheat five quarters to an acre on the average and a public-house without either bacon or corn the labourers houses all along through this island beggarly in the extreme the people dirty poor-looking ragged but particularly dirty the men and boys with dirty faces and dirty smock-frocks and dirty shirts and good god what a difference between the wife of a labouring man here and the wife of a labouring man in the forests and woodlands of hampshire and sussex invariably have i observed that the richer the soil and the more destitute of woods that is to say the more purely a corn country 
the more miserable the labourers the cause is this the great the big bull-frog grasps all in this beautiful island every inch of land is appropriated by the rich no hedges no ditches no commons no grassy lanes a country divided into great farms a few trees surround the great farmhouse all the rest is bare of trees and the wretched labourer has not a stick of wood and has no place for a pig or cow to graze or even to lie down upon the rabbit countries are the countries for labouring men there the ground is not so valuable there it is not so easily appropriated by the few here in this island the work is almost all done by the horses the horses plough the ground they sow the ground they hoe the ground they carry the corn home they thresh it out and they carry it to market nay in this island they rake the ground they rake up the straggling straws and ears so that they do the whole except the reaping and the mowing it is impossible to have an idea of anything more miserable than the state of the labourers in this part of the country after coming by margate i passed a village called monkton and another called sar at sar there is a bridge over which you come out of the island as you go into it over the bridge at sandwich at monkton they had seventeen men working on the roads though the harvest was not quite in and though of course it had all to be threshed out but at monkton they had four threshing machines and they have three threshing machines at sar though there also they have several men upon the roads this is a shocking state of things and in spite of everything that the jenkinsons and the scots can do the state of things must be changed at sar or a little way further back i saw a man who had just begun to reap a field of canary seed the plants were too far advanced to be cut in order to be bleached for the making of plat but i got the reaper to select me a few green stalks that grew near a bush that stood on the outside of the piece these i have brought on with me in order to give them a trial at sar i began to cross the marsh and had after this to come through the village of upstreet and another village called steady before i got to canterbury at upstreet i was struck with the words written upon a board which was fastened upon a pole which pole was standing in a garden near a neat little box of a house the words were these paradise place spring guns and steel traps are set here a pretty idea it must give us of paradise to know that spring guns and steel traps are set in it this is doubtless some stock jobber's place for in the first place the name is likely to have been selected by one of that crew and in the next place whenever any of them go to the country they look upon it that they are to begin a sort of warfare against everything around them they invariably look upon every labourer as a thief as you approach canterbury from the isle of thanet you have another instance of the squanderings of the lawyer ministers nothing equals the ditches the caverns the holes the tanks and hiding places of the hill at dover but considerable as the city of canterbury is that city within its gates stands upon less ground than those horrible erections the barracks of pitt dundas and percival they are perfectly enormous but thanks be unto god they begin to crumble down they have a sickly hue all is lassitude about them endless are their lawns their gravel walks and their ornaments but their lawns are unshaven their gravel walks grassy and their ornaments putting on the garments of ugliness you see the grass growing opposite the doorways a hole in the window strikes you here and there lamp-posts there are but no lamps here are horse barracks foot barracks artillery barracks engineer barracks a whole country of barracks but only here and there a soldier the thing is actually perishing it is typical of the state of the great thing of things it gave me inexpressible pleasure to perceive the gloom that seemed to hang over these barracks which once swarmed with soldiers and their blithe companions as a hive swarms with bees these barracks now look like the environs of a hive in winter westminster abbey church is not the place for the monument of pitt the statue of the great snorting bawler ought to be stuck up here just in the midst of this hundred or two of acres covered with barracks these barracks too were erected in order to compel the french to return to the payment of tithes in order to bring their necks again under the yoke of the lords and the clergy that has not been accomplished the french as mr hoggart assures us have neither tithes taxes nor rates and the people of canterbury know that they have a hop duty to pay while mr hoggart of broad street tells them that he has farms to let in france where there are hop gardens and where there is no hop duty they have lately had races at canterbury and the mayor and aldermen in order to get the prince leopold to attend them presented him with the freedom of the city but it rained all the time and he did not come the mayor and aldermen do not understand things half so well as this german gentleman who has managed his matters as well i think as any one that i ever heard of this fine old town or rather city is remarkable for cleanliness and niceness notwithstanding it has a cathedral in it the country round it is very rich and this year while the hops are so bad in most other parts they are not so very bad just about canterbury elverton farm near faversham friday morning september fifth in going through canterbury yesterday i gave a boy sixpence to hold my horse 
while I went into the cathedral, just to thank St. Swithin for the trick that he had played my friends, the Quakers, led along by the wet weather till after the harvest had actually begun, and then to find the weather turn fine, all of a sudden, this must have soused them pretty decently, and I hear of one who at Canterbury has made a bargain by which he will certainly lose two thousand pounds. The land where I am now is equal to that of the Isle of Thanet. The harvest is nearly over, and all the crops have been prodigiously fine. In coming from Canterbury you come to the top of a hill, called Wharton Hill, at four miles from Canterbury on the London road, and you there look down into one of the finest flats in England. A piece of marsh comes up nearly to Faversham, and at the edge of that marsh lies the farm where I now am. The land here is a deep loam upon chalk, and this is also the nature of the land in the Isle of Thanet, and all the way from that to Dover. The orchards grow well upon this soil, the trees grow finely, the fruit is large and of fine flavour. In 1821 I gave Mr. William Waller, who lives here, some American apple cuttings, and he has now some as fine Newton pippins as one would wish to see. They are very large of their sort, very free in their growth, and they promise to be very fine apples of the kind. Mr. Waller had cuttings from me of several sorts in 1822. These were cut down last year. They have, of course, made shoots this summer, and great numbers of these shoots have fruit spurs, which will have blossom, if not fruit, next year. This very rarely happens, I believe, and the state of Mr. Waller's trees clearly proves to me that the introduction of these American trees would be a great improvement. My American apples, when I left Kensington, promised to be very fine, and the apples which I frequently mentioned as being upon cuttings imported last spring, promised to come to perfection, a thing which I believe we have not an instance of before. Merriworth, Friday evening, 5th September. A friend at Tenterden told me that, if I had a mind to know Kent, I must go through Romney Marsh to Dover, from Dover to Sandwich, from Sandwich to Margate, from Margate to Canterbury, from Canterbury to Faversham, from Faversham to Maidstone, and from Maidstone to Tunbridge. I found from Mr. Waller this morning that the regular turnpike route from his house to Maidstone was through Sittingbourne. I had been along that road several times, and besides, to be covered with dust was what I could not think of when I had it in my power to get to Maidstone without it. I took the road across the country, quitting the London road, or rather crossing it in the dell between Ospring and Green Street. I instantly began to go uphill, slowly indeed, but uphill. I came through the villages of Newnham, Doddington, Ringleston, and to that of Hollingbourne. I had come uphill for thirteen miles from Mr. Waller's house. At last I got to the top of this hill and went along for some distance upon level ground. I found I was got upon just the same sort of land as that on the hill at Folkestone, at Reigate, at Ropley, and at Ashmansworth. The red clayey loam, mixed up with great yellow flintstones. I found fine meadows here, just such as are at Ashmansworth, that is to say on the North Hampshire hills. This sort of ground is characterised by an astonishing depth that they have to go for the water. At Ashmansworth they go to a depth of more than three hundred feet. As I was riding along upon the top of this hill in Kent, I saw the same beautiful sort of meadows that there are at Ashmansworth. I saw the corn backward. I was just thinking to go up to some house, to ask how far they had to go for water, when I saw a large well-bucket and all the chains and wheels belonging to such a concern, but here was also the tackle for a horse to work in drawing up the water. I asked about the depth of the well, and the information I received must have been incorrect, because I was told it was three hundred yards. I asked this of a public-house keeper further on, not seeing anybody where the farmhouse was. I make no doubt that the depth is, as near as possible, that of Ashmansworth. Upon the top of this hill I saw the finest field of beans that I have seen this year, and by very far indeed the finest piece of hops a beautiful piece of hops, surrounded by beautiful plantations of young ash, producing poles for hop-gardens. My road here pointed towards the west. It soon wheeled round towards the south, and all of a sudden I found myself upon the edge of a hill, as lofty and as steep as that at Folkestone, at Reigate, or at Ashmansworth. It was the same famous chalk ridge that I was crossing again. When I got to the edge of the hill, and before I got off my horse to lead him down this more than mile of hill, I sat and surveyed the prospect before me, and to the right and to the left. This is what the people of Kent call the Garden of Eden. It is a district of meadows, cornfields, hop gardens, and orchards of apples, pears, cherries, and filberts, with very little, if any, land which cannot, with propriety, be called good. There are plantations of chestnut and of ash frequently occurring, and as these are cut when long enough to make poles for hops, they are at all times objects of great beauty. At the foot of the hill of which I have been speaking is the village of Hollingburn, thence you come on to Maidstone. From Maidstone to this place, Merriworth, is about seven miles, and these are the finest seven miles that I have ever seen in England, or anywhere else. 
the medway is to your left with its meadows about a mile wide you cross the medway in coming out of maidstone and it goes and finds its way down to rochester through a break in the chalk ridge from maidstone to merryworth i should think that there were hop gardens on one half of the way on both sides of the road then looking across the medway you see hop gardens and orchards two miles deep on the side of a gently rising ground and this continues with you all the way from maidstone to merryworth the orchards form a great feature of the country and the plantations of ashes and of chestnuts that i mentioned before add greatly to the beauty these gardens of hops are kept very clean in general though some of them have been neglected this year owing to the bad appearance of the crop the culture is sometimes mixed that is to say apple trees or cherry trees or filbert trees and hops in the same ground this is a good way they say of raising an orchard i do not believe it and i think that nothing is gained by any of these mixtures they plant apple trees or cherry trees in rows here they then plant a filbert tree close to each of these large fruit trees and then they cultivate the middle of the ground by planting potatoes this has been too greedy it is impossible that they can gain by this what they gain one way they lose the other way and i verily believe that the most profitable way would be never to mix things at all in coming from maidstone i pass through a village called teston where lord basham has a seat tunbridge saturday morning six september i came off from merryworth a little before five o'clock past the seat of lord torrington the friend of mr barretto this mr barretto ought not to be forgotten so soon in eighteen twenty he sued for articles of the peace against lord torrington for having menaced him in consequence of his having pressed his lordship about some money it seems that lord torrington had known him in the east indies that they came home together or soon after one another that his lordship invited mr barretto to his best parties in india that he got him introduced at court in england by sidmouth that he got him made a fellow of the royal society and that he tried to get him introduced into parliament his lordship when barretto rudely pressed him for his money reminded him of all this and of the many difficulties that he had had to overcome with regard to his colour and so forth nevertheless the dingy skinned court visitant pressed in such a way that lord torrington was obliged to be pretty smart with him whereupon the other sued for articles of the peace against his lordship but these were not granted by the court this barretto issued a handbill at the last election as a candidate for st albans i am truly sorry that he was not elected lord camelford threatened to put in his black fellow but he was a sad swaggering fellow and had at last too much of the boroughmonger in him to do a thing so meritorious lord torrington's is but an indifferent-looking place i here began to see southdown sheep again which i had not seen since the time i left tenterden all along here the villages are not more than two miles distance from each other they have all large churches and scarcely anybody to go to them at a village called hadlow there is a house belonging to a mr may the most singular-looking thing i ever saw an immense house stuck all over with a parcel of chimneys or things like chimneys little brick columns with a sort of caps on them looking like carnation sticks with caps at the top to catch the earwigs the building is all of brick and has the oddest appearance of anything i ever saw this tunbridge is but a common country town though very clean and the people looking very well the climate must be pretty warm here for in entering the town i saw a large althea frutex in bloom a thing rare enough any year and particularly a year like this Restroom, saturday noon six september instead of going on to the wen along the turnpike road through seven oaks i turned to my left when i got about a mile out of tunbridge in order to come along that tract of country called the weald of kent that is to say the solid clays which have no bottom which are unmixed with chalk sand stone or anything else the country of dirty roads and of oak trees i stopped at tunbridge only a few minutes but in the weald i stopped to breakfast at a place called lee from lee i came to chittingstone causeway leaving tunbridge wells six miles over the hills to my left from chittingstone i came to bow beach thence to four elms and thence to this little market town of westerham which is just upon the border of kent indeed kent surrey and sussex form adjoining very near to this town westerham exactly like reigate and godston and seven oaks and dorking and folkestone lies between the sand ridge and the chalk ridge the valley is here a little wider than at reigate and that is all the difference there is between the places as soon as you get over the sand hill to the south of reigate you get into the weald of surrey and here as soon as you get over the sand hill to the south of westerham you get into the weald of kent i have now in order to get to the wen to cross the chalk ridge once more and at a point where i never crossed it before coming through the weald i found the corn very good and low as the ground is wet as it is cold as it is there will be very little of the wheat which will not be housed before saturday night all the corn is good and the barley excellent not far from bow beach i saw two oak trees 
one of which was, they told me, more than thirty feet round, and the other more than twenty-seven, but they have been hollow for half a century. They are not much bigger than the oak upon Tilford Green, if any, I mean in the trunk, but they are hollow, while that tree is sound in all its parts and growing still. I have had a most beautiful ride through the weald. The day is very hot, but I have been in the shade, and my horse's feet very often in the rivulets and wet lanes. In one place I rode above a mile completely arched over by the boughs of the underwood, growing in the banks of the lane. What an odd taste that man must have who prefers a turnpike road to a lane like this! Very near to Westerham there are hops, and I have seen now and then a little bit of hop-garden, even in the weald. Hops will grow well where Lucerne will grow well, and Lucerne will grow well where there is a rich top and a dry bottom. When therefore you see hops in the weald, it is on the side of some hill, where there is sand or stone at bottom, and not where there is real clay beneath. There appear to be hops here and there all along from nearly at Dover to Alton in Hampshire. You find them all along Kent. You find them at Westerham, across at Worth in Sussex, at Godston in Surrey, over to the north of Merrow Down, near Guildford, at Godalming, under the Hog's Back, at Farnham, and all along that way to Alton. But there, I think, they end. The whole face of the country seems to rise when you get just beyond Alton, and to keep up. Whether you look to the north, the south, or west, the land seems to rise and the hop cease, till you come again away to the north-west, in Herefordshire. Kensington, Saturday night, 6 September. Here I close my day at the end of forty-four miles. In coming up the chalk hill from Westerham, I prepared myself for the red, stiff, clay-like loam, the big yellow flints and the meadows, and I found them all. I have now gone over this chalk ridge in the following places, at Coombe in the north-west of Hampshire, I mean the north-west corner, the very extremity of the county. I have gone over it at Ashmansworth or Highclere, going from Newbury to Andover, at Kingsclere, going from Newbury to Winchester, at Ropley, going from Alresford to Selborne, at Dippinghall, going from Crondall to Thursley, at Merrow, going from Chertsey to Chilworth, at Reigate, at Westerham, and then between these at Godston, at Sevenoaks, going from London to Battle, at Hollingburn, as mentioned above, and at Folkestone. In all these places I have crossed this chalk ridge. Everywhere upon the top of it I have found a flat, and the soil of all these flats I have found to be a red stiff loam mingled up with big yellow flints. A soil difficult to work, but by no means bad, whether for wood, hops, grass, orchards, or corn. I once before mentioned that I was assured that the pasture upon these bleak hills was as rich as that which is found in the north of Wiltshire, in the neighbourhood of Swindon, where they make some of the best cheese in the kingdom. Upon these hills I have never found the labouring people poor and miserable, as in the rich vales. All is not appropriated where there are coppices and wood, where the cultivation is not so easy, and the produce so very large. After getting up the hill from Westerham, I had a general descent to perform all the way to the Thames. When you get to Beckenham, which is the last parish in Kent, the country begins to assume a cockney-like appearance. All is artificial, and you no longer feel any interest in it. I was anxious to make this journey into Kent in the midst of harvest, in order that I might know the real state of the crops. The result of my observations and my inquiries is that the crop is a full average crop of everything except barley, and that the barley yields a great deal more than an average crop. I thought that the beans were very poor during my ride into Hampshire, but I then saw no real bean countries. I have seen such countries now, and I do not think that the beans present us with a bad crop. As to the quality, it is, in no case, except perhaps the barley, equal to that of last year. We had last year an Italian summer. When the wheat or other grain has to ripen in wet weather, it will not be bright as it will when it has to ripen in fair weather. It will have a dingy or clouded appearance, and perhaps the flour may not be quite so good. The wheat, in fact, will not be so heavy. In order to enable others to judge as well as myself, I took samples from the fields as I went along. I took them very fairly, and as often as I thought that there was any material change in the soil or other circumstances. During the ride I took sixteen samples. These are now at the office of the register in Fleet Street, where they may be seen by any gentleman who thinks the information likely to be useful to him. The samples are numbered, and there is a reference pointing out the place where each sample was taken. The opinions that I gather amount to this, that there is an average crop of everything, and a little more of barley. Now then we shall see how all this tallies with the schemes, with the intentions and expectations of our matchless gentlemen at Whitehall. These wise men have put forth their views in the courier of the 27th of August, and in words which ought never to be forgotten and which, at any rate, shall be recorded here. Grain. During the present unsettled state of the weather, 
it is impossible for the best informed persons to anticipate upon good grounds what will be the future price of agricultural produce should the season even yet prove favourable for the operations of the harvest there is every probability of the average price of grain continuing at that exact price which will prove most conducive to the interests of the corn growers and at the same time encouraging to the agriculture of our colonial possessions we do not speak lightly on this subject for we are aware that his majesty's ministers have been fully alive to the inquiries from all qualified quarters as to the effect likely to be produced on the markets from the addition of the present crops to the stock of wheat already on hand the result of these inquiries is that in the highest quarters there exists the full expectation that towards the month of november the price of wheat will nearly approach to seventy shillings a price which while it affords the extent of remuneration to the british farmer recognised by the corn laws will at the same time admit of the sale of the canadian bonded wheat and the introduction of this foreign corn grown by british colonists will contribute to keeping down our markets and exclude foreign grain from other quarters there's nice gentlemen of whitehall what pretty gentlemen they are envy of surrounding nations indeed to be under command of pretty gentlemen who can make calculations so nice and put forth predictions so positive upon a subject admiration of the world indeed to live under the command of men who can so control seasons and markets or at least who can so dive into the secrets of trade and find out the contents of the fields barns and ricks as to be able to balance things so nicely as to cause the canadian corn to find a market without injuring the sale of that of the british farmer and without admitting that of the french farmer and the other farmers of the continent happy too happy rogues that we are to be under the guidance of such pretty gentlemen and right just is it that we should be banished for life if we utter a word tending to bring such pretty gentlemen into contempt let it be observed that this paragraph must have come from whitehall this wretched paper is the demi-official organ of the government as to the owners of the paper daniel stuart that notorious fellow street and the rest of them not excluding the brother of the great oracle which brother bought the other day a share of this vehicle of baseness and folly as to these fellows they have no control other than what relates to the expenditure and the receipts of the vehicle they get their news from the officers of the whitehall people and their paper is the mouthpiece of those same people mark this i pray you reader and let the french people mark it too and then take their revenge for the waterloo insolence this being the case then this paragraph proceeding from the pretty gentleman what a light it throws on their expectations their hopes and their fears they see that wheat at seventy shillings a quarter is necessary to them ah pray mark that they see that wheat at seventy shillings a quarter is necessary to them and therefore they say that wheat will be at seventy shillings a quarter the price as they call it necessary to remunerate the british farmer and how do the conjurers at whitehall know this why they have made full inquiries in qualified quarters and the qualified quarters have satisfied the highest quarters that towards the month of november the price of wheat will nearly approach to seventy shillings the quarter i wonder what the words towards the end of november may mean devil's in it if middle of september is not towards november and the wheat instead of going on towards seventy shillings is very fast coming down to forty the beast who wrote this paragraph the pretty beast this envy of surrounding nations wrote it on the twenty seventh of august a soaking wet saturday the pretty beast was not aware that the next day was going to be fine and that we were to have only the succeeding tuesday and half the following saturday of wet weather until the whole of the harvest should be in the pretty beast wrote while the rain was spattering against the window and he did not speak lightly but was fully aware that the highest quarters having made inquiries of the qualified quarters were sure that wheat would be at seventy shillings during the ensuing year what will be the price of wheat it is impossible for any one to say i know a gentleman who is a very good judge of such matters who is of opinion that the average price of wheat will be thirty-two shillings a quarter or lower before christmas this is not quite half what the highest quarters expect in consequence of the inquiries which they have made of the qualified quarters i do not say that the average of wheat will come down to thirty-two shillings but this i know that at reading last saturday about forty-five shillings was the price and i hear that in norfolk the price is forty-two the highest quarters in the infamous london press will at any rate be prettily exposed before christmas old sir thomas lethbridge too and gaffer gooch and his base tribe of pittites at ipswich coke and suffield and their crew all these will be prettily laughed at and all that tall soul lord milton escape being reminded of his profound and patriotic observation 
relative to this self-renovating country. No sooner did he see the wheat get up to sixty or seventy shillings than he lost all his alarms, found that all things were right, turned his back on Yorkshire reformers, and went and toiled for scarlet at Peterborough, and discovered that there was nothing wrong at last, and that the self-renovating country would triumph over all its difficulties. So it will, tall soul. It will triumph over all its difficulties. It will renovate itself. It will purge itself of rotten boroughs, of vile borough-mongers, their tools and their stop-gaps. It will purge itself of all the villainies which now corrode its heart. It will, in short, free itself from those curses, which the expenditure of eight or nine hundred millions of English money took place in order to make perpetual. It will, in short, become free from oppression, as easy and as happy as the gallant and sensible nation on the other side of the channel. This is the sort of renovation, but not renovation by the means of wheat at seventy shillings a quarter. Renovation it will have. It will rouse, and will shake from itself, curses like the pension which is paid to Burke's executors. This is the sort of renovation, tall soul, and not wheat at seventy shillings a quarter, while it is at twenty-five shillings a quarter in France. Pray observe, reader, how the tall soul catched at the rise in the price of wheat, how he snapped at it, how quickly he ceased his attacks upon the Whitehall people and upon the system. He thought he had been deceived. He thought that things were coming about again. And so he drew in his horns and began to talk about the self-renovating country. This was the tone of them all. This was the tone of all the borough-mongers, all the friends of the system, all those who, like Lethbridge, had begun to be staggered. They had deviated for a moment into our path, but they popped back again the moment they saw the price of wheat rise. All the enemies of reform, all the calumniators of reformers, all the friends of the system, most anxiously desired a rise in the price of wheat. Mark the curious fact, that all the vile press of London, the whole of that infamous press, that newspapers, magazines, reviews, the whole of the base thing, and a baser surely this world never saw, that the whole of this base thing rejoiced, exulted, crowed over me, and told an impudent lie in order to have the crowing. Crowed for what? Because wheat and bread were become dear. A newspaper hatched under a corrupt priest, a profligate priest, and recently espoused to the hell of Pall Mall. Even this vile thing crowed because wheat and bread had become dear. Now it is notorious that, heretofore, every periodical publication in this kingdom was in the constant habit of lamenting when bread became dear, and of rejoicing when it became cheap. This is notorious. Nay, it is equally notorious that this infamous press was everlastingly assailing bakers and millers and butchers for not selling bread, flour and meat cheaper than they were selling them. In how many hundreds of instances has this infamous press caused attacks to be made by the mob upon tradesmen of this description? All these things are notorious. Moreover, notorious it is that long previous to every harvest, this infamous, this execrable, this beastly press was engaged in stunning the public with accounts of the great crop which was just coming forward. There was always with this press a prodigiously large crop. This was invariably the case. It was never known to be the contrary. Now these things are perfectly well known to every man in England. How comes it then, reader, that the profligate, the trading, the lying, the infamous press of London has now totally changed its tone and bias? The base thing never now tells us that there is a great crop, or even a good crop. It never now wants cheap bread and cheap wheat and cheap meat. It never now finds faults of bakers and butchers. It now always endeavours to make it appear that corn is dearer than it is. The base morning herald about three weeks ago not only suppressed the fact of the fall of wheat, but asserted that there had been a rise in the price. Now why is all this? That is a great question, reader. That is a very interesting question. Why has this infamous press, which always pursues that which it thinks its own interest, why has it taken this strange turn? This is the reason. Stupid as the base thing is, it has arrived at a conviction that if the price of the produce of the land cannot be kept up to something approaching ten shillings a bushel for good wheat, the hellish system of funding must be blown up. The infamous press has arrived at a conviction that that cheating, that fraudulent system by which this press lives, must be destroyed unless the price of corn can be kept up. The infamous traders of the press are perfectly well satisfied that the interest of the debt must be reduced unless wheat can be kept up to nearly ten shillings a bushel. Stupid as they are, and stupid as the fellows down at Westminster are, they know very well that the whole system, stock-jobbers, Jews, cant and all, go to the devil at once, as soon as a deduction is made from the interest of the debt. Knowing this, they want wheat to sell high, 
because it has at last been hammered into their skulls that the interest cannot be paid in full if wheat sells low delightful is the dilemma in which they are dear bread does not suit their manufactories and cheap bread does not suit their debt envy of surrounding nations how hard it is that providence will not enable your farmers to sell dear and the consumers to buy cheap these are the things that you want admiration of the world you are but have these things you will not there may be those indeed who question whether you yourself know what you want but at any rate if you want these things you will not have them before i conclude let me ask the reader to take a look at the singularity of the tone and tricks of this six acts government is it not a novelty in the world to see a government and in ordinary seasons too having its whole soul absorbed in considerations relating to the price of corn there are our neighbours the french who have got a government engaged in taking military possession of a great neighbouring kingdom to free which from these very french we have recently expended a hundred and fifty millions of money our neighbours have got a government that is thus engaged and we have got a government that employs itself in making incessant inquiries in all the qualified quarters relative to the price of wheat curious employment for a government singular occupation for the ministers of the great george they seem to think nothing of spain with its eleven millions of people being in fact added to france wholly insensible do they appear to concerns of this sort while they sit thinking day and night upon the price of the bushel of wheat however they are not after all such fools as they appear to be despicable indeed must be that nation whose safety or whose happiness does in any degree depend on so fluctuating a thing as the price of corn this is a matter that we must take as it comes the seasons will be what they will be and all the calculations of statesmen must be made wholly independent of the changes and chances of seasons this has always been the case to be sure what nation could ever carry on its affairs if it had to take into consideration the price of corn nevertheless such is the situation of our government that its very existence in its present way depends upon the price of corn the pretty fellows at whitehall if you may say to them oh but look at spain look at the enormous strides of the french think of the consequences in case of another war look too at the growing marine of america see mr jenkinson see mr canning see mr huskisson see mr peel and all ye tribe of grenvilles see what tremendous dangers are gathering together about us us i about you but pray think what tremendous dangers wheat at four shillings a bushel will bring about us this is the git here lies the whole of it we laugh at a government employing itself in making calculations about the price of corn and in employing its press to put forth market puffs we laugh at these things but we should not laugh if we considered that it is on the price of wheat that the duration of the power and the profits of these men depends they know what they want and they wish to believe themselves and to make others believe that they shall have it i have observed before but it is necessary to observe again that all those who are for the system let them be opposition or not opposition feel as whitehall feels about the price of corn i have given an instance in the tall soul but it is the same with the whole of them with the whole of those who do not wish to see this infernal system changed i was informed and i believe it to be true that the marquis of lansdowne said last april when the great rise took place in the price of corn that he had always thought that the cash measures had but little effect on prices but that he was now satisfied that those measures had no effect at all on prices now what is our situation what is the situation of this country if we must have the present ministry or a ministry of which the marquis of lansdowne is to be a member if the marquis of lansdowne did utter these words and again i say that i verily believe he did utter them ours is a government that now seems to depend very much upon the weather the old type of a ship at sea will not do now ours is a weather government and to know the state of it we must have recourse to those glasses that the jews carry about weather depends upon the winds in a great measure and i have no scruple to say that the situation of those two right honourable youths that are now gone to the lakes in the north that their situation next winter will be rendered very irksome not to say perilous by the present easterly wind if it should continue about fifteen days longer pitt when he had just made a monstrous issue of paper and had thereby actually put the match which blowed up the old she-devil in seventeen ninety seven pitt at that time congratulated the nation that the wisdom of parliament had established a solid system of finance anything but solid it assuredly was but his system of finance was as worthy of being called solid as that system of government which now manifestly depends upon the weather and the winds since my return home it is now thursday eleventh september i have received letters from the east from the north and from the west 
all tell me that the harvest is very far advanced, and that the crops are free from blight. These letters are not particular as to the weight of the crop, except that they all say that the barley is excellent. The wind is now coming from the east. There is every appearance of the fine weather continuing. Before Christmas we shall have the wheat down to what will be a fair average price in future. I always said that the late rise was a mere puff. It was in part a scarcity rise. The wheat of 1821 was grown and bad. That of 1822 had to be begun upon in July. The crop has had to last thirteen months and a half. The present crop will have to last only eleven months or less. The crop of barley last year was so very bad, so very small, and the crop of the year before so very bad in quality, that wheat was malted last year in great quantities instead of barley. This year the crop of barley is prodigious. All these things considered, wheat, if the cash measures, had had no effect, must have been a hundred and forty shillings a quarter, and barley eighty. Yet the first never got to seventy, and the latter never got to forty. And yet there was a man who calls himself a statesman, to say that that mere puff of a rise satisfied him, that the cash measures had never had any effect. Ah, they are all afraid to believe in the effect of those cash measures. They tremble like children at the sight of the rod, when you hold up before them the effect of those cash measures. Their only hope is that I am wrong in my opinions upon that subject, because if I am right, their system is condemned to speedy destruction. I thus conclude for the present my remarks relative to the harvest and the price of corn. It is the great subject of the day, and the comfort is that we are now speedily to see whether I be right or whether the Marquis of Lansdowne be right. As to the infamous London press, the moment the wheat comes down to forty shillings, that is to say an average government return of forty shillings, I will spend ten pounds in placarding this infamous press, after the manner in which we used to placard the base and detestable enemies of the Queen. This infamous press has been what is vulgarly called running its rigs for several months past. The Quakers have been urging it on underhanded. They have, I understand, been bribing it pretty deeply in order to calumniate me, and to favour their own monopoly, but, thank God, the cunning knaves have outwitted themselves. They won't play at cards, but they will play at stocks, they will play at lottery tickets, and they will play at Mark Lane. They have played a silly game, this time, since within, that good old Roman Catholic saint seemed to have set a trap for them. He went on, wet, 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 even until the harvest began, then after two or three days' sunshine, shocking wet again, the ground soaking, the wheat growing, and the friends, the gentle friends, seeking the spirit, were as busy amongst the sacks at Mark Lane as the devil in a high wind. In short, they bought away, with all the gain of godliness, and a little more before their eyes. All of a sudden, since Swithin took away his clouds, out came the sun, the wind got round to the east, just sun enough and just wind enough, and as the wheat ricks everywhere rose up, the long jaws of the Quakers dropped down, and their faces of slate became of a darker hue. That sect will certainly be punished this year, and let us hope that such a change will take place in their concerns, as will compel a part of them to labour at any rate. For at present their sect is a perfect monster in society, a whole sect, not one man of whom earns his living by the sweat of his brow, a sect a great deal worse than the Jews, for some of them do work. However, God send us the easterly wind for another fortnight, and we shall certainly see some of this sect at work. End of chapter 15chapter 16 and 17 of rural rides this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nicole lee rural rides by william cobbett chapter 16 rural ride from kensington across surrey and along that county reigate wednesday evening 19th october 1825 Having some business at Hartswood, near Reigate, I intended to come off this morning on horseback, along with my son Richard, but it rained so furiously the last night, that we gave up the horse project for to-day, being by appointment to be at Reigate by ten o'clock to-day, so that we came off this morning at five o'clock in a post-chaise, intending to return home and take our horses. Finding, however, that we cannot quit this place till Friday, we have now sent for our horses, though the weather is dreadfully wet, but we are under a farmhouse roof, and the wind may whistle and the rain fall as much as they like. Reigate, Thursday evening, 20th October. Having done my business at Hartswood to-day about eleven o'clock, I went to a sale at a farm, which the farmer is quitting. 
Here I had a view of what has long been going on all over the country. The farm, which belongs to Christ's Hospital, has been held by a man of the name of Charrington, in whose family the lease has been, I hear, a great number of years. The house is hidden by trees. It stands in the weald of Surrey, close by the river Mole, which is here a mere rivulet, though just below this house. The rivulet supplies the very prettiest flour-mill I ever saw in my life. Everything about this farmhouse was formerly the scene of plain manners and plentiful living, oak clothes chests, oak bedsteads, oak chests of drawers, and oak tables to eat on, long, strong, and well supplied with joint stools. Some of the things were many hundreds of years old, but all appeared to be in a state of decay, and nearly of disuse. There appeared to have been hardly any family in that house, where formerly there were, in all probability, from ten to fifteen men, boys, and maids. And which was the worst of all, there was a parlour, ay, and a carpet, and bell-pull, too. One end of the front of this once plain and substantial house had been moulded into a parlour, and there was the mahogany table, and the fine chairs, and the fine glass, and all as barefaced upstart as any stock job in the kingdom can boast of. And there were the decanters, the glasses, the dinner-set of crockery-ware, and all just in the true stock jobber style, and I dare say it has been Squire Charrington, and the Miss Charringtons, and not plain Master Charrington, and his son Hodge, and his daughter Betty Charrington, all of whom this accursed system has, in all likelihood, transmuted into a species of mock gentlefolks, while it has ground the labourers down into real slaves. Why do not farmers now feed and lodge their workpeople, as they did formerly, because they cannot keep them upon so little as they give them in wages? This is the real cause of the change. There needs no more to prove that the lot of the working classes has become worse than it formerly was. This fact alone is quite sufficient to settle this point. All the world knows that a number of people boarded in the same house and at the same table can, with as good food, be boarded much cheaper than those persons divided into twos, threes or fours can be boarded. This is a well-known truth. Therefore, if the farmer now shuts his pantry against his labourers and pays them wholly in money, is it not clear that he does it because he thereby gives them a living cheaper to him, that is to say, a worse living than formerly? Mind, he has a house for them, a kitchen for them to sit in, bedrooms for them to sleep in, tables and stools and benches of everlasting duration, all these he has, all these cost him nothing, and yet so much does he gain by pinching them in wages, that he lets all these things remain as of no use, rather than feed labourers in the house. Judge, then, of the change that has taken place in the condition of these labourers, and be astonished, if you can, at the pauperism and the crimes that now disgrace this once happy and moral England. The land produces, on an average, what it always produced, but there is a new distribution of the produce. This squire Charrington's father used, I dare say, to sit at the head of the oak table along with his men, say grace to them, and cut up the meat and the pudding. He might take a cup of strong beer to himself when they had none, but that was pretty nearly all the difference in their manner of living, so that all lived well. But the squire had many wine decanters, and wine glasses, and a dinner set, and a breakfast set, and dessert knives, and these evidently imply carryings on, and a consumption that must of necessity have greatly robbed the long oak table, if it had remained fully tenanted. That long table could not share in the work of the decanters and the dinner set, therefore it became almost untenanted. The labourers retreated to hovels, called cottages, and instead of board and lodging they got money so little of it as to enable the employer to drink wine, but then, that he might not reduce them to quite starvation, they were enabled to come to him in the king's name, and demand food as paupers. And now, mind, that which a man receives in the king's name, he knows well he has by force, and it is not in nature that he should thank anybody for it, and least of all the party from whom it is forced. Then, if this sort of force be insufficient to obtain him enough to eat and to keep him warm, Is it surprising, if you think it no great offence against God, who created no man to starve, to use another sort of force, more within his own control? Is it, in short, surprising, if he resort to theft and robbery? This is not only the natural progress, but it has been the progress in England. The blame is not justly imputed to Squire Charrington and his like. The blame belongs to the infernal stock-jobbing system. There was no reason to expect that farmers would not endeavour to keep pace, in point of show and luxury, with fund-holders, and with all the tribes that war and taxes created. 
Farmers were not the authors of the mischief, and now they are compelled to shut the labourers out of their houses, and to pinch them in their wages, in order to be able to pay their own taxes. And besides this, the manners and the principles of the working class are so changed, that a sort of self-preservation bids the farmer, especially in some counties, to keep them from beneath his roof. I could not quit this farmhouse without reflecting on the thousands of scores of bacon, and thousands of bushels of bread, that had been eaten from the long oak table which I said to myself, is now perhaps going at last to the bottom of a bridge, that some stock-jobber will stick up over an artificial river in his cockney garden. By God it shan't, said I, almost in a real passion. And so I requested a friend to buy it for me, and if he do so I will take it to Kensington or to Fleet Street, for the good it has done in the world. When the old farmhouses are down, and down they must come in time, what a miserable thing the country will be! Those that are now erected are mere painted shells with a mistress within, who is stuck up in a place she calls a parlour with, if she have children, the young ladies and gentlemen about her, some showy chairs and a sofa, a sofa by all means, half a dozen prints in gilt frames hanging up, some swinging bookshelves with novels and tracts upon them, a dinner brought in by a girl that is perhaps better educated than she, two or three knick-knacks to eat instead of a piece of bacon and a pudding the house too neat for a dirty-shoed carter to be allowed to come into, and everything proclaiming to every sensible beholder that there is here a constant anxiety to make a show not warranted by the reality. The children, which is the worst part of it, are all too clever to work, they are all to be gentlefolks. Go to plough! Good God! What, young gentlemen go to plough? They become clerks, or some skimmy-dish thing or other. They flee from the dirty work, as cunning horses do from the bridle. What misery is all this! What a mass of materials for producing that general and dreadful convulsion that must, first or last, come, and blow this funding and jobbing and enslaving and starving system to atoms! I was going to-day by the side of a plat of ground, where there was a very fine flock of turkeys. I stopped to admire them, and observed to the owner how fine they were, when he answered, We owe them entirely to you, sir, for we never raised one till we read your cottage economy. I then told him that we had this year raised two broods at Kensington, one black and one white, one of nine and one of eight, but that, about three weeks back, they appeared to become dull and pale about the head, and that therefore I sent them to a farmhouse where they recovered instantly, and the broods being such a contrast to each other in point of colour, they were now, when prowling over a grass field amongst, the most agreeable sights that I had ever seen. I intended, of course, to let them get their full growth at Kensington, where they were in a grass plat about fifteen yards square and where I thought that the feeding of them in great abundance, with lettuces and other greens from the garden, together with grain, would carry them on to perfection. But I found that I was wrong, and that, though you may raise them to a certain size, in a small place, and with such management, they then, if so much confined, begin to be sickly. Several of mine began actually to droop, and the very day they were sent into the country they became as gay as ever, and in three days all the colour about their heads came back to them. This town of Reigate had in former times a priory, which had considerable estates in the neighbourhood, and this is brought to my recollection by a circumstance which has recently taken place in this very town. We all know how long it has been the fashion for us to take it for granted that the monasteries were bad things, but of late I have made some hundreds of thousands of very good Protestants begin to suspect that monasteries were better than poor rates, and that monks and nuns who fed the poor were better than sinecure and pensioned men and women who feed upon the poor. But how came the monasteries? How came this that was at Reigate, for instance? Why, it was, if I recollect correctly, founded by a Surrey gentleman, who gave this spot and other estates to it, and who, as was usual, provided that masses were to be said in it, for his soul and those of others, and that it should, as usual, give aid to the poor and needy. Now, upon the face of the transaction, what harm could this do the community? On the contrary, it must, one would think, do it good, for here was this estate given to a set of landlords who never could quit the spot, who could have no families, who could save no money, who could hold no private property, who could make no will, who must spend all their income at Reigate and near it, who, as was the custom, fed the poor, administered to the sick, and taught some at least of the people gratis. This, upon the face of the thing, seems to be a very good way of disposing of a rich man's estate. Ay, but, it is said, he left his estate away from his relations. That is not sure by any means. The contrary is fairly to be presumed. Doubtless it was the custom for Catholic priests, before they took their leave of a dying rich man, to advise him to think of the church and the poor, that is to say, to exhort him to bequeath something to them, and this has been made a monstrous charge against that church. It is surprising how blind men are, when they have a mind to be blind, what despicable dolts they are when they desire to be cheated. 
be of the church of england must have a special deal of good sense and of modesty to be sure to rail against the catholic church on this account when our common prayer-book copied from an act of parliament commands our parsons to do just the same thing ah say the dissenters and particularly the unitarians that queer sect who will have all the wisdom in the world to themselves who will believe and won't believe who will be christians and who won't have a christ who will laugh at you if you believe in the trinity and who would if they could boil you in oil if you do not believe in the resurrection oh say the dissenters we know very well that your church parsons are commanded to get if they can dying people to give their money and estates to the church and the poor as they call the concern though the poor we believe come in for very little which is got in this way but what is your church we are the real christians and we upon our souls never play such tricks never no never terrify old women out of their stockings full of guineas and as to us say the unitarians we the most liberal creatures upon earth we whose virtue is indignant at the tricks by which the monks and nuns got legacies from dying people to the injury of heirs and other relations we who are the really enlightened the truly consistent the benevolent the disinterested the exclusive patentees of the salt of the earth which is sold only at or by express permission from our old and original warehouse and manufactory essex street in the strand first street on the left going from temple bar towards charing cross we defy you to show that unitarian parsons stop your protestations and hear my reigate anecdote which as i said above brought the recollection of the old priory into my head the readers of the register heard me several times some years ago mention mr baron massiers who was for a great many years what they call cursitor baron of the exchequer he lived partly in london and partly at reigate for more i believe than half a century and he died about two years ago or less leaving i am told more than a quarter of a million of money the baron came to see me in pall mall in eighteen hundred he always came frequently to see me wherever i was in london not by any means omitting to come to see me in newgate where i was imprisoned for two years with a thousand pounds fine and seven years heavy bail for having expressed my indignation at the flogging of englishmen in the heart of england under a guard of german bayonets and to newgate he always came in his wig and gown in order as he said to show his abhorrence of the sentence i several times passed a week or more with the baron at his house at reigate i might have passed many more if my time and taste would have permitted me to accept of his invitations therefore i knew the baron well he was a most conscientious man he was when i first knew him still a very clever man he retained all his faculties to a very great age in eighteen fifteen i think it was i got a letter from him written in a firm hand correctly as to grammar and ably as to matter and he must then have been little short of ninety he never was a bright man but had always been a very sensible just and humane man and a man too who always cared a great deal for the public good and he was the only man that i ever heard of who refused to have his salary augmented when an augmentation was offered and when all other such salaries were augmented i had heard of this i asked him about it when i saw him again and he said there was no work to be added and i saw no justice in adding to the salary it must added he be paid by somebody and the more i take the less that somebody must have he did not save money for money's sake he saved it because his habits would not let him spend it he kept a house in rathbone place chambers in the temple and his very pretty place at reigate he was by no means stingy but his scale and habits were cheap then consider too a bachelor of nearly a hundred years old his father left him a fortune his brother who also died a very old bachelor left him another and the money lay in the funds and it went on doubling itself over and over again till it became that immense mass which we have seen above and which when the baron was making his will he had neither catholic priest nor protestant parson to exhort him to leave to the church and the poor instead of his relations though as we shall presently see he had somebody else to whom to leave his great heap of money the baron was the most implacable enemy of the catholics as catholics there was rather a peculiar reason for this his grandfather having been a french huguenot and having fled with his children to england at the time of the revocation of the edict of nantes the baron was a very humane man his humanity made him assist to support the french emigrant priests but at the same time he caused sir richard musgrove's book against the irish catholics to be published at his own expense he and i never agreed upon this subject and this subject was with him a vital one he had no asperity in his nature he was naturally all gentleness and benevolence and therefore he never resented what i said to him on this subject and which nobody else ever i believe ventured to say to him but he did not like it and he liked it less because i certainly beat him in the argument however this was long before he visited me in newgate 
and it never produced, though the dispute was frequently revived, any difference in his conduct towards me, which was uniformly friendly to the last time I saw him, before his memory was gone. There was great excuse for the baron. From his very birth he had been taught to hate and abhor the Catholic religion. He had been told that his father and mother had been driven out of France by the Catholics, and there was that mother dinning this in his ears, and all manner of horrible stories along with it, during all the tender years of his life. In short, the prejudice made part of his very frame. In the year 1803, in August, I think it was, I had gone down to his house on a Friday, and was there on a Sunday. After dinner, he and I and his brother walked to the Priory, as is still called the Mansion House, in the dell at Rightgate, which is now occupied by Lord Eastnor, and in which a Mr. Burkett, I think, then lived. After coming away from the Priory, the Baron, whose native place was Betchworth, about two or three miles from Rygate, who knew the history of every house and everything else in this part of the country, began to tell me why the place was called the Priory. From this he came to the superstition and dark ignorance that induced people to found monasteries, and he dwelt particularly on the injustice to heirs and relations, and he went on in the usual Protestant strain, and with all the bitterness of which he was capable against those crafty priests, who thus plundered families by means of the influence which they had over people in their dotage, or who were naturally weak-minded. Alas, poor Baron! He does not seem to have at all foreseen what was to become of his own money. What would he have said to me if I had answered his observations by predicting that he would give his great mass of money to a little parson, for that parson's own private use, leave only a mere pittance to his own relations, leave the little parson his house in which we were then sitting, along with all his other real property, that the little parson would come into the house and take possession, and that his own relations, two nieces, would walk out. Yet all this has actually taken place, and that too after the poor old baron's fourscore years of jokes about the tricks of popish priests practised in the dark ages upon the ignorant and superstitious people of Rygate. When I first knew the baron he was a staunch Church of England man. He went to church every Sunday once, at least. He used to take me to Rygate Church, and I observed that he was very well versed in his prayer book but a decisive proof of his zeal as a Church of England man is that he settled an annual sum on the incumbent of Reigate, in order to induce him to preach or pray, I forget which, in the church twice on a Sunday instead of once. And in case this additional preaching or praying were not performed in Reigate Church, the annuity was to go, and sometimes it does now go, to the poor of an adjoining parish, and not to those of Reigate, lest, I suppose, the parson, the overseers, and other ratepayers might happen to think that the baron's annuity would be better laid out in food for the bodies than for the souls of the poor, or, in other words, lest the money should be taken annually and added to the poor rates to ease the purses of the farmers. It did not, I dare say, occur to the poor baron, when he was making this settlement, that he was now giving money to make a church parson put up additional prayers, though he had all his lifetime been laughing at those who, in the dark ages, gave money for this purpose to Catholic priests. Nor did it, I dare say, occur to the baron, that in his contingent settlement of the annuity on the poor of an adjoining parish, he as good as declared his opinion that he distrusted the piety of the parson, the overseers, the church wardens, and indeed of all the people of Reigate. Yes, at the very moment that he was providing additional prayers for them, he in the very same parchment put a provision, which clearly showed that he was thoroughly convinced that they, overseers, church wardens, people, parson, and all, loved money better than prayers. What was this then? Was it hypocrisy? Was it ostentation? No, mistake. The baron thought that those who could not go to church in the morning ought to have an opportunity of going in the afternoon. He was aware of the power of money, but when he came to make his obligatory clause he was compelled to do that which reflected great discredit on the very church and religion which it was his object to honour and uphold. However, the baron was a staunch churchman, as this fact clearly proves. Several years he had become what they call an Unitarian. The first time, I think, that I perceived this was in 1812, he came to see me in Newgate, and he soon began to talk about religion, which had not been much his habit. He went on at a great rate, laughing about the Trinity, and I remember that he repeated the Unitarian Deistic, which makes a joke of the idea of there being a devil, and which they all repeat to you, and at the same time laugh and look as cunning and as priggish as jackdaws, just as if they were wiser than all the rest of the world. I hate to hear the conceited and disgusting prigs seeming to take it for granted that they only are wise, because others believe in the Incarnation without being able to reconcile it to reason. The prigs don't consider that there is no more reason for the Resurrection than for the Incarnation, and yet having taken it into their heads to come up again, they would murder you if they dared, if you were to deny the Resurrection. I do most heartily despise this priggish set for their conceit and impudence, 
but seeing that they want reason for the incarnation, seeing that they will have effects here ascribed to none but usual causes, let me put a question or two to them. 1. Whence comes the white clover that comes up and covers all the ground in America, where hardwood trees, after standing for thousands of years, have been burnt down? 2. Whence come, in similar cases as to self-woods, the hurtleberries in some places, and the raspberries in others? 3. Whence come fish in new-made places where no fish have ever been put? 4. What causes horsehair to become living things? 5. What causes frogs to come in drops of rain, or those drops of rain to turn to frogs, the moment they are on the earth? 6. What causes mosquitoes to come in rain-water caught in a glass, covered over immediately with oil-paper, tied down and so kept till full of these winged torments? 7. What causes flounders, real little flatfish, brown on one side, white on the other, mouth sideways, with tail, fins and all, leaping alive, in the inside of a rotten sheep's, and of every rotten sheep's liver? There, prigs, answer these questions. Fifty might be given you, but these are enough. Answer these. I suppose you will not deny the facts. They are all notoriously true. The last, which of itself would be quite enough for you, will be attested on oath, if you like it, by any farmer, ploughman, and shepherd in England. Answer this question seven, or hold your conceited gabble about the impossibility of that which I need not here name. Men of sense do not attempt to discover that which it is impossible to discover. They leave things pretty much as they find them, and take care, at least, not to make changes of any sort without very evident necessity. The poor baron, however, appeared to be quite eaten up with his rational Christianity. He talked like a man who has made a discovery of his own. He seemed as pleased as I, when I was a boy, used to be, when I had just found a rabbit's stop or a blackbird's nest full of young ones. I do not recollect what I said upon this occasion. It is most likely that I said nothing in contradiction to him. I saw the baron many times after this, but I never talked with him about religion. Before the summer of 1822, I had not seen him for a year or two, perhaps. But in July of that year, on a very hot day, I was going down Rathbone Place, and happening to cast my eye on the Baron's house, I knocked at the door to ask how he was. His man-servant came to the door, and told me that his master was at dinner. Well, said I, never mind, give my best respects to him. But the servant, who had always been with him since I knew him, begged me to come in, for that he was sure his master would be glad to see me. I thought, as it was likely that I might never see him again, I would go in. The servant announced me, and the baron said, Beg him to walk in. In I went, and there I found the baron at dinner, but not quite alone, nor without spiritual as well as carnal and vegetable nourishment before him, for there, on the opposite side of his vis-à-vis -vis dining table, sat that nice, neat, straight, prim piece of mortality, commonly called the Reverend Robert Fellows, who was the chaplain to the unfortunate queen, until Mr. Alderman Wood's son came to supply his place, and who was now, I could clearly see, in a fair way enough. I had dined, and so I let them dine on. The baron was become quite a child, or worse as to mind, though he ate as heartily as I ever saw him, and he was always a great eater. When his servant said, Here is Mr. Cobbett, sir, he said, How do you do, sir? I have read much of your writing, sir, but never had the pleasure to see your person before. After a time I made him recollect me, but he directly after, being about to relate something about America, turned towards me and said, Were you ever in America, sir? but I must mention one proof of the state of his mind. Mr. Fellows asked me about the news from Ireland, where the people were then in a state of starvation, and I, answering that it was likely that many of them would actually be starved to death, the baron, quitting his green goose and green peas, turned to me and said, Starve, sir? Why don't they go to the parish? Why, said I, you know, sir, that there are no poor rates in Ireland. Upon this he exclaimed, What? No poor rates in Ireland? Why not? I did not know that. I can't think how that can be and then he rambled on in a childish sort of way. At the end of about half an hour, or it might be more, I shook hands with the poor old baron for the last time, well convinced that I should never see him again, and not less convinced that I had seen his heir. He died in about a year or so afterwards, left to his own family about twenty thousand pounds, and to his ghostly guide, the holy Robert Fellows, all the rest of his immense fortune, which, as I have been told, amounts to more than a quarter of a million of money." Now the public will recollect that while Mr. Fellows was at the Queen's, he was, in the public papers, charged with being an Unitarian, at the same time that he officiated as her chaplain. It is also well known that he never publicly contradicted this. It is besides the general belief at Reigate. However, this we know well, that he is a parson of one sort or the other, and that he is not a Catholic priest. That is enough for me. I see this poor, foolish old man leaving a monstrous mass of money to this little Protestant parson, 
whom he had not even known more, I believe, than about three or four years. When the will was made I cannot say. I know nothing at all about that. I am supposing that all was perfectly fair, that the baron had his senses when he made his will, that he clearly meant to do that which he did. But then I must insist that if he had left the money to a Catholic priest to be by him expended on the endowment of a convent wherein to say masses and to feed and teach the poor, it would have been a more sensible and public-spirited part in the baron, much more beneficial to the town and environs of Reigate, and beyond all measure more honourable to his own memory. Chilworth, Friday evening, 21st October. It has been very fine to-day. Yesterday morning there was snow on Reigate Hill, enough to look white from where we were in the valley. We set off about half-past one o'clock, and came all down the valley, through Buckland, Betchworth, Dorking, Shear, and Albury, to this place. Very few prettier rides in England, and the weather beautifully fine. There are more meeting-houses and churches in the Vale, and I have heard of no less than five people in this Vale, who have gone crazy on account of religion. To-morrow we intend to move on towards the west, to take a look, just a look, at the Hampshire Parsons again. The turnips seem fine, but they cannot be large. All other things are very fine indeed. Everything seems to prognosticate a hard winter. All the country people say that it will be so. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Rural Rides Ride From Chilworth in Surrey to Winchester Thursley, four miles from Godalming, Surrey Sunday evening, 23rd October, 1825 We set out from Chilworth to-day about noon. This is a little hamlet lying under the south side of St. Martha's Hill, and on the other side of that hill, a little to the northwest, is the town of Guildford, which, taken with its environs, I, who have seen so many, many towns, think the prettiest, and taken altogether, the most agreeable and most happy-looking that I ever saw in my life. Here are hill and dell in endless variety. Here are the chalk and the sand, vying with each other in making beautiful scenes. Here is a navigable river and fine meadows. Here are woods and downs. Here is something of everything but fat marshes and their skeleton-making eggs. The vale all the way down to Chilworth from Reigate is very delightful. We did not go to Guildford, nor did we cross the river way to come through Godalming, but bore away to our left and came through the village of Hambleton, going first to Hascombe to show Richard the South Downs from that high land, which looks southward over the wheels of Surrey and Sussex, with all their fine and innumerable oak trees. Those that travel on turnpike roads know nothing of England. From Hascombe to Thursley almost the whole way is across fields or commons, or along narrow lands. Here we see the people without any disguise or affectation. Against a great road things are made for show. Here we see them without any show. And here we gain real knowledge as to their situation. We cross to-day three turnpike roads, that from Guildford to Horsham, that from Godalming to Worthing, I believe, and that from Godalming to Chichester. Thursday, Wednesday, 26th October. The weather has been beautiful ever since last Thursday morning, but there has been a white frost every morning, and the days have been coldish. Here, however, I am quite at home in a room, where there is one of my American fireplaces, bought by my host, of Mr. Judson of Kensington, who has made many a score of families comfortable, instead of sitting shivering in the cold. At the house of the gentleman whose house I am now in, there is a good deal of fuel wood, and here I see in the parlours those fine and cheerful fires that make a great part of the happiness of the Americans. But these fires are to be had only in this sort of fireplace, Ten times the fuel, nay, no quantity, would effect the same object in any other fireplace. It is equally good for coal as for wood, but for pleasure a wood fire is the thing. There is, round about almost every gentleman's or great farmer's house, more wood suffered to rot every year in one shape or another than would make with this fireplace a couple of rooms constantly warm from October to June. Here, peat, turf, sawdust, and wood are burnt in these fireplaces. My present host has three of the fireplaces. Being out a-coursing to-day, I saw a queer-looking building upon one of the thousands of hills that nature has tossed up in endless variety of form round the skirts of the lofty hindhead. This building is, it seems, called a semaphore, or semi-fair, or something of that sort. What this word may have been hatched out of I cannot say, but it means a job, I am sure. To call it an alarm-post would not have been so convenient, for people not endued with Scotch intellect might have wondered why the devil we should have to pay for alarm-posts. I might have thought that, with all our glorious victories, we had brought our hogs to a fine market, if our dread of the enemy were such as to induce us to have alarm posts all over the country. Such unintellectual people might have thought that we had conquered France by the immortal Wellington, to little purpose, if we were still in such fear as to build alarm posts. 
and they might in addition have observed that for many hundred of years England stood in need of neither signal posts nor standing army of mercenaries, but relied safely on the courage and public spirit of the people themselves. By calling the thing by an outlandish name, these reflections amongst the unintellectual are obviated. Alarm post would be a nasty name, and it would puzzle people exceedingly. When they saw one of these at a place like Ash, a little village on the north side of the chalk ridge called the Hog's Back, going from Guildford to Farnham, what can this be for? Why are these expensive things put up all over the country? Respecting the movements of whom is wanted this alarm system? Will no member ask this in Parliament? Not one, not a man, and yet it is a thing to ask about. Ah, it is in vain, thing, that you thus are making your preparations, in vain that you are setting your trammels. The debt, the blessed debt, that best ally of the people, will break them all, will snap them as the hornet does the cobweb and even these very semaphores contribute towards the force of that ever-blessed debt. Curious to see how things work. The glorious revolution, which was made for the avowed purpose of maintaining the Protestant ascendancy, and which was followed by such terrible persecution of the Catholics, that glorious affair which set aside a race of kings because they were Catholics, served as the precedent for the American Revolution also called glorious, and this second revolution compelled the successors of the makers of the first to begin to cease their persecutions of the Catholics. Then again, the debt was made to raise and keep armies on foot to prevent reform of Parliament, because, as it was feared by the aristocracy, reform would have humbled them. And this debt, created for this purpose, is fast sweeping the aristocracy out of their estates, as a clown with his foot kicks field mice out of their nests. There was a hope that the debt could have been reduced by stealth, as it were, that the aristocracy could have been saved in this way. That hope now no longer exists. In all likelihood, the funds will keep going down. What is to prevent this if the interest of exchequer bills be raised, as the broadsheet tells us it is to be? What, the funds fall in time of peace, and the French funds not fall in time of peace? However, it will all happen just as it ought to happen. Even the next session of Parliament will bring out matters of some interest. The thing is now working in the surest possible way. The great business of life in the country appertains in some way or other to the game, and especially at this time of the year. If it were not for the game, a country life would be like an everlasting honeymoon, which would, in about half a century, put an end to the human race. In towns or large villages, people make a shift to find the means of rubbing the rust off from each other by a vast variety of sources of contest. A couple of wives meeting in the street and giving each other a wry look, or a look not quite civil enough, will, if the parties be hard pushed for a ground of contention, do pretty well. But in the country there is, alas, no such resource. Here are no walls for people to take of each other. Here they are so placed as to prevent the possibility of such lucky local contact. Here is more than room of every sort, elbow, leg, horse or carriage, for them all. Even at church, most of the people being in the meeting-houses, the pews are surprisingly too large. Here, therefore, where all circumstances seem calculated to cause never-ceasing concord with its accompanying dullness, there would be no relief at all were it not for the game. This happily supplies the place of all other sources of alternate dispute and reconciliation, it keeps all in life and motion, from the lord down to the hedger. When I see two men, whether in a market-room, by the wayside, in a parlour, in a churchyard, or even in the church itself, engaged in manifestly deep and most momentous discourse, I will, if it be any time between September and February, bet ten to one that it is in some way or other about the game. The wives and daughters hear so much of it, that they inevitably get engaged in the disputes, and thus all are kept in a state of vivid animation." I should like very much to be able to take a spot, a circle of twelve miles in diameter, and take an exact account of all the time spent by each individual, above the age of ten, that is the age they begin at, in talking during the game season of one year about the game and about sporting exploits. I verily believe that it would amount, upon an average, to six times as much as all the other talk put together, and as to the anger, the satisfaction, the scolding, the commendation, the chagrin, the exultation, the envy, the emulation, where are there any of these in the country unconnected with the game? There is, however, an important distinction to be made between hunters, including coursers, and shooters. The latter are, as far as relates to their exploits, a disagreeable class, compared with the former, and the reason of this is, they are doing so almost wholly their own, while in the case of the others, the achievements are the property of the dogs. Nobody likes to hear another talk much in praise of his own acts, unless those acts have a manifest tendency to produce some good to the hearer and shooters do talk much of their own exploits, and those exploits rather tend to humiliate the hearer. Then a great shooter will, nine times out of ten, go so far as almost to lie a little, 
and though people do not tell him of it, they do not like him the better for it, and he but too frequently discovers that they do not believe him. Whereas hunters are mere followers of the dogs, as mere spectators. Their praises, if any are called for, are bestowed on the greyhounds, the hounds, the fox, the hare, or the horses. There is a little rivalship in the riding, or in the behaviour of the horses, but this has so little to do with the personal merit of the sportsman, that it never produces a want of good fellowship in the evening of the day. A shooter who has been missing all day must have an uncommon share of good sense, not to feel mortified while the slaughterers are relating the adventures of that day, and this is what cannot exist in the case of the hunters. Bring me into a room with a dozen men in it, who have been sporting all day, or rather let me be in an adjoining room, where I can hear the sound of their voices without being able to distinguish the words, and I will bet ten to one that I tell whether they be hunters or shooters. I was once acquainted with a famous shooter whose name was William Ewing. He was a barrister of Philadelphia, but became far more renowned by his gun than by his law cases. We spent scores of days together a shooting, and were extremely well matched, I having excellent dogs and caring little about my reputation as a shot, his dogs being good for nothing, and he caring more about his reputation as a shot than as a lawyer. The fact which I am going to relate respecting this gentleman ought to be a warning to young men how they become enamoured of this species of vanity. We had gone about ten miles from our home to shoot where partridges were said to be very plentiful. We found them so. In the course of a November day he had just before dark shot and sent to the farmhouse, or kept in his bag, ninety-nine partridges. He made some few double shots, and he might have a miss or two, for he sometimes shot when out of my sight, on account of the woods. However, he said that he killed at every shot, and as he had counted the birds when we went to dinner at the farmhouse, and when he cleaned his gun, he just before sunset knew that he had killed ninety-nine partridges, every one upon the wing, and a great part of them in woods very thickly set with largish trees. It was a grand achievement, but unfortunately he wanted to make it a hundred. The sun was setting, and in that country darkness comes almost at once. It is more like the going out of a candle than that of a fire, and I wanted to be off, as we had a very bad road to go, and as he, being under strict petticoat government, to which he most loyally and dutifully submitted, was compelled to get home that night taking me with him, the vehicle, horse and gig, being mine. I therefore pressed him to come away, and moved on myself towards the house, that of old John Brown in Bucks County, grandfather of that General Brown, who gave some of our whiskered heroes such a rough handling last war, which was waged for the purpose of deposing James Madison, at which house I would have stayed all night, but from which I was compelled to go by that watchful government under which he had the good fortune to live. Therefore I was in haste to be off. No, he would kill the hundredth bird. In vain did I talk of the bad road, and its many dangers for want of moon. The poor partridges which we had scattered about were calling all around us, and just at this moment up got one under his feet, in a field in which the wheat was three or four inches high. He shot and missed. That's it, said he, running as if to pick up the bird. What, said I? You don't think he killed, do you? Why, there's the bird now, not only alive, but calling in that wood, which was at about a hundred yards' distance. He, in that form of words usually employed in such cases, asserted that he shot the bird and saw it fall, and I, in much about the same form of words, asserted that he had missed, and that I, with my own eyes, saw the bird fly into the wood. This was too much. To miss once out of a hundred times, to lose such a chance of immortality. He was a good-humoured man. I liked him very much, and I could not help feeling for him when he said, "'Well, sir, I kill the bird, and if you choose to go away and take your dog away, so as to prevent me from finding it, you must do it. The dog is yours, to be sure.' "'The dog,' said I, in a very mild tone, "'why, Ewing, there is the spot. And could we not see it upon this smooth green surface, if it were there?' However, he began to look about, and I called the dog, and affected to join him in the search. Pity for his weakness got the better of my dread of the bad road.' After walking backward and forward many times upon about twenty yards square with our eyes to the ground, looking for what both of us knew was not there, I had passed him, he going one way and I the other, and I happened to be turning round just after I had passed him when I saw him putting his hand behind him, take a partridge out of his bag and let it fall upon the ground. I felt no temptation to detect him, but turned away my head and kept looking about. Presently he, having returned to the spot where the bird was, called out to me in a most triumphant tone, "'Here! Here! Come here!' I went up to him, and he, pointing with his finger down to the bird, and looking hard in my face at the same time, said, "'There, Cobbett, I hope that will be a warning to you never to be obstinate again.' "'Well,' said I, "'come along.' And away we went as merry as larks. When we got to Brown's, he told them the story, triumphed over me most clamorously, and though he often repeated the story to my face, I never had the heart to let him know that I knew of the imposition, which puerile vanity had induced so sensible and honourable a man to be mean enough to practice.' A professed shot is almost always a very disagreeable brother sportsman. 
he must in the first place have a head rather of the emptiest to pride himself upon so poor a talent. Then he is always out of temper if the game fail, or if he miss it. He never participates in that great delight which all sensible men enjoy, at beholding the beautiful action, the docility, the zeal, the wonderful sagacity of the pointer and the setter. He is always thinking about himself, always anxious to surpass his companions. I remember that once Ewing and I had lost our dog. We were in a wood, and the dog had gone out, and found a covey in a wheat stubble joining the wood. We had been whistling and calling him for perhaps half an hour or more. When we came out of the wood we saw him pointing with one foot up, and soon after he, keeping his foot and body unmoved, gently turned round his head towards the spot where he heard us, as if to bid us come on, and when he saw that we saw him turned his head back again. I was so delighted that I stopped to look with admiration. Ewing, astonished at my want of alacrity, pushed on, shot one of the partridges, and thought no more about the conduct of the dog than if the sagacious creature had had nothing at all to do with the matter. When I left America in 1800, I gave this dog to Lord Henry Stuart, who was, when he came home a year or two afterwards, about to bring him to astonish the sportsmen even in England. But those of Pennsylvania were resolved not to part with him, and therefore they stole him the night before his lordship came away. Lord Henry had plenty of pointers after his return, and he saw hundreds, but always declared that he never saw anything approaching in excellence this American dog. For the information of sportsmen I ought to say that this was a small-headed and sharp-nosed pointer, hair as fine as that of a greyhound, little and short ears, very light in the body, very long-legged, and swift as a good lurcher. I had him a puppy, and he never had any breaking. But he pointed staunchly at once, and I am of opinion that this sort is, in all respects, better than the heavy breed. Mr. Thornton, I beg his pardon, I believe he is now a knight of some sort, who was, and perhaps still is, our envoy in Portugal, at the time here referred to, was a sort of partner with Lord Henry in this famous dog, and gratitude, to the memory of the dog, I mean, will, I am sure, or at least I hope so, make him bear witness to the truth of my character of him, and if one could hear an ambassador speak out, I think that Mr. Thornton would acknowledge that his calling has brought him in pretty close contact with many a man who was possessed of most tremendous political power, without possessing half the sagacity, half the understanding of this dog, and without being a thousandth part so faithful to his trust. I am quite satisfied that there are as many sorts of men as there are of dogs. Swift was a man, and so is Walter the base. But is the sort the same? It cannot be education alone that makes the amazing difference that we see. Besides, we see men of the very same rank and riches in education, differing as widely as the pointer does from the pug. The name man is common to all the sorts, and hence arises very great mischief. What confusion must there be in rural affairs, if there were no names whereby to distinguish hounds, greyhounds, pointers, spaniels, terriers, and sheep-dogs from each other? And what pretty work if, without regard to the sorts of dogs, men were to attempt to employ them? Yet this is done in the case of men. A man is always a man, and without the least regard as to the sort, they are promiscuously placed in all kinds of situations. Now if Mr. Brougham, Doctors Birkbeck, McCullough and Black, and that profound personage, Lord John Russell, will, in their forthcoming London University, teach us how to divide men into sorts, instead of teaching us to augment the capital of the nation, by making paper money, they will render us a real service. That will be a philosophy worth attending to. What would be said of the squire who should take a foxhound out to find partridges for him to shoot at? Yet would this be more absurd than to set a man to law-making, who was manifestly formed for the express purpose of sweeping the streets or digging out sewers? Farnham, Surrey, Thursday, October 27th. We came over the heath from Thursley this morning, on our way to Winchester. Mr. Wyndham's foxhounds are coming to Thursley on Saturday. More than three-fourths of all the interesting talk in that neighbourhood for some days past has been about this anxiously looked-for event. I have seen no man or boy who did not talk about it. There had been a false report about it, the hounds did not come, and the anger of the disappointed people was very great. At last, however, the authentic intelligence came, and I left them all as happy as if all were young and all just going to be married. An abatement of my pleasure, however, on this joyous occasion was, that I brought away with me one who was as eager as the best of them. Richard, though now only eleven years and six months old, had, it seems, one fox-hunt in Herefordshire last winter, and he actually has begun to talk rather contemptuously of hare-hunting. To show me that he is in no danger, he has been leaping his horse over banks and ditches by the roadside, all our way across the country and from Reigate, and he joined with such glee in talking of the expected arrival of the fox-hounds, that I felt some little pain at bringing him away. My engagement at Winchester is for Saturday, but if it had not been so, the deep and hidden ruts in the heath, in a wood in the midst of which the hounds are sure to find, and the immense concourse of horsemen that is sure to be assembled, would have made me bring him away. Upon the high, hard, and open countries, I should not be afraid of for him, 
but here the danger would have been greater than it would have been right for me to suffer him to run. We came hither by the way of Waverley Abbey and Moor Park. On the commons I showed Richard some of my old hunting scenes, when I was of his age or younger, reminding him that I was obliged to hunt on foot. We got leave to go and see the grounds at Waverley, where all the old monks' garden walls are totally gone, and where the spot has become a sort of lawn. I showed him the spot where the strawberry garden was, and where I, when sent to gather au bois, used to eat every remarkably fine one, instead of letting it go to be eaten by Sir Robert Rich. I showed him a tree close by the ruins of the abbey, from a limb of which I once fell into the river, in an attempt to take the nest of a crow, which had artfully placed it upon a branch so far from the trunk as not to be able to bear the weight of a boy eight years old. I showed him an old elm tree which was hollow even then, into which I, when a very little boy, once saw a cat go, that was as big as a middle-sized spaniel dog, for relating which I got a great scolding, for standing to which I at last got a beating, but stand to which I still did. I have since many times repeated it, and I would take my oath of it to this day. When in New Brunswick I saw the great wild grey cat, which is there called a Lucifi, and it seemed to me to be just such a cat as I had seen at Waverley. I found the ruins not very greatly diminished, but it is strange how small the mansion and ground and everything but the trees appeared to me. They were all great to my mind when I saw them last, and that early impression had remained whenever I had talked or thought of the spot, so that when I came to see them again, after seeing the sea and so many other immense things, it seemed as if they had all been made small. This was not the case with regard to the trees, which are nearly as big here as they are anywhere else, and the old cat-elm, for instance, which Richard measured with his whip, is about sixteen or seventeen feet round. From Waverley we went to Moor Park, once the seat of Sir William Temple, and when I was a very little boy, the seat of a lady or a Mrs. Temple. Here I showed Richard Mother Ludlam's hole. But alas, it is not the enchanting place that I knew it, nor that which Gross describes in his antiquities. The semicircular paling is gone, the basins to catch the never-ceasing little stream are gone, the iron cups fastened by chains for people to drink out of are gone, the pavement all broken to pieces, the seats for people to sit on on both sides of the cave torn up and gone, the stream that ran down a clean paved channel now making a dirty gutter, and the ground opposite which was a grove chiefly of laurels, intersected by closely mowed grass walks, now become a poor ragged-looking alder coppice. Near the mansion I showed Richard the hill upon which Dean Swift tells us he used to run for exercise, while he was pursuing his studies here, and I would have showed him the garden seat, under which Sir William Temple's heart was buried, agreeably to his will, but the seat was gone, also the wall at the back of it, and the exquisitely beautiful little lawn in which the seat stood was turned into a parcel of diverse-shaped cockney clumps, planted according to the strictest rules of artificial and refined vulgarity. At Waverley, Mr. Thompson, a merchant of some sort, has succeeded after the monks, the Orby Hunters, and Sir Robert Rich. At Moor Park, a Mr. Lang, a West Indian planter or merchant, has succeeded the Temples. And at the Castle of Farnham, which you see from Moor Park, Bishop Prettyman Tomlin has, at last, after perfectly regular and due gradations, succeeded William of Wickham. In coming up from Moor Park to Farnham Town, I stopped opposite the door of a little old house, where there appeared to be a great parcel of children. There, Dick, said I, when I was just such a little creature as that, whom you see in the doorway, I lived in this very house with my grandmother Cobbett. He pulled up his horse and looked very hard at it, but said nothing, and on we came. Winchester, Sunday noon, October 30th. We came away from Farnham about noon on Friday, promising Bishop Prettyman to notice him and his way of living more fully on our return. At Alton we got some bread and cheese at a friend's, and then came to Alresford by Medstead, in order to have fine turf to ride on, and to see on this lofty land that which is perhaps the finest beech wood in all England. These high-down countries are not garden plats, like Kent, but they have from my first seeing them, when I was about ten, always been my delight. Large sweeping downs, and deep dells here and there, with villages amongst lofty trees, are my great delight. When we got to Alresford it was nearly dark, and not being able to find a room to our liking, we resolved to go, though in the dark, to Easton, a village about six miles from Alresford, down by the side of the Hitchin River. Coming from Easton yesterday, I learned that Sir Charles Ogle, the eldest son and successor of Sir Chaloner Ogle, had sold to some general his mansion and estate at Martyrs Worthy, a village on the north side of the Hitchin, just opposite Easton. The Ogles had been here for a couple of centuries, perhaps. They are gone off now, for good and all, as the country people call it. Well, 
what I have to say to Sir Charles Ogle upon this occasion is this. It was you who moved at the county meeting, in 1817, that address to the regent, which you brought ready engrossed upon parchment, which Fleming the sheriff declared to have been carried, though a word of it never was heard by the meeting, which address applauded the power of imprisonment bill, just then passed, and the like of which address you will not in all human probability ever again move in Hampshire, and I hope nowhere else. So you see, Sir Charles, there is one consolation at any rate. I learned, too, that Greem, a famously loyal squire and justice, whose son was, a few years ago, made a distributor of stamps in this county, was become so modest as to exchange his big and ancient mansion at Cheriton, or somewhere there, for a very moderate-sized house in the town of Alresford. I saw his household goods advertised in the Hampshire newspaper a little while ago, to be sold by public auction. I rubbed my eyes, or rather my spectacles, and looked again and again, for I remembered the loyal squire, and I with singular satisfaction record this change in his scale of existence, which has, no doubt, proceeded solely from that prevalence of mind over matter, which the Scotch philosophers have taken such pains to inculcate, and which makes him flee from greatness as from that which diminishes the quantity of intellectual enjoyment. And so now he, wandering man can want the larger pile, exults and owns his cottage with a smile. And they really tell me that his present house is not much bigger than that of my dear good old grandmother Cobbett. But, and it may not be wholly useless for the squire to know it, she never burnt candles, but rushes dipped in grease, as I have described them in my cottage economy. And this was one of the means that she made use of in order to secure a bit of good bacon and good bread to eat, and that made her never give me potatoes cold or hot. No bad hint for the squire, father of the distributor of stamps. Good bacon is a very nice thing, I can assure him, and if the quantity be small, it is all the sweeter, provided, however, it be not too small. This squire used to be a great friend of old George Rose, but his patron's taste was different from his. George preferred a big house to a little one, and George began with a little one, and ended with a big one. Just by Alresford there was another old friend and supporter of old George Rose, Squire Rawlinson, whom I remember a very great squire in this county. He is now a police squire in London, and is one of those guardians of the wen, respecting whose proceedings we read eternal columns in the broadsheet. This being Sunday, I heard about seven o'clock in the morning a sort of a jangling, made by a bell or two in the cathedral. We were getting ready to be off to cross the country to Berkeley, which lies under the lofty hills at Highclere, about twenty-two miles from this city. But hearing the bells of the cathedral, I took Richard to show him that ancient and most magnificent pile, and particularly to show him the tomb of that famous bishop of Winchester, William of Wickham, who was the chancellor and the minister of the great and glorious king, Edward the Third, who sprang from poor parents in the little village of Wickham, three miles from Botley, and who, amongst other great and most munificent deeds, founded the famous college or school of Winchester, and also one of the colleges at Oxford. I told Richard about this as we went from the inn down to the cathedral, and when I showed him the tomb where the bishop lies on his back, in his Catholic robes, with his mitre on his head, his shepherd's crook by his side, with little children at his feet, their hands put together in a praying attitude, he looked with a degree of inquisitive earnestness that pleased me very much. I took him as far as I could about the cathedral. The service was now begun. There is a dean and God knows how many prebends belonging to this immensely rich bishopric and chapter, and there were at this service two or three men and five or six boys in white surplices, with a congregation of fifteen women and four men. Gracious God! If William of Wickham could at that moment have been raised from his tomb, if St. Swithin, whose name the cathedral bears, or Alfred the Great, to whom St. Swithin was tutor, if either of these could have come, and had been told that that was now what was carried on by men, who talked of the damnable errors of those who founded that very church. But it beggars one's feelings, to attempt to find words whereby to express them upon such a subject and such an occasion. How, then, am I to describe what I felt, when I yesterday saw in Hyde Meadow a county bridewell, standing on the very spot where stood the abbey which was founded and endowed by Alfred, which contained the bones of that maker of the English name, and also those of the learned monk St. Grimbald, whom Alfred brought to England to begin the teaching at Oxford. After we came out of the cathedral, Richard said, Why, Papa, nobody can build such places now, can they? No, my dear, said I. That building was made when there were no poor wretches in England called paupers, when there were no poor rates, when every labouring man was clothed in good woollen cloth, and when all had a plenty of meat and bread and beer. This talk lasted us to the inn, where, just as we were going to set off, it most curiously happened that a parcel which had come from Kensington by the night coach was put into my hands by the landlord containing, amongst other things, 
a pamphlet sent to me from Rome, being an Italian translation of number one of the Protestant Reformation. I will here insert the title for the satisfaction of Dr. Black, who, some time ago, expressed his utter astonishment that such a work should be published in the nineteenth century. Why, Doctor, did you want me to stop till the twentieth century? That would have been a little too long, Doctor. Storia della Riforma Protestante in Inghilterra ed in Irlanda, la quale dimostra come un tal avvenimento ha impoverito e degradato il grosso del popolo in quei paesi in una serie di lettere indirizzate a tutti i sensati e giusti inglesi da Guglielmo Cobbett e dal inglese recate in italiano da Domenico Gregori, Roma, 1825, presso Francesco Borlie, con approvazione. There, Dr. Black, write you a book that shall be translated into any foreign language, and when you have done that, you may again call mine pig's meat. End of chapter 17「or I had, resolved not to breakfast at Winchester yesterday, and yet we were detained till nearly noon. But at last off we came, fasting. The turnpike road from Winchester to this place comes through a village called Sutton Scotney, and then through Whitchurch, which lies on the Andover and London Road through Basingstoke. We did not take the cross turnpike till we came to Whitchurch. We went to Kingsworthy, that is about two miles on the road from Winchester to London, and then, turning short to our left, came up upon the downs to the north of Winchester Racecourse. Here, looking back at the city, and at the fine valley above and below it, and at the many smaller valleys that run down from the high ridges into that great and fertile valley, I could not help admiring the taste of the ancient kings who made this city, which once covered all the hill round about, and which contained ninety-two churches and chapels, a chief place of their residence. There are not many finer spots in England, and if I were to take in a circle of eight or ten miles of semi-diameter, I should say that I believe there is not one so fine. Here are hill, dell, water, meadows, woods, cornfields, downs, and all of them very fine and very beautifully disposed. This country does not present to us that sort of beauties, which we see about Guildford and Godalming, and round the skirts of Hindhead and Blackdown where the ground lies in the form that the surface water in a boiling copper would be in, if you could, by word of command, make it be still, the variously shaped bubbles all sticking up, and really to look at the face of the earth, who can help imagining that some such process has produced its present form? Leaving this matter to be solved by those who laugh at mysteries, I repeat that the country around Winchester does not present to us beauties of this sort, but of a sort which I like a great deal better. Arthur Young calls the vale between Farnham and Alton, the finest ten miles in England. Here is a river with fine meadows on each side of it, and with rising grounds on each outside of the meadows, those grounds having some hop gardens, and some pretty woods. But though I was born in this vale, I must confess that the ten miles between Maidstone and Tunbridge, which the Kentish folks call the Garden of Eden, is a great deal finer. For here, with a river three times as big, and a vale three times as broad, there are, on rising ground six times as broad, not only hop-gardens and beautiful woods, but immense orchards of apples, pears, plums, cherries, and filberts, and these in many cases, with gooseberries and currants and raspberries beneath, and, all taken together, the vale is really worthy of the appellation which it bears. But even this spot, which I believe to be the very finest, as to fertility and diminutive beauty, in this whole world, I, for my part, do not like so well. Nay, as a spot to live on, I think nothing at all of it, compared with a country where high downs prevail, with here and there a large wood on the top or the side of a hill, and where you see in the deep dells, here and there a farmhouse, 
and here and there a village, the building sheltered by a group of lofty trees. This is my taste, and here, in the north of Hampshire, it has its full gratification. I like to look at the winding side of a great down, with two or three numerous flocks of sheep on it, belonging to different farms, and to see lower down the foals in the fields, ready to receive them for the night. We had, when we got upon the downs, after leaving Winchester, this sort of country all the way to Whitchurch. Our point of destination was this village of Berkeley, which lies close under the north side of the lofty hill at Highclere, which is called Beacon Hill, and on the top of which there are still the marks of a Roman encampment. We saw this hill as soon as we got on Winchester Downs, and without any regard to roads we steered for it, as sailors do for a landmark. Of these thirteen miles, from Winchester to Whitchurch, we rode about eight or nine upon the greensward, or over fields equally smooth, and here is one great pleasure of living in countries of this sort. No sloughs, no ditches, no nasty dirty lanes, and the hedges, where there are any, are more for boundary marks than for fences. Fine for hunting and coursing, no impediments, no gates to open, nothing to impede the dogs, the horses, or the view. The water is not seen running, but the great bed of chalk holds it, and the sun draws it up for the benefit of the grass and the corn. And whatever inconvenience is experienced from the necessity of deep wells, and of driving sheep and cattle far to water, is amply made up for by the goodness of the water, and by the complete absence of floods, of drains, of ditches, and of water furrows. As things now are, however, these countries have one great drawback. The poor day labourers suffer from the want of fuel, and they have nothing but their bare pay. For these reasons they are greatly worse off than those of the woodland countries, and it is really surprising what a difference there is between the faces that you see here and the round red faces that you see in the wheels and the forests, particularly in Sussex, where the labourers will have a meat pudding of some sort or other, and where they will have a fire to sit by in the winter. After steering for some time, we came down to a very fine farmhouse, which we stopped a little to admire, and I asked Richard whether that was not a place to be happy in. The village, which we found to be Stoke Charity, was about a mile lower down this little vale. Before we got to it we overtook the owner of the farm, who knew me, though I did not know him, but when I found it was Mr. Hinton Bailey, of whom and whose farm I had heard so much, I was not at all surprised at the fineness of what I had just seen. I told him that the word charity, making, as it did, part of the name of this place, had nearly inspired me with boldness enough to go to the farmhouse in the ancient style, and ask for something to eat, for that we had not yet breakfasted. He asked us to go back, but at Berkeley we were resolved to dine. After, however, crossing the village, and beginning again to ascend the downs, we came to a labourer's, once a farmhouse, where I asked the man whether he had any bread and cheese, and was not a little pleased to hear him say, Yes. Then I asked him to give us a bit, protesting that we had not yet broken our fast. He answered in the affirmative at once, though I did not talk of payment. His wife brought out the cut loaf and a piece of Wiltshire cheese, and I took them in hand, gave Richard a good hunch, and took another for myself. I verily believe that all the pleasure of eating, enjoyed by all the feeders in London in a whole year, does not equal that which we enjoyed in gnawing this bread and cheese, as we rode over this coal down, whip and bridle reins in one hand, and the hunch in the other. Richard, who was purse-bearer, gave the woman, by my direction, about enough to buy two quartern loaves, for she told me that they had to buy their bread at the mill, not being able to bake themselves for want of fuel, and this, as I said before, is one of the drawbacks in this sort of country. I wish every one of these people had an American fireplace. Here they might then, even in these bare countries, have comfortable warmth. Rubbish of any sort would by this means give them warmth. I am now at six o'clock in the morning sitting in a room, where one of these fireplaces, with very light turf in it, gives as good and steady a warmth as it is possible to feel, and which room has too been cured of smoking by this fireplace. Before we got this supply of bread and cheese, we, though in ordinary times a couple of singularly jovial companions, and seldom going a hundred yards, except going very fast, without one or the other speaking, began to grow dull or rather glum. The way seemed long, and when I had to speak in answer to Richard, the speaking was as brief as might be. Unfortunately, just at this critical period, one of the loops that held the straps of Richard's little portmanteau broke, and it became necessary, just before we overtook Mr. Bailey, for me to fasten the portmanteau on before me, upon my saddle. This, which was not the work of more than five minutes, would, had I had a breakfast, been nothing at all, and indeed matter of laughter. But now it was something. It was his fault for capering and jerking about so. 
I jumped off, saying, Here, I'll carry it myself. And then I began to take off the remaining strap, pulling with great violence and in great haste. Just at this time my eyes met his, in which I saw great surprise. And feeling the just rebuke, feeling heartily ashamed of myself, I instantly changed my tone and manner, cast the blame upon the saddler, and talked of the effectual means which we would take to prevent the like in future. Now, if such was the effect produced upon me by the want of food for only two or three hours, me, who had dined well the day before, and eaten toast and butter the overnight, if the missing of only one breakfast, and that too from my own whim, while I had money in my pocket to get one at any public house, and while I could get one only for asking at any farmhouse, if the not having breakfasted could, and under such circumstances, make me what you may call cross to a child like this, whom I must necessarily love so much, and to whom I never speak but in the very kindest manner, if this mere absence of a breakfast could thus put me out of temper, how great are the allowances that we ought to make for the poor creatures who, in this once happy and now miserable country, are doomed to lead a life of constant labour and of half-starvation. I suppose that, as we rode away from the cottage, we gnawed up between us a pound of bread and a quarter of a pound of cheese. Here was about five pence worth at present prices. Even this, which was only a mere snap, a mere stay-stomach for us, would for us too come to three shillings a week all but a penny. How then, gracious God, is a labouring man, his wife, and perhaps four or five small children, to exist upon eight shillings or nine shillings a week? Aye, and to find house-rent, clothing, bedding, and fuel out of it. Richard and I ate here at this snap more and much more than the average of labourers their wives and children have to eat in a whole day, and that the labourer has to work on, too. When we got here to Berkeley, we were again as hungry as hunters. What, then, must be the life of these poor creatures? But is not the state of the country, is not the hellishness of the system, all depicted in this one disgraceful and damning fact, that the magistrates, who settle on what the labouring poor ought to have to live on, allow them less than is allowed to felons in the jails, and allow them nothing for clothing and fuel and house-rent. And yet while this is notoriously the case, while the main body of the working class in England are fed and clad and even lodged worse than felons, and are daily becoming even worse and worse off, the King is advised to tell the Parliament and the world that we are in a state of unexampled prosperity, and that this prosperity must be permanent, because all the great interests are prospering. The working people are not, then, a great interest. They will be found to be one by and by. What is to be the end of this? What can be the end of it but dreadful convulsion? What other can be produced by a system, which allows the felon better food, better clothing, and better lodging, than the honest labourer? I see that there has been a grand humanity meeting in Norfolk, to assure the Parliament that these humanity people will back it, in any measures that it may adopt for freeing the Negroes. Mr. Buxton figured here, also Lord Suffield, who appear to have been the two principal actors, or showers off. This same Mr. Buxton opposed the bill intended to relieve the poor in England, by breaking a little into the brewer's monopoly. And as to Lord Suffield, if he really wished to free slaves, let him go to Wickham in this county, where he will see some drawing, like horses, gravel to repair the roads for the stock-jobbers and dead-weight, and the seat-dealers to ride smoothly on. If he go down a little further, he will see convicts at precisely the same work, harnessed in just the same way. But the convicts he will find hale and ruddy-cheeked, in dresses sufficiently warm, and bawling and singing, while he will find the labourers, thin, ragged, shivering, dejected mortals, such as never were seen in any other country upon earth. There is not a negro in the West Indies, who has not more to eat in a day than the average of English labourers have to eat in a week, and of better food, too. Colonel Woodhouse, and a man of the name of Hoseason, whence came he, who opposed this humanity scheme, talked of the sums necessary to pay the owners of the slaves. They took special care not to tell the humanity men to look at home for slaves to free. No, no, that would have applied to themselves, as well as to Lord Suffield and Humanity Buxton. If it were worth while to reason with these people, one might ask them whether they do not think that another war is likely to relieve them of all these cares, simply by making the colonies transfer their allegiance, or assert their independence. But to reason with them is useless. If they can busy themselves with compassion for the Negroes, while they uphold the system that makes the labourers of England more wretched, and beyond all measure more wretched, than any negro slaves are, or ever were, or ever can be, they are unworthy of anything but our contempt.
but the education canters are the most curious fellows of all they have seen education as they call it and crimes go on increasing together till the jails though six times their former dimensions will hardly suffice and yet the canting creatures still cry that crimes arise from want of what they call education they see the felon better fed and better clad than the honest labourer they see this and yet they continually cry that the crimes arise from a want of education what can be the cause of this perverseness it is not perverseness it is roguery corruption and tyranny the tyrant the unfeeling tyrant squeezes the labourers for gain's sake and the corrupt politician and literary or tub rogue find an excuse for him by pretending that it is not want of food and clothing but want of education that makes the poor starving wretches thieves and robbers if the press if only the press were to do its duty or but a tenth part of its duty this hellish system could not go on but it favours the system by ascribing the misery to wrong causes the causes are these the tax-gatherer oppresses the landlord the landlord the farmer and the farmer the labourer here it falls at last and this class is made so miserable that a felon's life is better than that of a labourer dost thou want any other cause to produce crimes but on these causes so clear to the eye of reason so plain from experience the press scarcely ever says a single word while it keeps bothering our brains about education and morality and about ignorance and immorality leading to felonies to be sure immorality leads to felonies who does not know that but who is to expect morality in a half-starved man who is whipped if he do not work though he has not for his whole day's food so much as i and my little boy snapped up in six or seven minutes upon stoke charity down ay but if the press were to ascribe the increase of crimes to the true causes it must go further back it must go to the cause of the taxes it must go to the debt the dead weight the thundering standing army the enormous sinecures pensions and grants and this would suit but a very small part of a press which lives and thrives principally by one or the other of these as with the press so is it with mr broom and all such politicians they stop short or rather they begin in the middle they attempt to prevent the evils of the deadly ivy by cropping off or rather bruising a little a few of its leaves they do not assail even its branches while they appear to look upon the trunk as something too sacred even to be looked at with vulgar eyes is not the injury recently done to about forty thousand poor families in and near plymouth by the small note bill a thing that mr broom ought to think about before he thinks anything more about educating those poor families yet will he when he again meets the ministers say a word about this monstrous evil i am afraid that no member will say a word about it but i am rather more than afraid that he will not and why because if he reproach the ministers with this crying cruelty they will ask him first how this is to be prevented without a repeal of the small note bill by which peel's bill was partly repealed then they will ask him how the prices are to be kept up without the small notes and they will say does the honourable and learned gentleman wish to see wheat at four shillings a bushel again b no looking at mr weston and daddy coke no 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 upon my honour no minister does the honourable and learned gentleman wish to see cobbett again at county meetings and to see petitions again coming from those meetings calling for a reduction of the interest of the b no 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 upon my soul no minister does the honourable and learned gentleman wish to see that equitable adjustment which cobbett has a thousand times declared can never take place without an application to new purposes of that great mass of public property commonly called church property b almost bursting with rage how dare the honourable gentleman to suppose me capable of such a thought minister we suppose nothing we only ask the question and we ask it because to put an end to the small notes would inevitably produce all these things and it is impossible to have small notes to the extent necessary to keep up prices without having now and then breaking banks banks cannot break without producing misery you must have the consequence if you will have the cause the honourable and learned gentleman wants the feast without the reckoning in short is the honourable and learned gentleman for putting an end to public credit b no 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 minister then would it not be better for the honourable and learned gentleman to hold his tongue all men of sense and sincerity will at once answer this last question in the affirmative they will all say that this is not opposition to the ministers the ministers do not wish to see forty thousand families nor any families at all who give them no real annoyance reduced to misery 
they do not wish to cripple their own taxpayers very far from it if they could carry on the debt and dead weight and place and pension and barrack system without reducing any quiet people to misery they would like it exceedingly but they do wish to carry on that system and he does not oppose them who does not endeavour to put an end to the system this is done by nobody in parliament and therefore there is in fact no opposition and this is felt by the whole nation and this is the reason why the people now take so little interest in what is said and done in parliament compared to that which they formerly took this is the reason why there is no man or men whom the people seem to care at all about a great portion of the people now clearly understand the nature and effects of the system they are not now to be deceived by speeches and professions if pitt and fox had now to start there would be no pittites and foxites those happy days of political humbug are gone for ever the gentlemen opposite are opposite only as to mere local position they sit on the opposite side of the house that's all in every other respect they are like parson and clerk or perhaps rather more like the rooks and jackdaws one core and the other chatter but both have the same object in view both are in pursuit of the same sort of diet one set is to be sure in place and the other out but though the rooks keep the jackdaws on the inferior branches these latter would be as clamorous as the rooks themselves against felling the tree and just as clamorous would the gentleman opposite be against any one who should propose to put down the system itself and yet unless you do that things must go on in the present way and felons must be better fed than honest labourers and starvation and thieving and robbing and jail-building and transporting and hanging and penal laws must go on increasing as they have gone on from the day of the establishment of the debt to the present hour apropos of penal laws dr black of the morning chronicle is now filling whole columns with very just remarks on the new and terrible law which makes the taking of an apple felony but he says not a word about the silence of sir jammy the humane code softener upon this subject the humanity and liberality of the parliament have relieved men addicted to fraud and to certain other crimes from the disgrace of the pillory and they have since castlereagh cut his own throat relieved self-slayers from the disgrace of the cross-road burial but the same parliament amidst all the workings of this rare humanity and liberality have made it felony to take an apple off a tree which last year was a trivial trespass and was formerly no offence at all however even this is necessary as long as this bank-note system continue in its present way and all complaints about severity of laws levelled at the poor are useless and foolish and these complaints are even base in those who do their best to uphold a system which has brought the honest labourer to be fed worse than the felon what short of such laws can prevent starving men from coming to take away the dinners of those who have plenty education despicable cant and nonsense what education what moral precepts can quiet the gnawings and ragings of hunger looking now back again for a minute to the little village of stoke charity the name of which seems to indicate that its rents formerly belonged wholly to the poor and indigent part of the community it is near to winchester that grand scene of ancient learning piety and munificence be this as it may the parish formerly contained ten farms and it now contains but two which are owned by mr hinton bailey and his nephew and therefore which may probably become one there used to be ten well-fed families in this parish at any rate these taking five to a family made fifty well-fed people and now all are half starved except the curate and the two families the blame is not the landowners it is nobody's it is due to the infernal funding and taxing system which of necessity drives property into large masses in order to save itself which crushes little proprietors down into labourers and which presses them down in that state there takes their wages from them and makes them paupers their share of food and raiment being taken away to support debt and dead weight and army and all the rest of the enormous expenses which are required to sustain this intolerable system those therefore are fools or hypocrites who affect to wish to better the lot of the poor labourers and manufacturers while they at the same time either actively or passively uphold the system which is the manifest cause of it here is a system which clearly as the nose upon your face you see taking away the little gentleman's estate the little farmer's farm the poor labourer's meat dinner and sunday coat and while you see this so plainly you fool or hypocrite as you are cry out for supporting the system that causes it all go on base wretch but remember that of such a progress dreadful must be the end the day will come when millions of long-suffering creatures will be in a state that they and you now little dream of all that we now behold of combinations and the like are mere indications of what the great body of the suffering people feel 
and of the thoughts that are passing in their minds. The coaxing work of schools and tracts will only add to what would be quite enough without them. There is not a labourer in the whole country who does not see to the bottom of this coaxing work. They are not deceived in this respect. Hunger has opened their eyes. I'll engage that there is not, even in this obscure village of Stoke Charity, one single creature, however forlorn, who does not understand all about the real motives of the school and the tract and the Bible affair, as well as Butterworth or Rivington, or as Joshua Watson himself. Just after we had finished the bread and cheese, we crossed the turnpike road that goes from Basingstoke to Stockbridge, and Mr. Bailey had told us that we were then to bear away to our right, and go to the end of a wood, which we saw one end of, and keep round with that wood, or coppice, as he called it, to our left. But we, seeing Beacon Hill more to the left, and resolving to go as nearly as possible, in a straight line to it, steer directly over the fields, that is to say, pieces of ground from thirty to a hundred acres in each. But a hill which we had to go over had here hidden from our sight a part of this coppice, which consists, perhaps, of a hundred and fifty or two hundred acres, and which we found sweeping round, in a crescent-like form, so far from towards our left, as to bring our landmark over the coppice at about the mid-length of the latter. Upon this discovery we slackened sail, for this coppice might be a mile across, and though the bottom was sound enough, being a coverlet of flints upon a bed of chalk, the underwood was too high and too thick for us to face, being, as we were, at so great a distance, from the means of obtaining a fresh supply of clothes. Our leather leggings would have stood anything, but our coats were of the common kind, and before we saw the other side of the coppice we should, I dare say, have been as ragged as forest ponies in the month of March. In this dilemma I stopped and looked at the coppice. Luckily two boys who had been cutting sticks, to sell I dare say, at least I hope so, made their appearance at about half a mile off, on the side for the coppice. Richard galloped off to the boys, from whom he found that in one part of the coppice there was a road cut across, the point of entrance into which road they explained to him. This was to us what the discovery of a canal across the isthmus of Darien would be to a ship in the Gulf of Mexico, wanting to get into the Pacific without doubling Cape Horn. A beautiful road we found it, I should suppose the best part of a mile long, perfectly straight, the surface sound and smooth, about eight feet wide, the whole length seen at once, and when you are at one end, the other end seeming to be hardly a yard wide. When we got about halfway, we found a road that crossed this. These roads are, I suppose, cut for the hunters. They are very pretty at any rate, and we found this one very convenient, for it cut our way short by a full half-mile. From this coppice to Whitchurch is not more than about four miles, and we soon reached it, because here you begin to descend into the vale in which this little town lies, and through which there runs that stream which turns the mill of Squire Portal, and which mill makes the Bank of England note-paper. Talk of the Thames and the Hudson with their forests of masts. Talk of the Nile and the Delaware bearing the food of millions on their bosoms. Talk of the Ganges and the Mississippi sending forth over the world their silks and their cottons. Talk of the Rio de la Plata and the other rivers, their beds pebbled with silver and gold and diamonds. What, as to their effect on the condition of mankind, as to the virtues, the vices, the enjoyments, and the sufferings of men? What are all these rivers put together compared with the river of Whitchurch, which a man of three score may jump across dry shod, which moistens a quarter of a mile wide of poor rushy meadow, which washes the skirts of the park and game preserves of that bright patrician who wedded the daughter of Hanson, the attorney and late solicitor to the stamp office, and which is to look at it, of far less importance than any gutter in the wind. Yet this river, by merely turning a wheel, which wheel sets some rag-tearers and grinders and washers and recompresses in motion, has produced a greater effect on the condition of men than has been produced on that condition by all the other rivers, all the seas, all the mines, and all the continents in the world. The discovery of America and the consequent discovery and use of vast quantities of silver and gold did indeed produce great effects on the nations of Europe. They changed the value of money, and caused, as all such changes must, a transfer of property, raising up new families and pulling down old ones, a transfer very little favourable either to morality or to real and substantial liberty. But this cause worked slowly. Its consequences came on by slow degrees. It made a transfer of property, but it made that transfer in so small a degree, and it left the property quiet in the hands of the new possessor for so long a time, that the effect was not violent, and was not, at any rate, such as to uproot possessors by whole districts, as the hurricane uproots the forests. Not so the product of the little sedgy rivulet of Whitchurch. It has, in the short space of a hundred and thirty-one years, 
and indeed in the space of the last forty, caused greater changes as to property than had been caused by all other things put together in the long course of seven centuries, though during that course there had been a sweeping, confiscating Protestant reformation. Let us look back to the place where I started on this present rural ride. Poor old Baron Messiers, succeeded at Reigate by little Parson Fellows, and at Betchworth, three miles on my road by Kendrick, is no bad instance to begin with, for the Baron was nobly descended, though from French ancestors. At Albury, fifteen miles on my road, Mr. Drummond, a banker, is in the seat of one of the Hards, and close by he has bought the estate, just pulled down the house, and blotted out the memory of the Godshalls. At Chilworth, two miles further down the same vale, and close under St. Martha's Hill, Mr. Tinkler, a powder-maker, succeeding Hill, another powder-maker, who had been a breeches maker at Hounslow, has got the old mansion and the estate of the old Duchess of Marlborough, who frequently resided in what was then a large quadrangular mansion, but the remains of which now serve as out farm buildings and a farmhouse, which I found inhabited by a poor labourer and his family, the farm being in the hands of the powder-maker, who does not find the once noble seat good enough for him. Coming on to Waverley Abbey, there is Mr. Thompson, a merchant, succeeding the Orby Hunters and Sir Robert Rich. Close adjoining, Mr. Lang, a West India dealer of some sort, has stepped into the place of the lineal descendants of Sir William Temple. At Farnham, the park and palace remain in the hands of a bishop of Winchester, as they have done for about eight hundred years. But why is this? Because they are public property, because they cannot, without express laws, be transferred. Therefore the product of the rivulet of Whitchurch has had no effect upon the ownership of these, which are still in the hands of a bishop of Winchester, not of a William of Wickham, to be sure, but still in those of a bishop, at any rate. Coming on to old Alresford, twenty miles from Farnham, Sheriff, the son of a sheriff, who was a commissary in the American War, has succeeded the Gages. Two miles further on, at Abbotston, down on the side of the Itchen, Alexander Baring has succeeded the heirs and successors of the Duke of Bolton, the remains of whose noble mansion I once saw here. Not above a mile higher up, the same bearing has, at the Grange, with its noble mansion, park and estate, succeeded the heirs of Lord Northington. And at only about two miles further, Sir Thomas Baring, at Stratton Park, has succeeded the Russells in the ownership of the estates of Stratton and Mitchell Dover, which were once the property of Alfred the Great. Stepping back and following my road, down by the side of the meadows of the beautiful river Itchen, and coming to Easton, I look across to Martyrs Worthy, and there see, as I observed before, the ogles succeeded by a general or a colonel somebody, but who or whence I cannot learn. This is all in less than fourscore miles from Reigate even to this place, where I now am. Oh, mighty rivulet of Whitchurch! All our properties, all our laws, all our manners, all our minds, you have changed. This which I have noticed has all taken place within forty, and most of it within ten years. The small gentry to about the third rank upwards, considering there to be five ranks, from the smallest gentry up to the greatest nobility, are all gone nearly to a man, and the small farmers along with them. The bearings alone have, I should think, swallowed up thirty or forty of these small gentry without perceiving it. They indeed swallow up the biggest race of all, but innumerable small fry slip down unperceived, like caplins down the throats of the sharks, while these latter feel only the codfish. It frequently happens, too, that a big gentleman or nobleman, whose estate has been big enough to resist for a long while, and who has swilled up many Kaplan gentry, goes down the throat of the loan dealer with all the Kaplans in his belly. Thus the Whitchurch rivulet goes on, shifting property from hand to hand. The big, in order to save themselves from being swallowed up quick, as we used to be taught to say in our church prayers against Bonaparte, make use of their voices to get, through place, pension or sinecure, something back from the taxes. Others of them fall in love with the daughters and widows of paper-money people, big brewers and the like, and sometimes their daughters fall in love with the paper-money people's sons, or the fathers of those sons. And whether they be Jews or not seems to be little matter with this all-subduing passion of love. But the small gentry have no resource. While war lasted, glorious war, there was a resource, but now, alas, not only is there no war, but there is no hope of war, and not a few of them will actually come to the parish book. There is no place for them in the army, church, navy, customs, excise, pension list, or anywhere else. All these are now wanted by their betters. A stock-jobber's family will not look at such penniless things, so that while they have been the active, the zealous, the efficient instruments in compelling the working classes to submit to half-starvation, 
they have at any rate been brought to the most abject ruin themselves, for which I most heartily thank God. The harvest of war is never to return without a total blowing up of the paper system. Spain must belong to France, St. Domingo must pay her tribute. America must be paid for slaves taken away in war. She must have Florida. She must go on openly and avowedly making a navy, for the purpose of humbling us. And all this, and ten times more, if France and America should choose. And yet we can have no war as long as the paper system last. And if that cease, then what is to come? Berkeley, Sunday morning, 6th November. It has been fine all the week until today, when we intended to set off for Hurstbourne Tarrant, vulgarly called Up Husband but the rain seems as if it would stop us. From Whitchurch to within two miles of this place, it is the same sort of country as between Winchester and Whitchurch. High chalk bottom, open downs or large fields, with here and there a farmhouse in a dell sheltered by lofty trees, which to my taste is the most pleasant situation in the world. This has been with Richard one whole week of hare hunting, and with me three days and a half. The weather has been amongst the finest that I ever saw, and Lord Carnarvon's preserves fill the country with hares, while these hares invite us to ride about and to see his park and estate, at this fine season of the year, in every direction. We are now on the north side of that beacon hill for which we steered last Sunday. This makes part of a chain of lofty chalk hills and downs, which divides all the lower part of Hampshire from Berkshire, though the ancient ruler, owner of the former, took a little strip all along on the flat, on this side of the chain, in order, I suppose, to make the ownership of the hills themselves the more clear of all dispute, just as the owner of a field hedge and bank owns also the ditch on his neighbour's side. From these hills you look at one view over the whole of Berkshire into Oxfordshire, Gloucestershire and Wiltshire, and you can see the Isle of Wight and the sea. On this north side the chalk soon ceases, and the sand and clay begin, and the oak woods cover a great part of the surface. Amongst these is the farmhouse in which we are, and from the warmth and good fare of which we do not mean to stir, until we can do it without the chance of a wet skin. This rain has given me time to look at the newspapers of about a week old. Oh, oh, the cotton lords are tearing, thank God for that. The lords of the anvil are snapping, thank God for that too. They have kept poor souls, then, in a heat of eighty-four degrees to little purpose after all. The great interests mentioned in the king's speech do not then all continue to flourish. The prosperity was not, then, permanent, though the king was advised to assert so positively that it was. Anglo-Mexican and Pasco-Peruvian fall in price, and the chronicle assures me that the respectable owners of the Mexican mining shares mean to take measures to protect their property. Indeed, like protecting the Spanish bonds, I suppose. Will the chronicle be so good as to tell us the names of these respectable persons? Dr. Black must know their names, or else he could not know them to be respectable. If the parties be those that I have heard, these mining works may possibly operate with them as an emetic, and make them throw up a part at least of what they have taken down. There has, I see, at New York been that confusion which I four months ago said would and must take place, that breaking of merchants and all the ruin which, in such a case, spreads itself about, ruining families and producing fraud and despair. Here will be, between the two countries, an interchange of cause and effect, proceeding from the dealings in cotton, until first and last two or three hundred thousands of persons have, at one spell of paper-money work, been made to drink deep of misery. I pity none but the poor English creatures, who are compelled to work on the wool of this accursed weed, which has done so much mischief to England. The slaves who cultivate and gather the cotton are well fed, they do not suffer. The sufferers are these who spin it and weave it and colour it, and the wretched beings who cover with it those bodies which, as in the time of old Fortescue, ought to be clothed throughout in good woollens. One newspaper says that Mr. Huskisson is gone to Paris, and thinks it likely that he will endeavour to inculcate in the mind of the Bourbons wise principles of free trade. What the devil next! Persuade them, I suppose, that it is for their good that English goods should be admitted into France, and into St. Domingo, with little or no duty. Persuade them to make a treaty of commerce with him, and in short persuade them to make France help to pay the interest of our debt and dead weight, lest our system of paper should go to pieces, and lest that should be followed by a radical reform, which reform would be injurious to the monarchical principle. This newspaper politician does, however, think that the Bourbons will be too dull to comprehend these enlightened and liberal notions, and I think so too. I think the Bourbons, or rather those who will speak for them, will say, No, thank you. You contracted your debt without our participation. You made your dead weight for your own purposes. 
the seizure of our museums and the loss of our frontier towns followed your victory of waterloo though we were your allies at the time you made us pay an enormous tribute after that battle and kept possession of part of france till we had paid it you wished the other day to keep us out of spain and you mr huskisson in a speech at liverpool called our deliverance of the king of spain an unjust and unprincipled act of aggression while mr canning prayed to god that we might not succeed no thank you mr huskisson no no coaxing sir we saw then too clearly the advantage we derive from your having a debt and a dead weight to wish to assist in relieving you from either monarchical principle here or monarchical principle there we know that your millstone debt is our best security we like to have your wishes your prayers and your abuse against us rather than your subsidies and your fleets and so farewell mr huskisson if you like the english may drink french wine but whether they do or not the french shall not wear your rotten cottons and as a last word how did you maintain the monarchical principle the paternal principle or as castlereagh called it the social system when you call that an unjust and unprincipled aggression which put an end to the bargain by which the convents and other church property of spain were to be transferred to the jews and jobbers of london bonjour monsieur huskisson ci devant membre orateur du club de quatre vingt neuf if they do not actually say this to him this is what they will think and that is as to the effect precisely the same thing it is childishness to suppose that any nation will act from a desire of serving all other nations or any one other nation as well as itself it will make unless compelled no compact by which it does not think itself a gainer and amongst its gains it must and always does reckon the injury to its rivals it is a stupid idea that all nations are to gain by anything whatever is the gain of one must in some way or other be a loss to another so that this new project of free trade and mutual gain is as pure humbug as that which the newspapers carried on during the glorious days of loans when they told us at every loan that the bargain was equally advantageous to the contractors and to the public the fact is the free trade project is clearly the effect of a consciousness of our weakness as long as we felt strong we felt bold we had no thought of conciliating the world we upheld a system of exclusion which long experience proved to be founded in sound policy but we now find that our debts and our loads of various sorts cripple us we feel our incapacity for the carrying of trade sword in hand and so we have given up all our old maxims and are endeavouring to persuade the world that we are anxious to enjoy no advantages that are not enjoyed also by our neighbours alas the world sees very clearly the cause of all this and the world laughs at us for our imaginary cunning my old doggerel that used to make me and my friends laugh in long island is precisely pat to this case when his moor was stuffed with paper how john bull did prance and caper how he foamed and how he roared how his neighbours all he gored how he scrapped the ground and hurled dirt and filth on all the world but john bull of paper empty though in midst of peace and plenty is modest grown as worn-out sinner as scottish laird that wants a dinner as wilberforce become content a rotten burr to represent as blue and buff when after hunting on yankee coast there are bits of bunting came softly back across the seas and silent were as mice in cheese yes the whole world and particularly the french and the yankees see very clearly the course of this fit of modesty and of liberality into which we have so recently fallen they know well that a war would play the very devil with our national faith they know in short that no ministers in their senses will think of supporting the paper system through another war they know well that no ministers that now exist or are likely to exist will venture to endanger the paper system and therefore they know that for england they may now do just what they please when the french were about to invade spain mr canning said that his last dispatch on the subject was to be understood as a protest on the part of england against permanent occupation of any part of spain by france there the french are however and at the end of two years and a half he says that he knows nothing about any intention that they have to quit spain or any part of it why st domingo was independent we had traded with it as an independent state is it not clear that if we had said the word and had been known to be able to arm france would not have attempted to treat that fine and rich country as a colony mark how wise this measure of france how just too to obtain by means of a tribute from the st domingoans compensation for the loyalists of that country was this done with regard to the loyalists of america in the reign of the good jubilee george the third oh no those loyalists had to be paid and many of them have even yet at the end of more than half a century to be paid out of taxes raised on us 
for the losses occasioned by their disinterested loyalty. This was a masterstroke on the part of France. She gets about seven millions sterling in the way of tribute. She makes that rich island yield to her great commercial advantages, and she at the same time paves the way for effecting one of two objects, namely getting the island back again, or throwing our islands into confusion, whenever it shall be her interest to do it. This might have been prevented by a word from us if we had been ready for war. But we are grown modest, we are grown liberal, we do not want to engross that which fairly belongs to our neighbours. We have undergone a change somewhat like that which marriage produces on a blustering fellow, who while single can but just clear his teeth. This change is quite surprising, and especially by the time that the second child comes, the man is loaded. He looks like a loaded man. His voice becomes so soft and gentle compared to what it used to be. Just such are the effects of our load. But the worst of it is, is our neighbours are not thus loaded. However, far be it from me to regret this or any part of it. The load is the people's best friend. If that could, without reform, if that could be shaken off, leaving the seatmen and the parsons in their present state, I would not live in England another day. And I say this with as much seriousness as if I were upon my deathbed. The wise men of the newspapers are for a repeal of the Corn Laws. With all my heart, I will join anybody in a petition for their repeal. But this will not be done. We shall stop short of this extent of liberality, let what may be the consequence to the manufacturers. The cotton lords must all go to the last man, rather than a repeal. These laws will take place. And of this the newspaper wise men may be assured. The farmers can but just rub along now, with all their high prices and low wages. What would be their state and that of their landlords, if the wheat were to come down again to four, five, or even six shillings a bushels? Universal agricultural bankruptcy would be the almost instant consequence. Many of them are now deep in debt from the effects of 1820, 1821, and 1822. One more year like 1822 would have broken the whole mass up, and left the lands to be cultivated under the overseers for the benefit of the paupers. Society would have been nearly dissolved, and the state of nature would have returned. The small note bill, cooperating with the corn laws, have given a respite and nothing more. This bill must remain efficient, paper money must cover the country, and the corn laws must remain in force, or an equitable adjustment must take place, or, to a state of nature, this country must return. What then, as I want a repeal of the corn laws, and also want to get rid of the paper money, I must want to see this return to a state of nature? By no means. I want the equitable adjustment and I am quite sure that no adjustment can be equitable which does not apply every penny's worth of public property to the payment of the fund-holders and dead-weight and the like. Clearly just and reasonable as this is, however, the very mention of it makes the fire-shovels and some others half mad. It makes them storm and rant and swear like bedlamites, but it is curious to hear them talk of the impracticability of it, when they all know that by only two or three acts of Parliament Henry the Eighth did ten times as much as it would now, I hope, be necessary to do. If the duty were imposed on me, no statesman, legislator, or lawyer, but a simple citizen, I think I could, in less than twenty-four hours, draw up an act that would give satisfaction to, I will not say every man, but to at least ninety-nine out of every hundred, an act that would put all affairs of money and of religion to rights at once, but that would, I must confess, soon take from us that amiable modesty, of which I have spoken above, and which is so conspicuously shown in our works of free trade and liberality. The weather is clearing up. Our horses are saddled, and we are off. End of chapter 18。Chapter 19 of Rural Rides. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Rural Rides by William Cobbett, Chapter 19 Ride from Berkeley to Petersfield, Hurstbourne Tarrant, or Up Husband, Monday, 7th November, 1825 We came off from Berkeley yesterday afternoon, crossing Lord Carnarvon's Park, going out of it on the west side of Beacon Hill, and sloping away to our right, over the downs, towards Woodcote. The afternoon was singularly beautiful. The downs, even the poorest of them, are perfectly green, the sheep on the downs look, this year, like fatting sheep. We came through a fine flock of ewes, and looking round us we saw all at once seven flocks on different parts of the downs, each flock on an average containing at least five hundred sheep. 
It is about six miles from Berkeley to this place, and we made it about twelve, not in order to avoid the turnpike road, but because we do not ride about to see turnpike roads, and moreover, because I had seen this most monstrously hilly turnpike road before. We came through a village called Woodcut, and another called Binley. I never saw any inhabited places more recluse than these. Yet into these the all-searching eye of the taxing thing reaches. Its excise man can tell it what is doing, even in the little odd corner of Binley. For even there I saw, over the door of a place not half so good as the place in which my fowls roost, license to deal in tea and tobacco. Poor half-starved wretches of Binley! The hand of taxation, the collection for the sinecures and pensions, must fix its nails even in them, who really appeared too miserable to be called by the name of people. Yet there was one whom the taxing thing had licensed, good God, licensed, to serve out catlap to these wretched creatures. And our impudent and ignorant newspaper scribes talk of the degraded state of the people of Spain. Impudent impostors! Can they show a group so wretched, so miserable, so truly enslaved as this, in all Spain? No. And those of them who are not sheer fools know it well. But there would have been misery equal to this in Spain, if the Jews and jobbers could have carried the bond scheme into effect. The people of Spain were, through the instrumentality of patriot loan-makers, within an inch of being made as enlightened as the poor starving things of Binley. They would soon have had people licensed to make them pay the Jews for permission to chew tobacco, or to have a light in their dreary abodes. The people of Spain were preserved from this by the French army, for which the Jews cursed the French army, and the same army put an end to those bonds, by means of which pious Protestants hoped to be able to get at the convents in Spain, and thereby put down idolatry in that country. These bonds seem now not to be worth a farthing. And so, after all, the Spanish people will have no one licensed by the Jews to make them pay for turning the fat of their sheep into candles and soap. These poor creatures that I behold here pass their lives amidst flocks of sheep, but never does a morsel of mutton enter their lips. A labouring man told me at Binley that he had not tasted meat since harvest, and his looks vouched for the statement. Let the Spaniards come and look at this poor shotten herring of a creature, and then let them estimate what is due to a set of enlightening and loan-making patriots. Old Fortescue says that the English are clothed in good woollens throughout, and that they have plenty of flesh of all sorts to eat. Yes, but at this time the nation was not mortgaged. The enlightening patriots would have made Spain what England now is. The people must never more, after a few years, have tasted mutton, though living surrounded with flocks of sheep. Eastern near Winchester, Wednesday evening, ninth November. I intended to go from Uphusband to Stonehenge, thence to Old Sarum, and thence through the New Forest, to Southampton and Botley, and thence across into Sussex, to see our park and Cowdery House. But then there must be no loss of time. I must adhere to a certain route as strictly as a regiment on a march. I had written the route, and Laverstock, after seeing Stonehenge and Old Sarum, was to be the resting place of yesterday, Tuesday. But when it came it brought rain with it after a white frost on Monday. It was likely to rain again to-day. It became necessary to change the route, as I must get to London by a certain day, and as the first day on the new route brought us here. I had been three times at Uphusband before, and had, as my readers will perhaps recollect, described the burn here or the brook. It has in general no water at all in it from August to March. There is the bed of a little river, but no water. In March or thereabouts, the water begins to boil up in thousands upon thousands of places, in the little narrow meadows just above the village, that is to say a little higher up the valley. When the chalk hills are full, when the chalk will hold no more water, then it comes out at the lower spots near these immense hills, and becomes a rivulet first, and then a river. But until this visit to Uphusband, or Hurstbourne Tarrant, as the map calls it, little did I imagine that this rivulet, dry half the year was the head of the river Test, which, after passing through Stockbridge and Rumsey, falls into the sea near Southampton. We had to follow the bed of this river to Burn, but there the water begins to appear, and it runs all the year long about a mile lower down. Here it crosses Lord Portsmouth's out-park, and our road took us the same way to the village called Downhusband, the scene, as the broadsheet tells us, 
of so many of that noble lord's ringing and cart-driving exploits. Here we cross the London and Andover road, and leaving Andover to our right and Whitchurch to our left, we came on to Long Parish. We are crossing the water. We came up again on that high country which continues all across to Winchester. After passing Bullington, Sutton and Wonston, we veered away from Stoke Charity, and came across the fields to the high down, whence you see Winchester, or rather the cathedral, for at this distance you can distinguish nothing else clearly. As we have to come to this place, which is three miles up the river Itchen from Winchester, we crossed the Winchester and Basingstoke road at Kingsworthy. This brought us, before we crossed the river, along through Martyrsworthy, so long the seat of the Ogles, and now, as I observed in my last register, sold to a general or colonel. These Ogles had been deans, I believe, or prebends, or something of that sort, and the one that used to live here had been, and was when he died, an admiral. However, this last one, Sir Charles, the loyal address-mover, is my man for the present. We saw, down by the waterside, opposite to Sir Charles's late family mansion, a beautiful strawberry garden, capable of being watered by a branch of the itchen which comes close by it, and which is, I suppose, brought there on purpose. Just by, on the greensward, under the shade of very fine trees, is an alcove wherein to sit to eat the strawberries, coming from the little garden just mentioned, and met by bowls of cream coming from a little milk-house, shaded by another clump a little lower down the stream. What delight! What a terrestrial paradise! Sir Charles might be very frequently in this paradise, while that Sidmouth, whose bill he so applauded, had many men shut up in loathsome dungeons. Ah, well! Sir Charles, those very men may, perhaps at this moment, envy neither you nor Sidmouth, no, nor Sidmouth's son and heir, even though clerk of the Pells. At any rate, it is not likely that Sir Charles will sit again in this paradise, contemplating another loyal address, to carry to a county meeting ready engrossed on parchment, to be presented by Fleming and supported by Lockhart and the Hampshire Parsons. I think I saw, as I came along, the new owner of the estate. It seems that he bought it stock and fluke, as the sailors call it, that is to say that he bought movables and the whole. He appeared to me to be a keen man. I can't find out where he comes from, or what he or his father has been. I like to see the revolution going on, but I like to be able to trace the parties a little more closely. Sir Charles, the loyal addressed gentleman, lives in London, I hear. I will, I think, call upon him, if I can find him out, when I get back, and ask how he does now. There is one Hollist, a George Hollist, who figured pretty bigly on that same loyal address day. This man is become quite an inoffensive, harmless creature. If we were to have another county meeting, he would not, I think, threaten to put the sash down upon anybody's head. Oh, peel, peel, peel! Thy bill, O oh, peel, did sicken them so! Let us, O oh, thou offspring of the great spinning jenny promoter, who subscribed ten thousand pounds towards the late glorious war, who was after that made a baronet, and whose biographers in the baronetage tell the world that he had a presentiment that he should be the founder of a family. O oh, thou, thou great peel, do thou let us have only two more years of thy bill. Or, oh, O oh, great peel, minister of the interior, do thou let us have repeal of corn bill. Either will do, great peel. We shall then see such modest squires and parsons, looking so queer. However, if thou wilt not listen to us, great peel, we must perhaps, and only perhaps, wait a little longer. It is sure to come at last, and to come, too, in the most efficient way. The water in the Itchen is, they say, famed for its clearness. As I was crossing the river the other day, at Avington, I told Richard to look at it, and I asked him if he did not think it very clear. I now find that this has been remarked by very ancient writers. I see in a newspaper just received an account of dreadful fires in New Brunswick. It is curious that in my register of the 29th October, dated from Chilworth in Surrey, I should have put a question relative to the white clover, the huckleberries, or the raspberries, which start up after the burning down of woods in America. These fires have been at two places which I saw when there were hardly any people in the whole country, and if there never had been any people there to this day it would have been a good thing for England. Those colonies are a dead expense, without a possibility of their ever being of any use. There are, I see, a church and a barrack destroyed, and why a barrack? What, were there bayonets wanted already to keep the people in order? For as to an enemy, where was he to come from? And if there really be an enemy anywhere thereabout, 
would it not be a wise way to leave the worthless country to him to use it after his own way i was at that very fredericton where they say thirty houses and thirty-nine barns have now been burnt i can remember when there was no more thought of there ever being a barn there than there is now thought of there being economy in our government the english money used to be spent prettily in that country what do we want with armies and barracks and chaplains in those woods what does anybody want with them but we above all the rest of the world there is nothing there no house no barrack no wharf nothing but what is bought with taxes raised on the half-starving people of england what do we want with these wildernesses ah but they are wanted by creatures who will not work in england and whom this fine system of ours sends out into those woods to live in idleness upon the fruit of english labour the soldier the commissary the barrack-master all the whole tribe no matter under what name what keeps them they are paid by government and i wish that we constantly bore in mind that the government pays our money it is to be sure sorrowful to hear of such fires and such dreadful effects proceeding from them but to me it is beyond all measure more sorrowful to see the labourers of england worse fed than the convicts in the jails and i know very well that these worthless and jobbing colonies have assisted to bring england into this horrible state the honest labouring man is allowed ay by the magistrates less food than the felon in the jail and the felon is clothed and has fuel and the labouring man has nothing allowed for these these worthless colonies which find places for people that the thing provides for have helped to produce this dreadful state in england therefore any assistance the sufferers should never have from me while i could find an honest and industrious english labourer unloaded with a family too fed worse than a felon in the jails and this i can find in every part of the country petersfield friday evening eleventh november we lost another day at easton the whole of yesterday it having rained the whole day so that we could not have come an inch but in the wet we started therefore this morning coming through the duke of buckingham's park at avington which is close by easton and on the same side of the itchen this is a very beautiful place the house is close down at the edge of the meadow-land there is a lawn before it and a pond supplied by the itchen at the end of the lawn and bounded by the park on the other side the high road through the park goes very near to this water and we saw thousands of wild ducks in the pond or sitting round on the green edges of it while on one side of the pond the hares and pheasants were moving about upon a gravel walk on the side of a very fine plantation we looked down upon all this from a rising ground and the water like a looking-glass showed us the trees and even the animals this is certainly one of the very prettiest spots in the world the wild waterfowl seem to take particular delight in this place there are a great many at lord carnarvon's but there the water is much larger and the ground and wood about it comparatively rude and coarse here at avington everything is in such beautiful order the lawn before the house is of the finest green and most neatly kept and the edge of the pond which is of several acres is as smooth as if it formed part of a bowling green to see so many wild fowl in a situation where everything is in the parterre order has a most pleasant effect on the mind and richard and i like pope's cock in the farmyard could not help thanking the duke and duchess for having generously made such ample provision for our pleasure and that too merely to please us as we were passing along now this is the advantage of going about on horseback on foot the fatigue is too great and you go too slowly in any sort of carriage you cannot get into the real country places to travel in stage-coaches is to be hurried along by force in a box with an air-hole in it and constantly exposed to broken limbs the danger being much greater than that of shipboard and the noise much more disagreeable while the company is frequently not a great deal more to one's liking from this beautiful spot we had to mount gradually the downs to the southward but it is impossible to quit the vale of the itchen without one more look back at it to form a just estimate of its real value and that of the lands near it it is only necessary to know that from its source at bishop sutton this river has on its two banks in the distance of nine miles before it reaches winchester thirteen parish churches there must have been some people to erect these churches it is not true then that pitt and george the third created the english nation notwithstanding all that the scotch philosophers are ready to swear about the matter in short there can be no doubt in the mind of any rational man that in the time of the plantagenets 
england was out of all comparison more populous than it is now when we began to get up towards the downs we to our great surprise saw them covered with snow sad times coming on for poor sir glory said i to richard why said dick it was too cold to talk much and besides a great sluggishness in his horse made us both rather serious the horse had been too hard ridden at berkeley and had got cold this made us change our route again and instead of going over the downs towards hambledon in our way to see the park and the innumerable hares and pheasants of sir harry featherstone we pulled away more to the left to go through bramdean and so on to petersfield contracting greatly our intended circuit and besides i had never seen bramdean the spot on which it is said alfred fought his last great and glorious battle with the danes a fine country for a battle sure enough we stopped at the village to bait our horses and while we were in the public-house an exciseman came and rummaged it all over taking an account of the various sorts of liquor in it having the air of a complete master of the premises while a very pretty and modest girl waited on him to produce the diverse bottles jars and kegs i wonder whether alfred had a thought of anything like this when he was clearing england from her oppressors a little to our right as we came along we left the village of kingston where squire graham once lived as was before related here too lived a squire ridge a famous fox-hunter at a great mansion now used as a farmhouse and it is curious enough that this squire's son-in-law one gunner an attorney at bishop's waltham is steward to the man who now owns the estate before we got to petersfield we called at an old friend's and got some bread and cheese and small beer which we preferred to strong in approaching petersfield we began to descend from the high chalk country which with the exception of the valleys of the itchen and the test had lasted us from uphusband almost the north-west point of the county to this place which is not far from the south-east point of it here we quit flint and chalk and downs and take to sand clay hedges and coppices and here on the verge of hampshire we begin again to see those endless little bubble formed hills that we before saw round the foot of hindhead we have got in in very good time and got at the dolphin good stabling for our horses the waiters and people at inns look so hard at us to see us so liberal as to horse feed fire candle beds and room while we are so very very sparing in the article of drink they seem to pity our taste i hear people complain of the exorbitant charges at inns but my wonder always is how the people can live with charging so little except in one single instance i have uniformly since i have been from home thought the charges too low for people to live by this long evening has given me time to look at the star newspaper of last night and i see that with all possible desire to disguise the fact there is a great panic brewing it is impossible that this thing can go on in its present way for any length of time the talk about speculations that is to say adventurous dealings or rather commercial gamblings the talk about these having been the cause of the breakings and the other symptoms of approaching convulsion is the most miserable nonsense that ever was conceived in the heads of idiots these are effect not cause the cause is the small note bill that last brilliant effort of the joint mind of van and castlereagh that bill was as i always called it a respite and it was and could be nothing more it could only put off the evil hour it could not prevent the final arrival of that hour to have proceeded with peel's bill was indeed to produce total convulsion the land must have been surrendered to the overseers for the use of the poor that is to say without an equitable adjustment but that adjustment as prayed for by kent norfolk hereford and surrey might have taken place it ought to have taken place and it must at last take place or convulsion must come as to the nature of this adjustment is it not most distinctly described in the norfolk petition is not that memorable petition now in the journals of the house of commons what more is wanted than to act on the prayer of that very petition had i to draw up a petition again i would not change a single word of that it pleased mr brougham's best public instructor to abuse that petition and it pleased daddy coke and the hickory quaker gurney and the wise barn orator to calumniate its author they succeeded but their success was but shame to them and that author is yet destined to triumph over them i have seen no london paper for ten days until to-day and i should not have seen this if the waiter had not forced it upon me i know very nearly what will happen by next may or thereabouts 
and as to the manner in which things will work in the meanwhile, it is of far less consequence to the nation than it is what sort of weather I shall have to ride in to-morrow. One thing, however, I wish to observe, and that is that, if any attempt be made to repeal the Corn Bill, the main body of the farmers will be crushed into total ruin. I come into contact with few who are not gentlemen or very substantial farmers, but I know the state of the whole, and I know that even with present prices, and with honest labourers fed worse than felons, it is rub and go with nineteen-twentieths of the farmers, and of this fact I beseech the ministers to be well aware, and with this fact staring them in the face, with that other horrid fact that, by the regulations of the magistrates, who cannot avoid it, mind, the honest labourers fed worse than the convicted felon, with the breakings of merchants so ruinous to confiding foreigners, so disgraceful to the name of England, with the thousands of industrious and caretaking creatures reduced to beggary by bank-paper, with panic upon panic, plunging thousands upon thousands into despair, with all this notorious as the sun at noonday, will they again advise their royal master to tell the Parliament and the world that this country is in a state of unequalled prosperity, and that this prosperity must be permanent, because all the great interests are flourishing. Let them! That will not alter the result. I had been for several weeks saying that the seeming prosperity was fallacious, that the cause of it must lead to ultimate and shocking ruin, that it could not last, because it arose from causes so manifestly fictitious, that, in short, it was the fair-looking but poisonous fruit of a miserable expedient. I had been saying this for several weeks when out came the King's speech, and gave me and my doctrines the lie direct as to every point. Well, now then, we shall soon see. End of chapter 19「Saturday, 12th November, 1825. I was at this town in the summer of 1823, when I crossed Sussex from Worth to Huntington, in my way to Titchfield, in Hampshire. We came this morning from Petersfield, with an intention to cross to Horsham, and go thence to Worth, and then into Kent, but Richard's horse seemed not to be fit for so strong a bout, and therefore we resolved to bend our course homewards and first of all to fall back upon our resources at Thursley, which we intend to reach to-morrow, going through North Chapel, Chiddingfold, and Brook. At about four miles from Petersfield, we passed through a village called Rogate. Just before we came to it, I asked a man who was hedging on the side of the road how much he got a day. He said one shilling sixpence, and he told me that the allowed wages were seven pence a day for the man, and a gallon loaf a week for the rest of his family, that is to say one pound and two and a quarter ounces of bread for each of them, and nothing more, and this, observe, is one third short of the bread allowance of jails, to say nothing of the meat and clothing and lodging of the inhabitants of jails. If the man have full work, if he get his eighteen pence a day, the whole nine shillings does not purchase a gallon loaf each for a wife and three children, and two gallon loaves for himself. In the jails the convicted felons have a pound and a half each of bread a day, to begin with. They have some meat generally, and it has been found absolutely necessary to allow them meat when they work at the treadmill. It is impossible to make them work at the treadmill without it. However, let us take the bare allowance of bread allowed in the jails. This allowance is, for five people, fifty-two pounds and a half in the week, whereas the man's nine shillings will buy but fifty-two pounds of bread, and this, observe, is a vast deal better than the state of things in the north of Hampshire, where the day labourer gets but eight shillings a week. I asked this man how much a day they gave to a young, able man who had no family, and who was compelled to come to the parish officers for work. Observe that there are a great many young men in this situation, because the farmers will not employ single men at full wages, these full wages being wanted for the married man's family, just to keep them alive according to the calculation that we have just seen. 
about the borders of the north of hampshire they give to these single men two gallon loaves a week or in money two shillings and eight pence and nothing more here in this part of sussex they give the single man seven pence a day that is to say enough to buy two pounds and a quarter of bread for six days in the week and as he does not work on the sunday there is no seven pence allowed for the sunday and of course nothing to eat and this is the allowance settled by the magistrates for a young hearty labouring man and that too in the part of england where i believe they live better than in any other part of it the poor creature here has seven pence a day for six days in the week to find him food clothes washing and lodging it is just seven pence less than one half of what the meanest foot soldier in the standing army receives besides that the latter has clothing candle fire and lodging into the bargain well may we call our happy state of things the envy of surrounding nations and the admiration of the world we hear of the efforts of mrs fry mr buxton and numerous other persons to improve the situation of felons in the jails but never no never do we catch them ejaculating one single pious sigh for these innumerable sufferers who are doomed to become felons or to waste away their bodies by hunger when we came into the village of rogate i saw a little group of persons standing before a blacksmith's shop the churchyard was on the other side of the road surrounded by a low wall the earth of the churchyard was about four feet and a half higher than the common level of the ground round about it and you may see by the nearness of the church windows to the ground that this bed of earth has been made by the innumerable burials that have taken place in it the group consisting of the blacksmith the wheelwright perhaps and three or four others appeared to me to be in a deliberative mood so i said looking significantly at the churchyard it has taken a pretty many thousands of your forefathers to raise that ground up so high yes sir said one of them and said i for about nine hundred years those who built that church thought about religion very differently from what we do yes said another and said i do you think that all those who made that heap there are gone to the devil i got no answer to this at any rate added i they never worked for a pound and a half of bread a day they looked hard at me and then looked hard at one another and i having trotted off looked round at the first turning and saw them looking after us still i should suppose that the church was built about seven or eight hundred years ago that is to say the present church for the first church built upon this spot was i dare say erected more than a thousand years ago if i had had time i should have told this group that before the protestant reformation the labourers of rogate received four pence a day from michaelmas to lady day five pence a day from lady day to michaelmas except in harvest and grass mowing time when able labourers had seven pence a day and that at this time bacon was not so much as a half penny a pound and moreover that the parson of the parish maintained out of the tithes all those persons in the parish that were reduced to indigence by means of old age or other cause of inability to labour i should have told them this and in all probability a great deal more but i had not time and besides they will have an opportunity of reading all about it in my little book called the history of the protestant reformation from rogate we came on to trotton where mr twyford is the squire and where there is a very fine and ancient church close by the squire's house i saw the squire looking at some poor devils who were making vast improvements ma'am on the road which passes by the squire's door he looked uncommonly hard at me it was a scrutinizing sort of look mixed as i thought with a little surprise if not of jealousy as much as to say i wonder who the devil you can be my look at the squire was with the head a little on one side and with the cheek drawn up from the left corner of the mouth expressive of anything rather than a sense of inferiority to the squire of whom however i had never heard speak before seeing the good and commodious and capacious church i could not help reflecting on the intolerable baseness of this description of men who have remained mute as fishers while they have been taxed to build churches for the convenience of the cotton lords and the stock jobbers first their estates have been taxed to pay interest of debts contracted with these stock jobbers and to make wars for the sale of the goods of the cotton lords this drain upon their estates has collected the people into great masses and now the same estates are taxed to build churches for them in these masses and yet the tame fellows remain as silent as if they had been born deaf and dumb and blind as towards the labourers they are sharp and vigorous and brave as heart could wish here they are bold as hector they pare down the wretched souls to what is below jail allowance but as towards the taxes 
they are gentle as doves. With regard, however, to this Squire Twyford, he is not, as I afterwards found, without some little consolation, for one of his sons, I understand, is, like Squire Rawlinson of Hampshire, a police justice in London. I hear that Squire Twyford was always a distinguished champion of loyalty, what they call a staunch friend of government, and it is therefore natural that the government should be a staunch friend to him, by the taxing of his estate, and paying the stock-jobbers out of the proceeds. The people have been got together in great masses, and, as there are justices wanted to keep them in order in those masses, it seems but reasonable that the squire should in one way or another enjoy some portion of the profits of keeping them in order. However, this cannot be the case with every loyal squire, and there are many of them who, for want of a share in the distribution, have been totally extinguished. I should suppose Squire Twyford to be in the second rank upwards, dividing the whole of the proprietors of land into five ranks. It appears to me that pretty nearly the whole of this second rank is gone, that the stock-jobbers have eaten them clean up, having less mercy than the cannibals, who usually leave the hands and the feet, so that this squire has had pretty good luck. From Trotton we came to Midhurst, and having baited our horses, went into Cowdery Park to see the ruins of that once noble mansion, from which the Countess of Salisbury, the last of the Plantagenets, was brought by the tyrant Henry the Eighth, to be cruelly murdered, in revenge for the integrity and the other great virtues of her son, Cardinal Pole as we have seen in number four paragraph a hundred and fifteen of the history of the protestant reformation this noble estate one of the finest in the whole kingdom was seized on by the king after the possessor had been murdered on his scaffold she had committed no crime no crime was proved against her the miscreant thomas cromwell finding that no form of trial would answer his purpose invented a new mode of bringing people to their death namely a bill brought into parliament condemning her to death the estate was then granted to a Sir Anthony Brown, who was physician to the king. By the descendants of this Brown, one of whom was afterwards created Lord Montague, the estate has been held to this day, and Mr. Points, who married the sole remaining heiress of this family, a Miss Brown, is now the proprietor of the estate, comprising, I believe, forty or fifty manors, the greater part of which are in this neighbourhood, some of them, however, extending more than twenty miles from the mansion. We entered the park through a great iron gateway, part of which being wanting, the gap was stopped up by a hurdle. We rode down to the house and all round about and in amongst the ruins, now in part covered with ivy, and inhabited by innumerable starlings and jackdaws. The last possessor was, I believe, that Lord Montague, who was put an end to by the celebrated nautical adventure on the Rhine, along with the brother of Sir Glory. These two sensible worthies, took it into their heads to go down a place something resembling the waterfall of an overshot mill. They were drowned, just as two young kittens or two young puppies would have been, and as an instance of the truth, that it is an ill wind that blows nobody good. Had it not been for this sensible enterprise, never would there have been a Westminster rump, to celebrate the talents and virtues of Westminster's pride and England's glory. It was this Lord Montague, I believe, who had this ancient and noble mansion completely repaired, and fitted up as a place of residence, and a few days, or a very few weeks at any rate, after the work was completed, the house was set on fire, by accident, I suppose, and left nearly in the state in which it now stands, except that the ivy has grown up about it and partly hidden the stones from our sight. You may see, however, the hour of the day or night at which the fire took place, for there still remains the brass of the face of the clock, and the hand pointing to the hour. Close by this mansion there runs a little river, which runs winding away through the valleys, and at last falls into the Arran. After viewing the ruins we had to return into the turnpike road, and then enter another part of the park, which we crossed in order to go to Petworth. When you are in a part of this road through the park, you look down and see the house in the middle of a very fine valley, the distant boundary of which, to the south and south-west, is the South Down Hills. Some of the trees here are very fine, particularly some most magnificent rows of the Spanish chestnut. I asked the people at Midhurst where Mr. Points himself lived, and they told me at the lodge in the park, which lodge was formerly the residence of the head-keeper. The land is very good about here. It is fine rich loam at top, with clay further down. It is good for all sorts of trees, and they seem to grow here very fast. We got to Petworth pretty early in the day. On entering it you see the house of Lord Egremont, which is close up against the park wall. 
and which wall bounds this little vale on two sides. There is a sort of town hall here, and on one side of it there is the bust of Charles II, I should have thought, but they tell me it is that of Sir William Wyndham, from whom Lord Egremont is descended. But there is another building much more capacious and magnificent than the town hall, namely the Bridewell, which from the modernness of its structure appears to be one of those vast improvements, ma'am, which distinguish this enlightened age. This structure vies in point of magnitude with the house of Lord Egremont itself, though that is one of the largest mansions in the whole kingdom. The Bridewell has a wall round it that I should suppose to be twenty feet high. This place was not wanted, when the labourer got twice as much instead of half as much as the common standing soldier. Here you see the true cause why the young labouring man is content to exist upon seven pence a day, for six days in the week, and nothing for Sunday. Oh, we are most free and enlightened people! Our happy constitution in church and state has supplanted popery and slavery, but we go to a bridewell unless we quietly exist and work upon seven pence a day. Thursley, Sunday, 13th November To our great delight we found Richard's horse quite well this morning, and off we set for this place. The first part of our road, for about three miles and a half, was through Lord Egremont's Park. The morning was very fine, the sun shining, a sharp frost after a foggy evening, the grass all white, the twigs of the trees white, the ponds frozen over, and everything looking exceedingly beautiful. The spot itself being one of the very finest in the world, not excepting, I dare say, that of the father of Saxe Coburg itself, who has doubtless many such fine places. In a very fine pond, not far from the house and close by the road, there are some little artificial islands, upon one of which I observed an arbutus loaded with its beautiful fruit, quite ripe, even more thickly than any one I ever saw, even in America. There were on the side of the pond a most numerous and beautiful collection of waterfowl, foreign as well as domestic. I never saw so great a variety of waterfowl collected together in my life. They had been ejected from the water by the frost, and were sitting apparently in a state of great dejection. But this circumstance has brought them into a comparatively small compass, and we, facing our horses about, sat and looked at them, at the pond, at the grass, at the house, till we were tired of admiring. Everything here is in the neatest and most beautiful state, endless herds of deer, of all the varieties of colours, and what adds greatly to your pleasure in such a case, you see comfortable retreats prepared for them in different parts of the woods. When we came to what we thought the end of the park, the gatekeeper told us that we should find other walls to pass through. We now entered upon woods. We then came to another wall, and there we entered upon farms to our right and to our left. At last we came to a third wall, and the gate in that let us out into the turnpike road. The gatekeeper here told us that the whole enclosure was nine miles round, and this, after all, forms probably not a quarter part of what this nobleman possesses. And is it wrong that one man should possess so much? By no means. But in my opinion it is wrong that a system should exist which compels this man to have his estate taken away from him, unless he throw the junior branches of his family for maintenance upon the public. Lord Egremont bears an excellent character. Everything that I have ever heard of him makes me believe that he is worthy of this princely estate. But I cannot forget that his two brothers, who are now very old men, have had from their infancy enormous revenues in sinecure places in the West Indies, while the general property and labour of England is taxed to maintain those West Indies in their state of dependence upon England. And I cannot forget that the burden of these sinecures are amongst the grievances of which the West Indians justly complain. True, the taxing system has taken from the family of Wyndham during the lives of these two gentlemen as much and even more than what that family has gained by those sinecures, but then let it be recollected that it is not the helpless people of England who have been the cause of this system. It is not the fault of those who receive seven pence a day. It is the fault of the family of Wyndham and of such persons. And if they have chosen to suffer the Jews and jobbers to take away so large a part of their income, it is not fair for them to come to the people at large to make up for the loss. Thus it has gone on. The great masses of property have in general been able to take care of themselves, but the little masses have melted away like butter before the sun. The little gentry have had not even any disposition to resist. They merit their fate most justly. They have vied with each other in endeavours to ingratiate themselves with power, and to obtain compensation for their losses. The big fishers have had no feeling for them, 
have seen them sink with a sneer rather than with compassion but at last the cormorant threatens even themselves and they are struggling with might and main for their own preservation they everywhere most liberally take the stock jobber or the jew by the hand though they hate him mortally at the same time for his power to outdo them on the sideboard on the table and in the equipage they seem to think nothing of the extinguishment of the small fry they hug themselves in the thought that they escape and yet at times their minds misgive them and they tremble for their own fate the country people really gain by the change for the small gentry have been rendered by their miseries so niggardly and so cruel that it is quite a blessing in a village to see a rich jew or jobber come to supplant them they come too with far less cunning than the half-broken gentry cunning as the stock jobber is in change alley i defy him to be cunning enough for the country people brought to their present state of duplicity by a series of cruelties which no pen can adequately describe the stock jobber goes from london with the cant of humanity upon his lips at any rate whereas the half-broken squire takes not the least pains to disguise the hardness of his heart it is impossible for any just man to regret the sweeping away of this base race of squires but the sweeping of them away is produced by causes that have a wider extent these causes reach the good as well as the bad all are involved alike like the pestilence this horrible system is no respecter of persons and decay and beggary mark the whole face of the country north chapel is a little town in the weald of sussex where there were formerly post chaises kept but where there are none kept now and here is another complete revolution in almost every country town the post chaise houses have been lessened in number and those that remain have become comparatively solitary and mean the guests at inns are not now gentlemen but bumpers who from being called at the inns riders became travellers and are now commercial gentlemen who go about in gigs instead of on horseback and who are in such numbers as to occupy a great part of the room in all the inns in every part of the country there are probably twenty thousand of them always out who may perhaps have on an average throughout the year three or four thousand ladies travelling with them the expense of this can be little short of fifteen millions a year all to be paid by the country people who consume the goods and a large part of it to be drawn up to the wind from north chapel we came to chiddingfold which is in the weald of surrey that is to say the country of oak timber between these two places there are a couple of pieces of that famous commodity called government property it seems that these places which have extensive buildings on them were for the purpose of making gunpowder like most other of these enterprises they have been given up after a time and so the ground and all the buildings and the monstrous fences erected at enormous expense have been sold they were sold it seems some time ago in lots with the intention of being pulled down and carried away though they are now nearly new and built in the most solid substantial and expensive manner brick walls eighteen inches through and the buildings covered with lead and slate it appears that they have been purchased by a mr stovel a sussex banker but for some reason or other though the purchase was made long ago government still holds the possession and what is more it keeps people there to take care of the premises it would be curious to have a complete history of these pretty establishments at chiddingford but this is a sort of history that we shall never be treated with until there be somebody in parliament to rummage things to the bottom it would be very easy to call for a specific account of the cost of these establishments and also of the quantity of powder made at them i should not be at all surprised if the concern all taken together brought the powder to a hundred times the price at which similar powder could have been purchased when we came through chiddingfold the people were just going to church and we saw a carriage and pair conveying an old gentleman and some ladies to the churchyard steps upon inquiry we found that this was lord winterton whose name they told us was turner i thought i had heard of all the lords first or last but if i had ever heard of this one before i had forgotten him he lives down in the weald between the gunpowder establishments and horsham and has the reputation of being a harmless good sort of man and that being the case i was sorry to see that he appeared to be greatly afflicted with the gout being obliged to be helped up the steps by a stout man however it is as broad perhaps as it is long a man is not to have all the enjoyments of making the gout and the enjoyments of abstinence too that would not be fair play and i dare say that lord winterton is just enough to be content with the consequences of his enjoyments this chiddingfold is a very pretty place there is a very pretty and extensive green opposite the church and we were at the proper time of the day to perceive that the modern system of education 
had by no means overlooked this little village. We saw the schools marching towards the church in military order. Two of them passed us on our road. The boys looked very hard at us, and I saluted them with, "'There's brave boys. You'll all be parsons, or lawyers, or doctors.' Another school seemed to be in a less happy state. The scholars were too much in uniform to have had their clothes purchased by their parents, and they looked, besides, as if a little more victuals and a little less education would have done as well. There were about twenty of them without one single tinge of red in their whole twenty faces. In short, I never saw more deplorable-looking objects since I was born, and can it be of any use to expend money in this sort of way upon poor creatures that have not half a bellyful of food? We had not breakfasted when we passed them. We felt at that moment what hunger was. We had some bits of bread and meat in our pockets, however, and these, which were merely intended as stay stomachs, amounted, I dare say, to the allowance of any half-dozen of these poor boys for the day. I could with all my heart have pulled the victuals out of my pocket and given it to them, but I did not like to do that which would have interrupted the march, and might have been construed into a sort of insult. To quiet my conscience, however, I gave a poor man that I met soon afterwards sixpence, under pretence of rewarding him for telling me the way to Thursley, which I knew as well as he, and which I had determined in my own mind not to follow. We had now come on the turnpike road from my Lord Egremont's Park to Chiddingfold. I had made two or three attempts to get out of it, and to bear away to the north-west, to get through the oak woods to Thursley. But I was constantly prevented by being told that the road which I wished to take would lead me to Hazelmere. If you talk to ostlers or landlords or post-boys, or indeed to almost anybody else, they mean by a road a turnpike road, and they positively will not talk to you about any other. Now just after quitting Chiddingfold, Thursley lies over fine woods and coppices, in a north-west direction or thereabouts, and the turnpike road, which goes from Petworth to Godalming, goes in a north-north-east direction. I was resolved, be the consequences what they might, not to follow the turnpike road one single inch further, for I had not above three miles or thereabouts to get to Thursley through the woods, and I had perhaps six miles at least to get to it the other way. But the great thing was to see the interior of these woods, to see the stems of the trees as well as the tops of them. I saw a lane opening in the right direction. I saw indeed that my horses must go up to their knees in clay, but I resolved to enter and go along that lane, and long before the end of my journey I found myself most amply compensated for the toil that I was about to encounter. But talk of toil! It was the horse that had the toil, and I had nothing to do but to sit upon his back, turn my head from side to side, and admire the fine trees in every direction. Little bits of fields and meadows here and there, shaded all over, or nearly all over, by the surrounding trees. Here and there a labourer's house buried in the woods. We had drawn out our luncheons and eaten them, while the horses took us through the clay. But I stopped at a little house and asked the woman, who looked very clean and nice, whether she would let us dine with her. She said yes, with all her heart, but that she had no place to put our horses in, and that her dinner would not be ready for an hour, when she expected her husband home from church. She said they had a bit of bacon and a pudding and some cabbage, but that she had not much bread in the house. She had only one child, and that was not very old. So we left her, quite convinced that my old observation is true, that people in the woodland countries are best off, and that it is absolutely impossible to reduce them to that state of starvation in which they are in the corn-growing part of the kingdom. Here is that great blessing, abundance of fuel at all times of the year, and particularly in the winter. We came on for about a mile further in these clayey lanes, when we renewed our inquiries, as to our course, as our road now seemed to point towards Godalming again. I asked a man how I should get to Thursley. He pointed to some fir-trees upon a hill, told me I must go by them, and that there was no other way. Where then, said I, is Thursley? He pointed with his hand and said, right over those woods. But there is no road there, and it is impossible for you to get through those woods. Thank you, said I, but through those woods we mean to go. Just at the border of the woods I saw a cottage. There must be some way to that cottage, and we soon found a gate that let us into a field across which we went to this cottage. We there found an old man and a young one. Upon inquiry we found that it was possible to get through these woods. Richard gave the old man threepence to buy a pint of beer, and I gave the young one a shilling to pilot us through the woods. These were oak woods with underwood beneath, and there was a little stream of water running down the middle of the woods, the annual and long overflowings of which has formed a meadow sometimes a rod wide, and sometimes twenty rods wide, while the bed of the stream itself was the most serpentine that can possibly be imagined. 
describing in many places nearly a complete circle, going round for many rods together, and coming within a rod or two of a point that it had passed before. I stopped the man several times to sit and admire this beautiful spot, shaded in great part by lofty and wide-spreading oak trees. We had to cross this brook several times, over bridges that the owner had erected for the convenience of the fox-hunters. At last we came into an ash coppice, which had been planted in regular rows, at about four feet distances, which had been once cut, and which was now in the state of six years' growth. A road through it, made for the fox-hunters, was as straight as a line, and of so great a length that on entering it, the further end appeared not to be a foot wide. Upon seeing this, I asked the man whom these coppices belonged to, and he told me to Squire Leech at Lee. My surprise ceased, but my admiration did not. A piece of ordinary coppice ground, close adjoining this, and with no timber in it, and upon just the same soil, if there had been such a piece, would, at ten years' growth, be worth at present prices, from five to seven pounds the acre. This coppice, at ten years' growth, will be worth twenty pounds the acre, and at the next cutting, when the stems will send out so many more shoots, it will be worth thirty pounds the acre. I did not ask the question when I afterwards saw Mr. Leach, but I dare say the ground was trenched before it was planted. But what is that expense when compared with the great, the permanent profit of such an undertaking? And above all things, what a convenient species of property does a man here create? Here are no tenants' rack, no anxiety about crops and seasons, the rust and the mildew never come here, a man knows what he has got, and he knows that nothing short of an earthquake can take it from him, unless indeed, by attempting to vie with the stock-jobber in the expense of living, he enable the stock-jobber to come and perform the office of the earthquake. Mr. Leach's father planted, I think it was, forty acres of such coppice in the same manner, and at the same time he sowed the ground with acorns. The acorns have become oak trees, and have begun and made great progress in diminishing the value of the ash, which have now to contend against the shade and the roots of the oak. For present profit, and indeed for permanent profit, it would be judicious to grub up the oak, but the owner has determined otherwise. He cannot endure the idea of destroying an oak wood. If such be the profit of planting ash, what would be the profit of planting locust, even for poles or stakes? The locust would outgrow the ash, as we have seen in the case of Mr. Gunter's plantation, more than three to one. I am satisfied that it will do this upon any soil, if you give the trees fifteen years to grow in, and in short that the locust will be trees when the ash are merely poles, if both are left to grow up in single stems. If in coppice the locust will make as good poles, I mean as large and as long poles in six years, as the ash will in ten years, to say nothing of the superior durability of the locust. I have seen locusts at Mr. Knowles at Thursley sufficient for a hop pole, for an ordinary hop pole, with only five years' growth in them, and leaving the last year's growth to be cut off, leaving the top of the pole three-quarters of an inch through. There is nothing that we have ever heard of, of the timber kind, equal to this in point of quickness of growth. In parts of the county where hop poles are not wanted, espalier stakes, wood for small fencing, hedge stakes, hurdle stakes, fold shores, as the people call them, are always wanted. And is it not better to have a thing that will last twenty years, than a thing that will last only three? I know of no English underwood which gives a hedge stake to last even two years. I should think that a very profitable way of employing the locust would be this. Plant a coppice, the plants two feet apart. Thus planted, the trees will protect one another against the wind. Keep the side shoots pruned off. At the end of six years, the coppice, if well planted and managed, will be at the very least twenty feet high to the tips of the trees. Not if the grass and weeds are suffered to grow up to draw the moisture up out of the ground, to keep the air from the young plants, and to intercept the gentle rains and the dews, but trench ground, planted carefully, and kept clean, and always bearing in mind that hares and rabbits and young locust trees will never live together. For the hares and rabbits will not only bite them off, but will gnaw them down to the ground, and when they have done that will scratch away the ground to gnaw into the very root. A gentleman bought some locust trees of me last year, and brought me a dismal account in the summer of their being all dead, but I have since found that they were all eaten up by the hares. He saw some of my refuse, some of those which were too bad to send to him, which were a great deal higher than his head. His ground was as good as mine, according to his account, but I had no hairs to fight against, or else mine would have been all dead too. I say, then, that a locust plantation in pretty good land, well managed, 
would be twenty feet high in six years. Suppose it, however, to be only fifteen, there would be at the bottom, wood to make two locust pins for shipbuilding. Two locust pins at the bottom of each tree. Two at the very least. And here would be twenty-two thousand locust pins to the acre. Probably enough for the building of a seventy-four gunship. These pins are about eighteen inches long, and perhaps an inch and half through. And there is a surprising quality in the wood of the locust, that it is just as hard and as durable at five or six years' growth, as it is at fifty years' growth, of which I can produce an abundance of instances. The stake which I brought home from America, and which is now at Fleet Street, had stood as a stake for about eighteen twenty years, as certified to me by Judge Mitchell of North Hampstead in Long Island, who gave me the stake, and who said to me at the time, Now are you really going to take that crooked, miserable stick to England? Now it is pretty well known, at least I have been so informed, that our government have sent to America in consequence of my writings about the locust, to endeavour to get locust pins for the navy. I have been informed that they have been told that the American government has bought them all up. Be this as it may, I know that a wagon load of these pins is, in America itself, equal in value to a wagon load of barrels of the finest flour. This being undeniable, and the fact being undeniable, that we can grow locust pins here, that I can take a seed to-day, and say that it shall produce two pins in seven years' time, will it not become an article of heavy accusation against the government, if they neglect even one day to set about tearing up their infernal Scotch firs and larches in Walmer Forest and elsewhere, and putting locust trees in their stead, in order, first, to provide this excellent material for shipbuilding, and next to have some fine plantations in the Holt Forest, Walmer Forest, the New Forest, the Forest of Dean, and elsewhere, the only possible argument against doing which being, that I may possibly take a ride round amongst their plantations, and that it may be everlastingly recorded that it was I who was the cause of the government's adopting this wise and beneficial measure. I am disposed to believe, however, that the government will not be brutish enough, obstinately to reject the advice given to them on this head, it being observed, however, that I wish to have no hand in their proceedings, directly or indirectly. I can sell all the trees that I have for sale, to other customers, let them look out for themselves, and as to any reports that their creatures may make upon the subjects, I shall be able to produce proofs enough that such reports, if unfavourable, are false. I wrote in a register from Long Island, that I could, if I would, tell insolent Castlereagh, who was for making Englishmen dig holes one day and fill them up the next, how he might profitably put something into those holes, but that I would not tell him as long as the boroughmongers should be in the state in which they then were. They are no longer in that state, I thank God. There has been no positive law to alter their state, but it is manifest that there must be such law before it be long. Events are working together to make the country worth living in, which, for the great body of the people, is at present hardly the case. Above all things in the world, it is the duty of every man who has it in his power to do what he can to promote the creation of materials for the building of ships in the best manner. And it is now a fact of perfect notoriety that, with regard to the building of ships, it cannot be done in the best manner without the assistance of this sort of wood. I have seen a specimen of the locust wood used in the making of furniture. I saw it in the post of a bedstead, and anything more handsome I never saw in my life. I had used it myself in the making of rules, but I never saw it in this shape before. It admits of a polish nearly as fine as that of box. It is a bright and beautiful yellow, and in bedsteads, for instance, it would last for ever, and would not become loose at the joints like oak and other perishable wood, because, like the live oak and the red cedar, no worm or insect ever preys upon it. There is no fear of the quantity being too great. It would take a century to make as many plantations as are absolutely wanted in England. It would be a prodigious creation of real and solid wealth. Not such a creation as that of paper money, which only takes the dinner from one man and gives it to another, which only gives an unnatural swell to a city or watering-place by beggaring a thousand villagers, but it would be a creation of money's worth things. Let any man go and look at a farmhouse that was built a hundred years ago. He will find it, though very well built with stone or brick, actually falling to pieces unless very frequently repaired, owing entirely to the rotten wood in the window-sills, the door-sills, the plates, the pins, the door-frames, the window-frames, and all those parts of the beams, the joists, and the rafters that come in contact with the rain or the moisture. The two parts of a park paling which give way first are the parts of the post that meet the ground, and the pins which hold the rails to the post. Both these rot long before the paling rots. Now all this is avoided by the use of locust as sills, as joists, as posts, as frames, and as pins. Many a roof has come down merely from the rotting of the pins. 
The best of spine oak is generally chosen for these pins, but after a time the air gets into the pinhole, the pin rots from the moist air, it gives way, the wind shakes the roof and down it comes, or it swags, the wet gets in, and the house is rotten. In ships the pins are the first things that give way. Many a ship would last twenty years after it is broken up, if put together with locust pins. I am aware that some readers will become tired of this subject, and nothing but my conviction of its being of the very first importance to the whole kingdom could make me thus dwell upon it. We got to Thursley after our beautiful ride through Mr. Leach's coppices, and the weather being pretty cold, we found ourselves most happily situated here, by the side of an American fireplace, making extremely comfortable a room which was formerly amongst the most uncomfortable in the world. This is another of what the malignant parsons call Cobbett's quackeries, but my real opinion is that the whole body of them, all put together, have never, since they were born, conferred so much benefit upon the country, as I have conferred upon it by introducing this fireplace. Mr. Judson of Kensington, who is the manufacturer of them, tells me that he has a great demand, which gives me much pleasure, but really coming to conscience. No man ought to sit by one of these fireplaces, that does not go the full length with me both in politics and religion. It is not fair for them to enjoy the warmth, without subscribing to the doctrines of the giver of the warmth. However, as I have nothing to do with Mr. Judson's affair, either as to the profit or the loss, he must sell the fireplaces to whomsoever he pleases. End of chapter 20, part 1chapter twenty part two of rural rides this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee rural rides by william cobbett chapter twenty part two kensington sunday twentieth november coming to godalming on friday where business kept us that night we had to experience at the inn the want of our American fireplace, a large and long room to sit in, with a miserable thing called a screen to keep the wind from our backs, with a smoke in the room half an hour after the fire was lighted. We, consuming a full bushel of coals in order to keep us warm, were not half so well off as we should have been in the same room, and without any screen, and with two gallons of coal, if we had our American fireplace. I gave the landlord my advice upon the subject, and he said he would go and look at the fireplace at Mr. Knowles's. That was precisely one of those rooms which stand in absolute need of such a fireplace. It is, I should think, five and thirty, or forty feet long, and pretty nearly twenty feet wide. I could sooner dine with the labouring man upon his allowance of bread, such as I have mentioned above, than I would in winter-time dine in that room upon turbot and sirloin of beef. An American fireplace with a good fire in it, would make every part of that room pleasant to dine in, in the coldest day in winter. I saw a public-house drinking-room, where the owner has tortured his invention to get a little warmth for his guests, where he fetches his coals in a wagon from a distance of twenty miles or thereabouts, and where he consumes these coals by the bushel, to effect that which he cannot effect at all, and which he might effect completely, with about a fourth part of the coals. It looked like rain on Saturday morning, we therefore sent our horses on from Godalming to Ripley, and took a post-chaise to convey us after them. Being shut up in the post-chaise did not prevent me from taking a look at a little snug house stuck under the hill on the roadside, just opposite the old chapel on St. Catherine's Hill, which house was not there when I was a boy. I found that this house is now occupied by the family Molina, for ages the owners of Loseley Park, on the outskirts of which estate this house stands. The house at Loseley is of great antiquity, and had, or perhaps has, attached to it the great manors of Godalming and Chillingfold. I believe that Sir Thomas More lived at Loseley, or at any rate that the Molyneurs are in some degree descended from him. The estate is, I fancy, theirs yet, but here they are in this little house, while one Gunning, an East Indian, I believe, occupies the house of their ancestors. At Send or Sutton, where Mr. Webb Weston inhabited, there is a baron somebody, with a der before his name, the name is German or Dutch, I believe. How the baron came there I know not, but, as I have read his name amongst the justices of the peace for the county of Surrey, he must have been born in England, or the law has been violated, 
in making him a justice of the peace, seeing that no person not born a subject of the king, and a subject in this country too, can lawfully hold a commission under the crown, either civil or military. Nor is it lawful for any man born abroad, of Scotch or Irish parents, to hold such commission under the crown, though such commissions have been held, and are held, by persons who are neither natural-born subjects of the king, nor born of English parents abroad. It should also be known and borne in mind by the people, that it is unlawful to grant any pension from the crown to any foreigner whatever, and no naturalization act can take away this disability. Yet the Whigs, as they call themselves, granted such pensions during the short time that they were in power. When we got to Ripley we found the day very fine, and we got upon our horses and rode home to dinner, after an absence of just one month, agreeably to our original intention, having seen a great deal of the country, having had a great deal of sport, and having, I trust, laid in a stock of health for the winter, sufficient to enable us to withstand the suffocation of this smoking and stinking wen. But Richard and I have done something else, besides ride and hunt and course and stare about us during this month. He was eleven years old last March, and it was now time for him to begin to know something about letters and figures. He has learned to work in the garden, and having been a good deal in the country, knows a great deal about farming affairs. He can ride anything of a horse, and over anything that a horse will go over. So expert at hunting, that his first teacher, Mr. Butt, gave the hounds up to his management in the field. But now he begins to talk about nothing but fox-hunting. That is a dangerous thing. When he and I went from home, I had business at Reigate. It was a very wet morning, and we went off long before daylight, in a post-chase, intending to have our horses brought after us. He began to talk in anticipation of the sport he was going to have, and was very inquisitive as to the probability of our meeting with fox-hounds, which gave me occasion to address him thus. Fox-hunting is a very fine thing, and very proper for people to be engaged in, and it is very desirable to be able to ride well, and to be in at the death. But that is not all. That is not everything. Any fool can ride a horse and draw a cover. Any groom or any stable-fellow, who is as ignorant as the horse, can do these things. But all gentlemen that go a fox-hunting, I hope God will forgive me for the lie, are scholars, Richard. It is not the riding nor the scarlet coats that make them gentlemen. It is their scholarship. What he thought I do not know, for he sat as mute as a fish, and I could not see his countenance. So, said I, you must now begin to learn something, and you must begin with arithmetic. He had learned from mere play to read, being first set to work of his own accord, to find out what was said about Thurtle, when all the world was talking and reading about Thurtle. This had induced us to give him Robinson Crusoe, and that had made him a passable reader. Then he had scrawled down letters and words upon paper, and had written letters to me in the strangest way imaginable. His knowledge of figures he had acquired from the necessity of knowing the several numbers upon the barrels of seeds brought from America, and the numbers upon the doors of houses, so that I had pretty nearly a blank sheet of paper to begin upon, and I have always held it to be stupidity to the last degree to attempt to put book-learning into children who are too young to reason with. I began with a pretty long lecture on the utility of arithmetic, the absolute necessity of it, in order for us to make out our accounts of the trees and seeds that we should have to sell in the winter, and the utter impossibility of our getting paid for our pains, unless we were able to make out our accounts, which accounts could not be made out, unless we understood something about arithmetic. Having thus made him understand the utility of the thing, and given him a very strong instance in the case of our nursery affairs, I proceeded to explain to him the meaning of the word arithmetic, the power of figures, according to the place they occupied. I then, for it was still dark, taught him to add a few figures together, I naming the figures one after another, while he, at the mention of each new figure, said the amount, and if incorrectly, he was corrected by me. When he had got a sum of about twenty-four, I said, Now there is another line of figures on the left of this, and therefore you are to put down the four and carry two. What is carrying? said he. I then explained to him the why and the wherefore of this, and he perfectly understood me at once. We then did several other little sums, and by the time we got to Sutton, it becoming daylight, I took a pencil and set him a little sum upon paper, which, after making a mistake or two, he did very well. 
By the time we got to Reigate he had done several more, and at last a pretty long one, with very few errors. We had business all day, and thought no more of our scholarship, until we went to bed, and then we did, in our post-chase fashion, a great many lines in arithmetic, before we went to sleep. Thus we went on, mixing our riding and hunting with our arithmetic, until we quitted Godalming, when he did a sum very nicely in multiplication of money, falling a little short of what I had laid out, which was to make him learn the four rules, in whole numbers first, and then in money, before I got home. Friends' houses are not so good as inns for executing a project like this, because you cannot very well be by yourself, and we slept but four nights at inns during our absence, so that we have actually stolen the time to accomplish this job, and Richard's journal records that he was more than fifteen days out of the thirty-one coursing or hunting. Nothing struck me more than the facility, the perfect readiness with which he at once performed addition of money. There is a pence table which boys usually learn, and during the learning of which they usually get no small number of thumps. This table I found it wholly unnecessary to set him. I had written it for him in one of the leaves of his journal-book, but upon looking at it he said, I don't want this, because, you know, I have nothing to do but to divide by twelve. That is right, said I. You are a clever fellow, Dick. And I shut up the book. Now, when there is so much talk about education, let me ask how many pounds it generally costs parents to have a boy taught this much of arithmetic, how much time it costs also, and, which is a far more serious consideration, how much mortification, and very often how much loss of health, it costs the poor, scolded, broken-hearted child, who becomes dunderheaded and dull for all his lifetime, merely because that has been imposed upon him as a task, which he ought to regard as an object of pleasant pursuit. I never even once desired him to stay a moment from any other thing that he had a mind to go at. I just wrote the sums down upon paper, laid them upon the table, and left him to tackle them when he pleased. In the case of the multiplication table, the learning of which is something of a job, and which it is absolutely necessary to learn perfectly, I advised him to go up into his bedroom, and read it twenty times over out loud every morning, before he went a-hunting, and ten times over every night after he came back, till it all came as pat upon his lips as the names of persons that he knew. He did this, and at the end of about a week he was ready to set on upon multiplication. It is the irksomeness of the thing which is the great bar to learning of every sort, I took care not to suffer irksomeness to seize his mind for a moment, and the consequence was that which I have described. I wish clearly to be understood as ascribing nothing to extraordinary natural ability. There are, as I have often said, as many sorts of men as there are of dogs, but I do not pretend to be of any peculiarly excellent sort, and I have never discovered any indications of it. There are, to be sure, sorts that are naturally stupid, but the generality of men are not so and I believe that every boy of the same age, equally healthy, and brought up in the same manner, would, unless of one of the stupid kinds, learn in just the same sort of way, but not have begun to be thumped at five or six years old, when the poor little things have no idea of the utility of anything, who are hardly sensible beings, and have but just understanding enough to know that it will hurt them if they jump down a chalk pit. I am sure from thousands of instances that have come under my own eyes, that to begin to teach children book-learning, before they are capable of reasoning, is the sure and certain way to enfeeble their minds for life, and, if they have natural genius, to cramp, if not totally to destroy that genius. I think I shall be tempted to mould into a little book these lessons of arithmetic given to Richard. I think that a boy of sense, and of age equal to that of my scholar, would derive great profit from such a little book. It would not be equal to my verbal explanations, especially accompanied with the other parts of my conduct towards my scholar. But at any rate it would be plain. It would be what a boy could understand. It would encourage him by giving him a glimpse at the reasons for what he was doing. It would contain principles, and the difference between principles and rules is this, that the former are persuasions and the latter are commands. There is a great deal of difference between carrying two for such and such a reason, and carrying two because you must carry two, you see boys that can cover reams of paper with figures, and do it with perfect correctness too, and at the same time can give you not a single reason for any part of what they have done. Now this is really doing very little. The rule is soon forgotten, and then all is forgotten. It would be the same with a lawyer that understood none of the principles of law, 
as far as he could find and remember cases exactly similar in all their parts to the case which he might have to manage he would be as profound a lawyer as any in the world but if there was the slightest difference between his case and the cases he had found upon record there would be an end to his law some people will say here is a monstrous deal of vanity and egotism and if they will tell me how such a story is to be told without exposing a man to this imputation i will adopt their mode another time i get nothing by telling the story i should get full as much by keeping it to myself but it may be useful to others and therefore i tell it nothing is so dangerous as supposing that you have eight wonders of the world i have no pretensions to any such possession i look upon my boy as being like other boys in general their fathers can teach arithmetic as well as i and if they have not a mind to pursue my method they must pursue their own let them apply to the outside of the head and to the back if they like let them bargain for thumps and the birch rod it is their affair not mine i never yet saw in my house a child that was afraid that was in any fear whatever that was ever for a moment under any sort of apprehension on account of the learning of anything and i never in my life gave a command an order a request or even advice to look into any book and i am quite satisfied that the way to make children dunces to make them detest books and justify that detestation is to tease them and bother them upon the subject as to the age at which children ought to begin to be taught it is very curious that while i was at a friend's house during my ride i looked into by mere accident a little child's abridgment of the history of england a little thing about twice as big as a crown piece even into this abridgment the historian had introduced the circumstance of alfred's father who through a mistaken notion of kindness to his son had suffered him to live to the age of twelve years without any attempt being made to give him education how came this writer to know that it was a mistaken notion ought he not rather when he looked at the result when he considered the astonishing knowledge and great deeds of alfred ought he not to have hesitated before he thus criticised the notions of the father it appears from the result that the notions of the father were perfectly correct and i am satisfied that if they had begun to thump the head of alfred when he was a child we should not at this day have heard talk of alfred the great great apologies are due to the old lady from me on account of my apparent inattention towards her during her recent or rather i may say her present fit of that tormenting disorder which as i observed before comes upon her by spells dr mcculloch may say what he pleases about her being with bairn i say it's the wet gripes and i saw a poor old mare down in hampshire in just the same way but god forbid the catastrophe should be the same for the shot pole ball for the hounds this disorder comes by spells it sometimes seems as if it were altogether going off the pulse rises and the appetite returns by and by a fresh grumbling begins to take place in the bowels these are followed by acute pains the patient becomes tremulous the pulse begins to fall and the most gloomy apprehensions begin again to be entertained at every spell the pulse does not cease falling till it becomes lower than it was brought to by the preceding spell and thus spell after spell finally produces the natural result it is useless at present to say much about the equivocating and blundering of the newspapers relative to the cause of the fall they are very shy extremely cautious become wonderfully wary with regard to this subject they do not know what to make of it they all remember that i told them that their prosperity was delusive that it would soon come to an end while they were telling me of the falsification of all my predictions i told them the small note bill had only given a respite i told them that the foreign loans and the shares and all the astonishing enterprises arose purely out of the small note bill and that a short time would see the small note bill driving the gold out of the country and bring us back to another restriction or to wheat at four shillings a bushel they remember that i told them all this and now some of them begin to regard me as the principal cause of the present embarrassments this is pretty work indeed what i the poor deluded creature whose predictions were all falsified who knew nothing at all about such matters who was a perfect peddler in political economy who was a conceited and obstinate old dotard as that polite and enlightened paper the morning herald called me is it possible that such a poor miserable creature can have had the power to produce effects so prodigious yet this really appears to be the opinion of one at least of these mr brougham's best possible public instructors the public ledger of the sixteenth of november has the following passage 
It is fully ascertained that the country banking establishments in England have latterly been compelled to limit their paper circulation, for the writings of Mr. Cobbett are widely circulated in the agricultural districts, and they have been so successful as to induce the boobies to call for gold in place of country paper, a circumstance which has produced a greater effect on the currency than any exportation of the precious metals to the continent, either of Europe or America, could have done, although it too must have contributed to render money for a season scarce. And so the boobies call for gold instead of country banknotes. Bless the boobies! I wish they would do it to a greater extent, which they would if they were not so dependent as they are upon the ragmen. But does the public ledger think that those unfortunate creatures who suffered the other day at Plymouth would have been boobies if they had gone and got sovereigns before the banks broke? This brother of the broadsheet should act justly and fairly as I do. He should ascribe these demands for gold to Mr. Jones of Bristol, and not to me. Mr. Jones taught the boobies that they might have gold for asking for, or send the ragmen to jail. It is Mr. Jones, therefore, that they should blame, and not me. But seriously speaking, what a mess! What a pickle! What a horrible mess must the thing be in, if any man, or any thousand of men, or any hundred thousand of men, can change the value of money, unhinge all contracts and all engagements, and plunge the pecuniary affairs of a nation into confusion. I have been often accused of wishing to be thought the cleverest man in the country, but surely it is no vanity, for vanity means unjust pretension, for me to think myself the cleverest man in the country, if I can, of my own head, and at my own pleasure, produce effects like these. Truth, however, and fair dealing with my readers, call upon me to disclaim so haughty a pretension, I have no such power as this public instructor ascribes to me. Greater causes are at work to produce such effects, causes wholly uncontrollable by me, and what is more, wholly uncontrollable in the long run by the government itself, though heartily cooperating with the bank directors. These united can do nothing to arrest the progress of events. Peel's bill produced the horrible distresses of 1822. The part repeal of that bill produced a respite, that respite is now about to expire, and neither government nor bank, nor both joined together, can prevent the ultimate consequences. They may postpone them for a little, but mark, every postponement will render the catastrophe the more dreadful. I see everlasting attempts by the instructor to cast blame upon the bank. I can see no blame in the bank. The bank has issued no small notes, though it has liberty to do it. The bank pays in gold agreeably to the law. What more does anybody want with the bank? The bank lends money, I suppose, when it chooses, and is not it to be the judge when it shall lend and when it shall not? The bank is blamed for putting out paper and causing high prices, and blamed at the same time for not putting out paper to accommodate merchants and keep them from breaking. It cannot be to blame for both, and indeed it is blamable for neither. It is the fellows that put out the paper and then break that do the mischief. However, a breaking merchant whom the bank will no longer prop up, will naturally blame the bank, just as every insolvent blames a solvent that will not lend him money. When the foreign loans first began to go on, Peter McCullough and all the Scotch were cock-a-hoop. They said that there were prodigious advantages in lending money to South America, that the interest would come home to enrich us, that the amount of the loans would go out chiefly in English manufactures, that the commercial gains would be enormous, and that this country would thus be made rich and powerful and happy by employing in this way its surplus capital, and thereby contributing at the same time to the uprooting of despotism and superstition, and the establishing of freedom and liberality in their stead. Unhappy and purblind, I could not for the life of me see the matter in this light. My perverted optics could perceive no surplus capital in bundles of banknotes, I could see no gain in sending out goods which somebody in England was to pay for, without, as it appeared to me, the smallest chance of ever being paid again. I could see no chance of gain in the purchase of a bond, nominally bearing interest at six per cent, and on which, as I thought, no interest at all would ever be paid. I despised the idea of paying bits of paper by bits of paper. I knew that a bond, though said to bear six per cent interest, was not worth a farthing, unless some interest were paid upon it. I declared, when Spanish bonds were at seventy-five, that I would not give a crown for a hundred pounds in them, if I were compelled to keep them unsold for seven years, and I now declare, as to South American bonds, I think them of less value than the Spanish bonds now are, 
if the owner be compelled to keep them unsold for a year. It is very true that these opinions agree with my wishes, but they have not been created by those wishes. They are founded on my knowledge of the state of things, and upon my firm conviction of the folly of expecting that the interest of these things will ever come from the respective countries to which they relate. Mr. Canning's dispatch, which I shall insert below, has doubtless had a tendency, whether expected or not, to prop up the credit of these sublime speculations. The propping up of the credit of them can, however, do no sort of good. The keeping up the price of them, for the present, may assist some of the actual speculators, but it can do nothing for the speculation in the end. And this speculation, which was wholly an effect of the small note bill, will finally have a most ruinous effect. How is it to be otherwise? Have we ever received any evidence, or anything whereon to build a belief, that the interest on these bonds will be paid? Never! And the man must be mad, mad with avarice or love of gambling, that could advance his money upon any such a thing as these bonds. The fact is, however, that it was not money, it was paper, it was borrowed or created, for the purpose of being advanced. Observe, too, that when the loans were made, money was at a lower value than it is now. Therefore, those who would have to pay the interest would have too much to pay if they were to fulfil their engagement. Mr. Canning's state paper clearly proves to me that the main object of it is to make the loans to South America finally be paid because, if they be not paid, not only is the amount of them lost to the bondholders, but there is an end at once to all that brilliant commerce with which that shining minister appears to be so much enchanted. All the silver and gold, all the Mexican and Peruvian dreams vanish in an instant and leave behind the wretched cotton lords and wretched Jews and jobbers to go to the workhouse or to Botany Bay. The whole of the loans are said to amount to about twenty-one or twenty-two millions. It is supposed that twelve millions have actually been sent out in goods. These goods have perhaps been paid for here, but they have been paid for out of English money or by English promises. The money to pay with has come from those who gave money for the South American bonds, and these bondholders are to be repaid, if repaid at all, by the South Americans. If not paid at all, then England will have sent away twelve millions worth of goods for nothing, and this would be the Scotch way of obtaining enormous advantages for the country by laying out its surplus capital in foreign loans. I shall conclude this subject by inserting a letter which I find in the morning chronicle of the 18th instant. I perfectly agree with the writer. The editor of the morning chronicle does not, as appears by the remark which he makes at the head of it, but I shall insert the whole, his remark and all, and add a remark or two of my own. See Register, Volume 56, page 556. This is a pretty round sum, a sum the very naming of which would make anybody but half-mad Englishmen stare. To make comparisons with our own debt would have little effect, that being so monstrous that every other sum shrinks into nothingness at the sight of it. But let us look at the United States, for they have a debt, and a debt is a debt, and this debt of the United States is often cited as an apology for ours, even the parsons having at last come to cite the United States as presenting us with a system of perfection. What, then, is this debt of the United States? Why, it was on the 1st of January, 1824, this 90,177,962, that is to say dollars, that is to say at four shillings and sixpence the dollar, just twenty millions sterling that is to say, five hundred and ninety-four thousand pounds less than our surplus capital men have lent to the South Americans. But now let us see what is the net revenue of this same United States. Why, twenty million five hundred thousand seven hundred and fifty-five, that is to say, in sterling money, three millions three hundred and thirty thousand, and some odd hundreds, that is to say, almost to a mere fraction, a sixth part of the whole gross amount of the debt. Observe this well, that the whole of the debt amounts to only six times as much as one single year's net revenue. Then again, look at the exports of the United States. These exports in one single year amount to $74,699,030, and in pounds sterling, £16,599,783. Now, what can the South American states show in this way? Have they any exports, or at least... Have they any that any man can speak of with certainty? Have they any revenue wherewith to pay the interest of a debt, 
when they are borrowing the very means of maintaining themselves now against the bare name of their king. We are often told that the Americans borrowed their money to carry on their revolutionary war with. Money, aye, a farthing is money, and a double sovereign is no more than money, but surely some regard is to be had to the quantity, some regard is to be had to the amount of the money, and is there any man in his senses that will put the half million which the Americans borrowed of the Dutch in competition, that will name on the same day this half million, with the twenty-one millions and a half borrowed by the South Americans, as above stated? In short, it is almost to insult the understandings of my readers, to seem to institute any comparison between the two things, and nothing in the world, short of this gambling, this unprincipled, this maddening paper-money system, could have made men look with patience for one single moment at loans like these, tossed into the air with the hope and expectation of repayment. However, let the bond-owners keep their bonds, let them feel the sweets of the small-note bill, and of the consequent puffing up of the English funds. The affair is theirs. They have rejected my advice. They have listened to the broadsheet, and let them take all the consequences. Let them with all my heart die with starvation, and as they expire, let them curse Mr. Brougham's best possible public instructor. Apusband, Hampshire, Thursday, 24th August, 1826. We left Berkeley last evening in the rain, but as our distance was only about seven miles, the consequence was little. The crops of corn, except oats, have been very fine hereabouts, and there are never any peas, nor any beans, grown here. The same foreign fields, though on these high lands, and though the dry weather has been of such long continuance, look as green as watered meadows, and a great deal more brilliant and beautiful. I have often described this beautiful village, which lies in a deep dell, and its very variously shaped environs, in my register of November 1822. This is one of those countries of chalk and flint and dry top soil, and hard roads and high and bare hills and deep dells, with clumps of lofty trees here and there, which are so many rookeries. This is one of those countries, or rather approaching towards those countries, of downs and flocks of sheep, which I like so much, which I always get to when I can, and which many people seem to flee from, as naturally as men flee from pestilence. They call such countries naked and barren, though they are in the summer months actually covered with meat and with corn. I saw the other day in the Morning Herald, London Best Public Instructor, that all those had deceived themselves who had expected to see the price of agricultural produce brought down by the lessening of the quantity of paper money. Now, in the first place, corn is, on an average, a seventh lower in price than it was last year at this time, and what would it have been if the crop and the stock had now been equal to what they were last year? All in good time, therefore, good Mr. Thwaites. Let us have a little time. The best public instructors have as yet only fallen in number sold about a third since this time last year. Give them a little time, good Mr. Thwaites, and you'll see them come down to your heart's content. Only let us fairly see an end to small notes, and there will soon be not two daily best public instructors left in all the entire great British Empire. But as man is not to live on bread alone, so corn is not the only thing that the owners and occupiers of the land have to look to. There are timber, bark, underwood, wool, hides, pigs, sheep, and cattle. All those together make an amount four times the corn, at the very least. I know that all these have greatly fallen in price since last year, but I am in a sheep and wool country, and can speak positively as to them, which are two articles of very great importance. As to sheep, I am speaking of South Downs, which are the great stock of these counties. As to sheep, they have fallen one-third in price since last August, lambs as well as ewes, and as to the wool, it sold in 1824 at forty shillings a tod. It sold last year at thirty-five shillings a tod, and it now sells at nineteen shillings a tod. A tod is twenty-eight pounds avoirdupois weight, so that the price of South Down wool now is eight pence a pound and a fraction over, and this is, I believe, cheaper than it has ever been known within the memory of the oldest man living. The best public instructor may perhaps think that sheep and wool are a trifling affair. There are many thousands of farmers who keep each a flock of at least a thousand sheep, a new yields about three pounds of wool, a weather four pounds, a ram seven pounds. Calculate, good Mr. Thwaites, what a difference it is when this wool becomes eight pence a pound instead of seventeen pence, and instead of thirty pence, as it was not many years ago. 
In short, every middling sheep farmer receives this year about two hundred and fifty pounds less, as the produce of sheep and wool, than he received last year, and on average two hundred and fifty pounds is more than half his rent. There is a great falling off in the price of horses, and of all cattle except fat cattle, and observe, when the prospect is good, it shows a rise in the price of lean cattle, not in that of the meat which is just ready to go into the mouth. Prices will go on gradually falling, as they did from 1819 to 1822 inclusive, unless upheld by untoward seasons, or by an issue of assignats. For mine, it would be no joke, no sham, this time. It would be an issue of as real as bona fide assignats, as ever came from the mint of any set of rascals, that ever robbed and enslaved a people in the names of liberty and law. East Everly, Wiltshire, Sunday, 27th August, evening. We set off from Uphusband on Friday, about ten o'clock, the morning having been wet. My sons came round in the chase by Andover and Wayhill, while I came right across the country towards Ludgars Hall, which lies in the road from Andover to this place. I never knew the flies so troublesome in England as I found them in this ride. I was obliged to carry a great bow and to keep it in constant motion, in order to make the horse peaceable enough to enable me to keep on his back. It is a country of fields, lanes, and high hedges, so that no wind could come to relieve my horse, and in spite of all I could do a great part of him was covered with foam from the sweat. In the midst of this I got at one time a little out of my road, in or near a place called Tangley. I rode up to the garden wicket of a cottage and asked the woman, who had two children, and who seemed to be about thirty years old, which was the way to Ludgar's Hall, which I knew could not be more than about four miles off. She did not know, a very neat, smart and pretty woman, but she did not know the way to this rotten borough, which was, I was sure, only about four miles off. Well, my dear good woman, said I, but you have been at Ludgar's Hall? No. Nor at Andover? Six miles another way? No. Nor at Marlborough? Nine miles another way? No. "'Pray, were you born in this house?' "'Yes. "'And how far have you ever been from this house?' "'Oh, I have been up in the parish and over to shoot. "'That is to say, the utmost extent of her voyages "'had been about two and a half miles. "'Let no one laugh at her, and above all others, let not me, "'who am convinced that the facilities which now exist "'of moving human bodies from place to place "'are amongst the curses of the country, "'the destroyers of industry, of morals, and of course of happiness.' It is a great error to suppose that people are rendered stupid by remaining always in the same place. This was a very acute woman, and as well behaved as need to be. There was in July last, last month, a Preston man, who had never been further from home than Chorley, about eight or ten miles, and who started off on foot and went alone to Rouen in France, and back again to London in the space of about ten days, and that too without being able to speak or to understand a word of French. M.B., those gentlemen who at Green Street in Kent were so kind to this man, upon finding that he had voted for me, will be pleased to accept of my best thanks. Wilding, that is the man's name, was full of expressions of gratitude towards these gentlemen. He spoke of others who were good to him on his way, and even at Calais he found friends on my account, but he was particularly loud in his praises of the gentlemen in Kent, who had been so good and so kind to him, that he seemed quite in an ecstasy when he talked of their conduct. Before I got to the rotten borough I came out upon a down, just on the border of the two counties, Hampshire and Wiltshire. Here I came up with my sons, and we entered the rotten borough together. It contained some rashers of bacon, and a very civil landlady, but it is one of the most mean and beggarly places that man ever set his eyes on. The curse attending corruption seems to be upon it. The look of the place would make one swear that there never was a clean shirt in it since the first stone of it was laid. It must have been a large place once, though it now contains only 479 persons, men, women, and children. The borough is, as to all practical purposes, as much private property as this pen is my private property. Ay, ay, let the petitioners of Manchester bawl as long as they like against all other evils, but until they touch this master evil, they do nothing at all. Everly is but about three miles from Ludgars Hall, so that we got here in the afternoon of Friday, and in the evening a very heavy storm came and drove away all flies, and made the air delightful. This is a real down country. Here you see miles and miles square without a tree or hedge or bush. It is country of greensward. This is the most famous place in all England for coursing. 
I was here at this very inn with a party eighteen years ago, and the landlord, who was still the same, recognised me as soon as he saw me. There were forty brace of greyhounds taken out into the field on one of the days, and every brace had one course and some of them two. The ground is the finest in the world, from two to three miles for the hare to run to cover, and not a stone nor a bush nor a hillock. It was here proved to me that the hare is by far the swiftest of all English animals, for I saw three hares in one day run away from the dogs. To give dog and hare a fair trial there should be but one dog, then if that dog got so close as to compel the hare to turn, that would be a proof that the dog ran fastest. When the dog or dogs never get near enough to the hare to induce her to turn, she said, and very justly, to run away from them, and as I saw three hares do this in one day, I conclude that the hare is the swiftest animal of the two. This inn is one of the nicest, and in summer one of the pleasantest in England, for I think that my experience in this way will justify me in speaking thus positively. The house is large, the yard and the stables good, the landlord a farmer also, and therefore no cribbing your horses in hay or straw, and yourself in eggs and cream. The garden, which adjoins the south side of the house, is large, of good shape, has a terrace on one side, lies on the slope, consists of well-disposed clumps of shrubs and flowers, and of short grass very neatly kept. In the lower part of the garden there are high trees, and amongst these the tulip-tree and the live-oak. Beyond the garden is a large clump of lofty sycamores, and in these a most populous rookery, in which of all things in the world I delight. The village, which contains three hundred and one souls, lies to the north of the inn, but adjoining its premises. All the rest in every direction is bare down or open arable. I am now sitting at one of the southern windows of this inn, looking across the garden towards the rookery. It is nearly sun-setting. The rooks are skimming and curving over the tops of the trees, while under the branches I see a flock of several hundred sheep coming nibbling their way in from the down and going to their fold. Now what ill-natured devil could bring old Nick Grimshaw into my head in company with these innocent sheep? Why, the truth is this, nothing is so swift as thought. It runs over a lifetime in a moment. And while I was writing the last sentence of the foregoing paragraph, thought took me up at the time when I used to wear a smock-frock and to carry a wooden bottle, like that shepherd's boy, and in an instant it hurried me along through my no very short life of adventure, of toil, of peril, of pleasure, of ardent friendship, and not less ardent enmity, and after filling me with wonder, that a heart and mind so wrapped up in everything belonging to the gardens, the fields, and the woods, should have been condemned to waste themselves away, amidst the stench, the noise, and the strife of cities, it brought me to the present moment, and sent my mind back to what I have yet to perform about Nicholas Grimshaw and his ditches. My sons set off about three o'clock to-day, on their way to Herefordshire, where I intend to join them, where I have had a pretty good ride in this country. There is no pleasure in travelling except on horseback or on foot. Carriages take your body from place to place, and if you merely want to be conveyed they are very good, but they enable you to see and to know nothing at all of the country. East Everly, Monday morning, five o'clock, 28th August, 1826. A very fine morning. A man, eighty-two years of age, just beginning to mow the short grass in the garden. I thought it, even when I was young, the hardest work that man had to do. To look on, this work seems nothing, but it tries every sinew in your frame, if you go upright and do your work well. This old man never knew how to do it well, and he stoops, and he hangs his scythe wrong, but with all this it must be a surprising man to mow short grass as well as he does at eighty. I wish I may be able to mow short grass at eighty. That's all I have to say of the matter. I am just setting off for the source of the Avon, which runs from near Marlborough to Salisbury, and thence to the sea and I intend to pursue it as far as Salisbury. In the distance of thirty miles, here are, I see by the books, more than thirty churches. I wish to see with my own eyes what evidence there is that those thirty churches were built without hands, without money, and without a congregation, and thus to find matter, if I can, to justify the mad wretches who from committee rooms and elsewhere are bothering this half-distracted nation to death about a surplus population, mon. My horse is ready, and the rooks are just gone off to the stubble-fields. These rooks rob the pigs, but they have a right to do it. I wonder, upon my soul I do, that there is no lawyer, Scotchman, or parson justice to propose a law to punish the rooks for trespass. End of chapter 20, part 2
Chapter Twenty One of Rural Rides. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Rural Rides by William Cobbett. Chapter Twenty One. Ride down the valley of the Avon in Wiltshire. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn, and the labourer is worthy of his reward. Deuteronomy, chapter 25, verse 4, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 9, 1 Timothy 5, verse 9. Milton, Monday, 28th August. I came off this morning on the Marlborough Road about two miles or three, and then turned off over the downs in a north-westerly direction, in search of the source of the Avon River, which goes down to Salisbury. I had once been at Nether Avon, a village in this valley, but I had often heard this valley described as one of the finest pieces of land in all England. I knew that there were about thirty parish churches, standing in a length of about thirty miles, and in an average width of hardly a mile, and I was resolved to see a little into the reasons that could have induced our fathers to build all these churches, especially if, as the Scotch would have us believe, there were but a mere handful of people in England, until of late years. The first part of my ride this morning was by the side of Sir John Astley's Park. This man is one of the members of the county, Gallenlove Bennett being the other. They say that he is good to the labouring people, and he ought to be good for something, being a member of Parliament, of the Lethbridge and Dickinson stamp. However, he has got a thumping estate, though it be borne in mind. The working people and the fundholders and the dead weight have each their separate mortgage upon it of which this baronet has, I dare say, too much justice to complain, seeing that the amount of these mortgages was absolutely necessary to carry on Pitt and Percival and Castlereagh wars, to support Hanoverian soldiers in England, to fight and beat the Americans on the Serpentine River, to give Wellington a kingly estate, and to defray the expenses of Manchester and other yeomanry cavalry besides all the various charges of power of imprisonment bills and of six acts, these being the cause of the mortgages, the worthy baronet has, I will engage, too much justice to complain of them. In steering across the down, I came to a large farm, which a shepherd told me was Milton Hill Farm. This was upon the high land, and before I came to the edge of this valley of Avon, which was my land of promise, or at least of great expectation, for I could not imagine that thirty churches had been built for nothing by the side of a brook, for it is no more during the greater part of the way, thirty miles long. The shepherd showed me the way towards Milton, and at the end of about a mile, from the top of a very high part of the down, with a steep slope towards the valley, I first saw this valley of Avon, and a most beautiful sight it was. Villages, hamlets, large farms, towers, steeples, fields, meadows, orchards, and very fine timber trees, scattered all over the valley. The shape of the thing is this. On each side downs, very lofty and steep in some places, and sloping miles back in other places, but each outside of the valley are downs. From the edge of the downs begin capital arable fields, generally of very great dimensions, and in some places running a mile or two back into little cross valleys, formed by hills of downs. After the cornfields come meadows, on each side, down to the brook or river. The farmhouses, mansions, villages, and hamlets are generally situated in that part of the arable land, which comes nearest the meadows. Great as my expectations had been, they were more than fulfilled. I delight in this sort of country, and I had frequently seen the vale of the Itchen, that of the Bourne, and also that of the Test in Hampshire. I had seen the vales amongst the South Downs, but I never before saw anything to please me like this valley of the Avon. I sat upon my horse, and looked over Milton and Easton and Pusey for half an hour, though I had not breakfasted. The hill was very steep. A road going slanting down it was still so steep, and washed so very deep by the rains of ages, that I did not attempt to ride down it, and I did not like to lead my horse, the path was so narrow. So seeing a boy with a drove of pigs, going out to the stubbles, I beckoned him to come up to me, and he came and led my horse down for me. Endless is the variety in the shape of the high lands which form this valley. Sometimes the slope is very gentle, 
and the arable lands go back very far. At others the downs come out into the valley, almost like piers into the sea, being very steep in their sides, as well as their ends towards the valley. They have no slope at their other ends, indeed they have no back ends, but run into the main high land. There is also great variety in the width of the valley, great variety in the width of the meadows, but the land appears all to be of the very best, and it must be so, for the farmers confess it. It seemed to me that one way, and that not perhaps the least striking, of exposing the folly, the stupidity, the inanity, the presumption, the insufferable emptiness and insolence and barbarity of those numerous wretches who have now the audacity to propose to transport the people of England upon the principle of the monster Malthus, who has furnished the unfeeling oligarchs and their toad-eaters with the pretence that man has a natural propensity to breed faster than food can be raised for the increase, it seemed to me that one way of exposing this mixture of madness and of blasphemy was to take a look, now that the harvest is in, at the produce, the mouths, the condition, and the changes that have taken place in a spot like this, which God has favoured with every good that he has had to bestow upon man. From the top of the hill I was not a little surprised to see, in every part of the valley that my eye could reach, a dew, a large portion of fields of Swedish turnips, all looking extremely well. I had found the turnips of both sorts by no means bad, from Salt Hill to Newbury, but from Newbury through Berkeley, Highclere, Uphusband and Tangley, I had seen but few. At and about Ludgars Hall and Everley, I had seen hardly any. But when I came this morning to Milton Hill Farm, I saw a very large field of what appeared to me to be fine Swedish turnips. In the valley, however, I found them much finer, and the fields were very beautiful objects, forming, as their colour did, so great a contrast with that of the fallows and the stubbles, which latter are this year singularly clean and bright. Having gotten to the bottom of the hill, I proceeded on to the village of Milton. I left Easton away at my right, and I did not go up to Watton Rivers, where the river Avon rises, and which lies just close to the south-west corner of Marlborough Forest, and at about five or six miles from the town of Marlborough. Lower down the river, as I thought, there lived a friend who was a great farmer, and whom I intended to call on, it being my way, however, always to begin making inquiries soon enough. I asked the pig-driver where this friend lived, and to my surprise I found that he lived in the parish of Milton. After riding up to the church, as being the centre of the village, I went on towards the house of my friend, which lay on my road down the valley. I have many, many times witnessed agreeable surprise, but I do not know that I ever in the whole course of my life saw people so much surprised and pleased as this farmer and his family were, at seeing me. People often tell you that they are glad to see you, and in general they speak truth. I take pretty good care not to approach any house, with the smallest appearance of a design to eat or drink in it, unless I be quite sure of a cordial reception. But my friend at Fifield, it is in Milton Parish, and all his family really seem to be delighted beyond all expression. When I set out this morning I intended to go all the way down to the city of Salisbury to-day, but I soon found that to refuse to sleep at Fifield would cost me a great deal more trouble than a day was worth, so that I made my mind up to stay in this farmhouse, which has one of the nicest gardens, and it contains some of the finest flowers that I ever saw, and all is disposed with as much good taste as I have ever witnessed. Here I am, then, just going to bed, after having spent as pleasant a day as I ever spent in my life. I have heard to-day that Birkbeck lost his life by attempting to cross a river on horseback but if what I have heard besides be true, that life must have been hardly worth preserving, for they say that he was reduced to a very deplorable state, and I have heard from what I deem unquestionable authority, that his two beautiful and accomplished daughters are married to two common labourers, one a Yankee and the other an Irishman, neither of whom has probably a second shirt to his back, or a single pair of shoes to put his feet into. These poor girls owe their ruin and misery, if my information be correct." and at any rate hundreds besides Birkbeck himself, owe their utter ruin, the most scandalous degradation, together with great bodily suffering, to the vanity, the conceit, the presumption of Birkbeck, who, observe, richly merited all that he suffered, not excepting his death, for he sinned with his eyes open, he rejected all advice, he persevered after he saw his error, he dragged thousands into ruin along with him, and he most vilely calumniated the man who, after having most disinterestedly but in vain endeavoured to preserve him from ruin, 
endeavoured to preserve those who were in danger of being deluded by him. When, in 1817, before he set out for America, I was, in Catherine Street, Strand, London, so earnestly pressing him not to go to the back countries, he had one of these daughters with him. After talking to him for some time, and describing the risks and disadvantages of the back countries, I turned towards the daughter, and in a sort of joking way said, "'Miss Birkbeck, take my advice. Don't let anybody get you more than twenty miles from Boston, New York, Philadelphia, or Baltimore.' upon which he gave me a most dignified look, and observed, "'Miss Birkbeck has a father, sir, whom she knows it to be her duty to obey.' This snap was enough for me. I saw that this was a man so full of self-conceit, that it was impossible to do anything with him. He seemed to me to be bent upon his own destruction. I thought it my duty to warn others of their danger. Some took the warning, others did not. But he and his brother adventurer Flower never forgave me and they resorted to all the means in their power to do me injury. They did me no injury, no thanks to them, and I have seen them most severely but most justly punished. Amesbury, Tuesday, 29th August I set off from Fifield this morning and got here about one o'clock, with my clothes wet. While they are drying, and while a mutton chop is getting ready, I sit down to make some notes of what I have seen since I left Enford. But here comes my dinner, and I must put off my notes till I have dined. Salisbury, Wednesday, 30th August. My ride yesterday from Milton to this city of Salisbury was, without any exception, the most pleasant. It brought before me the greatest number of, to me, interesting objects, and it gave rise to more interesting reflections than I remember ever to have had brought before my eyes or into my mind in any one day of my life, and therefore this ride was, without any exception, the most pleasant that I ever had in my life as far as my recollection serves me. I got a little wet in the middle of the day, but I got dry again, and I arrived here in very good time, though I went over the accursed hill, Old Sarum, and went across to Laverstoke, before I came to Salisbury. Let us now, then, look back over this part of Wiltshire, and see whether the inhabitants ought to be transported by order of the Emigration Committee, of which we shall see and say more by and by. I have before described this valley generally, let me now speak of it a little more in detail. The farms are all large, and generally speaking, they were always large, I dare say, because sheep is one of the great things here, and sheep in a country like this must be kept in flocks to be of any profit. The sheep principally manure the land. This is to be done only by folding, and to fold you must have a flock. Every farm has its portion of down, arable, and meadow, and in many places the latter are watered meadows, which is a great resource where sheep are kept in flocks because these meadows furnish grass for the suckling ewes, early in the spring, and indeed because they have always food in them for sheep and cattle of all sorts. These meadows have had no part of the suffering from the drought this year. They fed the ewes and lambs in the spring, and they are now yielding a heavy crop of hay, for I saw men mowing in them in several places, particularly about Netheravon, though it was raining at the time. The turnips look pretty well all the way down the valley, but I see very few except Swedish turnips. The early common turnips very nearly all failed, I believe, but the stubbles are beautifully bright, and the rickyards tell us that the crops are good, especially of wheat. This is not a country of peas and beans, nor of oats except for home consumption. The crops are wheat, barley, wool, and lambs, and these latter not to be sold to butchers, but to be sold at the great fairs, to those who are going to keep them for some time, whether to breed from, or finally to fat for the butcher. It is the pulse and the oats that appear to have failed most this year, and therefore this valley has not suffered. I do not perceive that they have many potatoes, but what they have of this base root seem to look well enough. It was one of the greatest villains upon earth, Sir Walter Raleigh, who, they say, first brought this root into England. He was hanged at last. What a pity since he was to be hanged. The hanging did not take place before he became such a mischievous devil, as he was in the latter two-thirds of his life. The stackyards down this valley are beautiful to behold. They contain from five to fifteen banging wheat ricks, besides barley ricks and hay ricks, and also besides the contents of the barns, many of which exceed a hundred, some two hundred, and I saw one at Pusey and another at Fittleton, each of which exceeded two hundred and fifty feet in length. At a farm, which in the old maps is called Chisenbury Priory, I think I counted twenty-seven ricks of one sort and another, and sixteen or eighteen of them wheat ricks. I could not conveniently get to the yard, without longer delay than I wished to make, but I could not be much out in my counting. 
A very fine sight this was, and it could not meet the eye without making one look round, and in vain, to see the people who were to eat all this food, and without making one reflect on the horrible, the unnatural, the base and infamous state in which we must be when projects are on foot, and are openly avowed for transporting those who raise this food because they want to eat enough of it to keep them alive, and when no project is on foot for transporting the idlers who live in luxury upon this same food, when no project is on foot for transporting pensioners, parsons, or dead-weight people. A little while before I came to this farmyard, I saw in one piece about four hundred acres of wheat stubble, and I saw a sheepfold which I thought contained an acre of ground, and had in it about four thousand sheep and lambs. The fold was divided into three separate flocks, but the piece of ground was one and the same, and I thought it contained about an acre. At one farm between Pusey and Uphaven, I counted more than three hundred hogs in one stubble. This is certainly the most delightful farming in the world. No ditches, no water furrows, no drains, hardly any hedges, no dirt and mire, even in the wettest seasons of the year. And though the downs are naked and cold, the valleys are snugness itself. They are, as to the downs, what ha-has are in parks or lawns. When you are going over the downs, you look over the valleys, as in the case of the ha-ha, and if you be not acquainted with the country, your surprise, when you come to the edge of the hill, is very great. The shelter in these valleys, and particularly where the downs are steep and lofty on the sides, is very complete. Then the trees are everywhere lofty. They are generally elms with some ashes, which delight in the soil that they find here. There are almost always two or three large clumps of trees in every parish, and a rookery or two, not rag rookery, to every parish. By the water's edge there are willows, and to almost every farm there is a fine orchard, the trees being in general very fine, and this year they are in general well loaded with fruit. So that all taken together it seems impossible to find a more beautiful and pleasant country than this, or to imagine any life more easy and happy than men might here lead, if they were untormented by an accursed system that takes the food from those that raise it, and gives it to those that do nothing that is useful to man. Here the farmer has always an abundance of straw, his farmyard is never without it. Cattle and horses are bedded up to their eyes. The yards are put close under the shelter of a hill, or are protected by lofty and thick-set trees. Every animal seems comfortably situated, and in the dreariest days of winter these are perhaps the happiest scenes in the world, or rather they would be such if those whose labour makes it all, trees, corn, sheep, and everything, had but their fair share of the produce of that labour. What share they really have of it one cannot exactly say, but I should suppose that every labouring man in this valley raises as much food as would suffice for fifty or a hundred persons, fed like himself. At a farm at Milton there were, according to my calculation, six hundred quarters of wheat and twelve hundred quarters of barley, of the present year's crop. The farm keeps, on an average, fourteen hundred sheep. It breeds and rears an usual proportion of pigs, fats the usual proportion of hogs and I suppose rears and fats the usual proportion of poultry. Upon inquiry I found that this farm was in point of produce about one-fifth of the parish. Therefore the land of this parish produces annually about three thousand quarters of wheat, six thousand quarters of barley, the wool of seven thousand sheep together with the pigs and poultry. Now then, leaving green or moist vegetables out of the question, as being things that human creatures, and especially labouring human creatures, ought never to use as sustenance, and saying nothing at present, about milk and butter, leaving these wholly out of the question, let us see how many people the produce of this parish would keep, supposing the people to live all alike, and to have plenty of food and clothing. In order to come at the fact here, let us see what would be the consumption of one family. Let it be a family of five persons, a man, wife, and three children, one child big enough to work, one big enough to eat heartily, and one a baby and this is a pretty fair average of the state of people in the country. Such a family would want five pounds of bread a day. They would want a pound of mutton a day. They would want two pounds of bacon a day. They would want, on an average, winter and summer, a gallon and a half of beer a day, for I mean that they should live without the aid of the eastern or the western slave-drivers. If sweets were absolutely necessary for the baby, there would be quite honey enough in the parish. Now then, to begin with the bread, a pound of good wheat makes a pound of good bread. For though the offal be taken out, the water is put in, and indeed the fact is that a pound of wheat will make a pound of bread, leaving the offal of the wheat to feed pigs, or other animals, and to produce other human food in this way. 
The family would then use £1,825 of wheat in the year, which at £60 a bushel would be, leaving out a fraction, 30 bushels or three quarters and six bushels for the year. Next comes the mutton, £365 for the year. Next the bacon, £730. As to the quantity of mutton produced, the sheep are bred here and not fatted in general, but we may fairly suppose that each of the sheep kept here, each of the standing stock, makes first or last half a fat sheep, so that a farm that keeps on an average one hundred sheep produces annually fifty fat sheep. Suppose the mutton to be fifteen pounds a quarter, then the family will want within a trifle of seven sheep a year. Of bacon or pork thirty-six score will be wanted. Hogs differ so much in their propensity to fat that it is difficult to calculate about them, but this is a very good rule. When you see a fat hog and know how many scores he will weigh, Set down to his account a sack, half a quarter, of barley for every score of his weight. For, let him have been educated, as the French call it, as he may, this will be about the real cost of him when he is fat. A sack of barley will make a score of bacon, and it will not make more. Therefore the family would want eighteen quarters of barley in the year for bacon. As to the beer, eighteen gallons to the bushel of malt is very good. But as we allow of no spirits, no wine, and none of the slave produce, we will suppose that a sixth part of the beer is strong stuff. This would require two bushels of malt to the eighteen gallons. The whole would therefore take thirty-five bushels of malt, and a bushel of barley makes a bushel of malt, and by the increase pays the expense of malting. Here, then, the family would want for beer four quarters and three bushels of barley. The annual consumption of the family in victuals and drink would then be as follows. Wheat, three quarters, six bushels. Barley, twenty-two quarters, three bushels. Sheep, seven quarters. This being the case, the three thousand quarters of wheat which the parish annually produces would suffice for eight hundred families. The six thousand quarters of barley would suffice for two hundred and seven families. The three thousand five hundred fat sheep, being half the number kept, would suffice for five hundred families. So that here is produced in the parish of Milton bread for eight hundred, mutton for five hundred, and bacon and beer for two hundred and seven families. Besides victuals and drink, there are clothes, fuel, tools, and household goods wanting. But there are milk, butter, eggs, poultry, rabbits, hares, and partridges, which I have not noticed. And these are all eatables, and are all eaten too. And as to clothing, and indeed fuel, and all other wants beyond eating and drinking, are there not seven thousand fleeces of South Down wool, weighing altogether twenty-one thousand pounds, and capable of being made into eight thousand four hundred yards of broad cloth, at two pounds and a half of wool to the yard? Setting, therefore, the wool, the milk, butter, eggs, poultry, and game, against all the wants beyond the solid food and drink, we see that the parish of Milton that we have under our eye would give bread to eight hundred families, mutton to five hundred and eighty, and bacon and beer to two hundred and seven. The reason why wheat and mutton are produced in a proportion so much greater than the materials for making bacon and beer is that the wheat and the mutton are more loudly demanded from a distance, and are much more cheaply conveyed away in proportion to their value. For instance, the wheat and mutton are wanted in the infernal wen, and some barley is wanted there in the shape of malt. But hogs are not fatted in the wen, and a larger proportion of the barley is used where it is grown. Here is then bread for eight hundred families, mutton for five hundred, and bacon and beer for two hundred and seven. Let us take the average of the three, and then we have five hundred and two families, for the keeping of whom, and in this good manner too, the parish of Milton yields a sufficiency. In the wool, the milk, butter, eggs, poultry, and game, we have seen ample, and much more than ample, provision for all wants other than those of mere food and drink. What I have allowed in food and drink is by no means excessive. It is but a pound of bread, and a little more than half a pound of meat a day, to each person on an average, and the beer is not a drop too much. There are no green and moist vegetables included in my account, but there would be some, and they would not do any harm. But no man can say, or at least none but a base usurer, who would grind money out of the bones of his own father. No other man can, or will say, that I have been too liberal to this family. And yet, good God, what extravagance is here if the labours of England be now treated justly? Is there a family, even amongst those who live the hardest in the wen, that would not shudder at the thought of living upon what I have allowed to this family? Yet what do labourers' families get compared to this? The answer to that question ought to make us shudder indeed. The amount of my allowance, compared with the amount of the allowance that labourers now have, is necessary to be stated here, before I proceed further. The wheat three-quarters and six bushels at present price 
56 shillings the quarter, amounts to 10 pounds 10 shillings. The barley for bacon and beer, 22 quarters 3 bushels at present price, 34 shillings the quarter, amounts to 37 pounds 16 shillings 8 pence. The seven sheep at 40 shillings each amount to 14 pounds. The total is 62 pounds 6 shillings 8 pence. And this observe for bear victuals and drink, just food and drink enough to keep people in working condition. What then do the labourers get? To what fare has this wretched and most infamous system brought them? Why such a family, as I have described, is allowed to have, at the utmost, only about nine shillings a week. The parish allowance is only about seven shillings sixpence for the five people, including clothing, fuel, bedding, and everything. Monstrous state of things! But let us suppose it to be nine shillings. Even that makes only twenty-three pounds eight shillings a year for food, drink, clothing, fuel, and everything whereas I allowed sixty-two pounds six shillings eightpence a year for the bare eating and drinking, and that is little enough. Monstrous, barbarous, horrible as this appears, we do not, however, see it in half its horrors. Our indignation and rage against this infernal system is not half roused, till we see the small number of labourers who raise all the food and the drink, and of course the mere trifling portion of it, that they are suffered to retain for their own use. The parish of Milton does, as we have seen, produce food, drink, clothing, and all other things, enough for five hundred and two families, or two thousand five hundred and ten persons, upon my allowance, which is a great deal more than three times the present allowance, because the present allowance includes clothing, fuel, tools, and everything. Now then, according to the population return laid before Parliament, this parish contains five hundred persons, or, according to my division, one hundred families so that here are about one hundred families to raise food and drink enough and to raise wool and other things to pay for all other necessaries for five hundred and two families ay and five hundred and two families fed and lodged too on my liberal scale fed and lodged according to the present scale this one hundred families raise enough to supply more and many more than fifteen hundred families or seven thousand five hundred persons and yet those who do the work are half starved in the one hundred families there are we will suppose eighty able working men, and as many boys, sometimes assisted by the women and stout girls. What a handful of people to raise such a quantity of food! What injustice! What a hellish system it must be to make those who raise it skin and bone and nakedness, while the food and drink and wool are almost all carried away to be heaped on the fund-holders, pensioners, soldiers, dead-weight, and other swarms of tax-eaters! If such an operation do not need putting an end to, then the devil himself is a saint! Thus it must be, or much about thus, all the way down this fine and beautiful and interesting valley. There are twenty-nine agricultural parishes, the two last being in town, being Fisherton and Salisbury. Now, according to the population return, the whole of these twenty-nine parishes contain nine thousand one hundred and sixteen persons, or, according to my division, one thousand eight hundred and twenty-three families. There is no reason to believe that the proportion that we have seen in the case of Milton, does not hold good all the way through. That is, there is no reason to suppose that the produce does not exceed the consumption in every other case in the same degree that it does in the case of Milton. And indeed, if I were to judge from the number of houses and the number of ricks of corn, I should suppose that the excess was still greater in several of the other parishes. But supposing it to be no greater, supposing the same proportion to continue all the way from Watton Rivers to Stratford Dean, then here are nine thousand one hundred and sixteen persons raising food and raiment sufficient for forty five thousand five hundred and eighty persons fed and lodged according to my scale and sufficient for a hundred and thirty six thousand seven hundred and forty persons according to the scale on which the unhappy labourers of this fine valley are now fed and lodged and yet there is an emigration committee sitting to devise the means of getting rid not of the idlers not of the pensioners not of the dead weight not of the parsons to relieve whom we have seen the poor labourers taxed to the tune of a million and a half of money, not of the soldiers, but to devise means of getting rid of these working people who are grudged even the miserable morsel that they get. There is in the men calling themselves English country gentlemen something superlatively base. They are, I sincerely believe, the most cruel, the most unfeeling, the most brutally insolent, but I know, I can prove, I can safely take my oath, that they are the most base of all the creatures that God ever suffered to disgrace the human shape. The base wretches know well that the taxes amount to more than sixty millions a year, and that the poor rates amount to about seven millions, 
yet while the cowardly reptiles never utter a word against the taxes they are incessantly railing against the poor rates though it is and they know it the taxes that make the paupers the base wretches know well that the sum of money given even to the fellows that gather the taxes is greater in amount than the poor rates the base wretches know well that the money given to the dead weight who ought not to have a single farthing amounts to more than the poor receive out of the rates the base wretches know well that the common foot-soldier now receives more pay per week seven shillings seven pence exclusive of clothing firing candle and lodging the base wretches know that the common foot-soldier receives more to go down his own single throat than the overseers and magistrates allow to a working man his wife and three children the base wretches know all this well and yet their railings are confined to the poor and the poor rates and it is expected that they will next session urge the parliament to pass a law to enable overseers and vestries and magistrates to transport paupers beyond the seas they are base enough for this or for anything but the whole system will go to the devil long before they will get such an act passed long before they will see perfected this consummation of their infamous tyranny it is manifest enough that the population of this valley was at one time many times over what it is now for in the first place what were the twenty-nine churches built for the population of the twenty-nine parishes is now but little more than one half of that of the single parish of kensington and there are several of the churches bigger than the church at kensington what then should all these churches have been built for and besides where did the hands come from and where did the money come from these twenty-nine churches would now not only hold all the inhabitants men women and children but all the household goods and tools and implements of the whole of them farmers and all if you leave out the wagons and carts in three instances fyfield milston and roach fen the church porches will hold all the inhabitants even down to the bedridden and the babies what then will any man believe that these churches were built for such little knots of people we are told about the great superstition of our fathers and of their readiness to gratify the priests by building altars and other religious edifices but we must think those priests to have been most devout creatures indeed if we believe that they chose to have the money laid out in useless churches rather than have it put into their own pockets at any rate we all know that protestant priests have no whims of this sort and that they never lay out upon churches any money that they can by any means get hold of but suppose that we are to believe that the priests had in all times this unaccountable taste and suppose we are to believe that a knot of people who might be crammed into a church porch were seized and very frequently too with the desire of having a big church to go to we must after all this believe that this knot of people were more than giants or that they had surprising riches else we cannot believe that they had the means of gratifying the strange wishes of their priests and their own not less strange piety and devotion even if we could believe that they thought that they were paving their way to heaven by building churches which were a hundred times too large for the population still we cannot believe that the building could have been effected without bodily force and where was this force to come from if the people were not more numerous than they now are what again i ask were these twenty-nine churches stuck up not a mile from each other what were twenty-nine churches made for if the population had been no greater than it is now but in fact you plainly see all the traces of a great ancient population the churches are almost all large and built in the best manner many of them are very fine edifices very costly in the building and in the cases where the body of the church has been altered in the repairing of it so as to make it smaller the tower which everywhere defies the hostility of time shows you what the church must formerly have been this is the case in several instances and there are two or three of these villages which must formerly have been market towns and particularly pusey and uphaven there are now no less than nine of the parishes out of the twenty-nine that have either no parsonage houses or have such as are in such a state that a parson will not or cannot live in them three of them are without any parsonage houses at all and the rest are become poor mean falling down places this latter is the case at uphaven which was formerly a very considerable place nothing can more clearly show than this that all as far as buildings and population are concerned has been long upon the decline and decay dilapidation after dilapidation have at last almost effaced even the parsonage houses and that too in defiance of the law ecclesiastical as well as civil the land remains and the crops and the sheep come as abundantly as ever but they are now sent almost wholly away instead of remaining as formerly to be in great part consumed in these twenty-nine parishes the stars in my map mark the spots where manor-houses or gentlemen's mansions formerly stood 
and stood too only about sixty years ago every parish had its manor-house in the first place and then there were down this valley twenty-one others so that in this distance of about thirty miles there stood fifty mansion-houses where are they now i believe there are but eight that are at all worthy of the name of mansion-houses and even these are but poorly kept up and except in two or three instances are of no benefit to the labouring people they employ but few persons and in short do not half supply the place of any eight of the old mansions all these mansions all these parsonages i and their goods and furniture together with the clocks the brass kettles the brewing vessels the good bedding and good clothes and good furniture and the stock in pigs or in money of the inferior classes in this series of once populous and gay villages and hamlets all these have been by the accursed system of taxing and funding and paper money by the well-known exactions of the state and by the not less real though less generally understood extortions of the monopolies arising out of paper money all these have been by these accursed means conveyed away out of this valley to the haunts of the tax-eaters and the monopolizers there are many of the mansion-houses the ruins of which you yet behold at milton there are two mansion-houses the walls and the roofs of which yet remain but which are falling gradually to pieces and the garden walls are crumbling down at enford bennett the member for the county had a large mansion-house the stables of which are yet standing in several places i saw still remaining indubitable traces of an ancient manor-house namely a dovecot or pigeon-house the poor pigeons have kept possession of their heritage from generation to generation and so have the rooks in their several rookeries while the paper system has swept away or rather swallowed up the owners of the dovecots and of the lofty trees about forty families of which owners have been ousted in this one valley and have become dead-weight creatures tax-gatherers barrack-fellows thief-takers or perhaps paupers or thieves senator snip congratulated some years ago that preciously honourable collective wisdom of which he is a most worthy member snip congratulated it on the success of the late war in creating capital snip is you must know a great philosopher and a not less great financier snip cited as a proof of the great and glorious effects of paper money the new and fine houses in london the new streets and squares the new roads new canals and bridges snip was not i dare say aware that this same paper money had destroyed forty mansion houses in this vale of avon and had taken away all the goods all the substance of the little gentry and of the labouring class snip was not i dare say aware that this same paper money had in this one vale of only thirty miles long dilapidated and in some cases wholly demolished nine out of twenty-nine even of the parsonage houses i told snip at the time eighteen twenty one that paper money could create no valuable thing i begged snip to bear this in mind i besought all my readers and particularly mr matthias atwood one of the members for lowther town not to believe that paper money ever did or ever could create anything of any value i besought him to look well into the matter and assured him that he would find that though paper money could create nothing of value it was able to transfer everything of value able to strip a little gentry able to dilapidate even parsonage houses able to rob gentlemen of their estates and labourers of their sunday coats and their barrels of beer able to snatch the dinner from the board of the reaper or the mower and to convey it to the barrack table of the hessian or hanoverian grenadier able to take away the wool that ought to give warmth to the bodies of those who rear the sheep and put it on the backs of those who carry arms to keep the poor half-famished shepherds in order i have never been able clearly to comprehend what the beastly scotch philosophers mean by their national wealth but as far as i can understand them this is their meaning the national wealth means that which is left of the products of the country over and above what is consumed or used by those whose labour causes the products to be this being the notion it follows of course that the fewer poor devils you can screw the products out of the richer the nation is this is too the notion of burdett as expressed in his silly and most nasty musty aristocratic speech of last session what then is to be done with this overproduce who is to have it is it to go to pensioners placemen tax-gatherers dead-weight people soldiers gendarmerie police people and in short to whole millions who do no work at all is this a cause of national wealth is a nation made rich by taking the food and clothing from those who create them and giving them to those who do nothing of any use ay but this overproduce may be given to manufacturers 
and to those who supply the food raisers with what they want besides food. Oh, but this is merely an exchange of one valuable thing for another valuable thing. It is an exchange of labour in Wiltshire for labour in Lancashire, and upon the whole here is no overproduction. If the produce be exported, it is the same thing. It is an exchange of one sort of labour for another. But our course is that there is not an exchange, that those who labour, no matter in what way, have a large part of the fruit of their labour taken away, and receive nothing in exchange. If the overproduce of this valley of Avon were given by the farmers to the weavers in Lancashire, to the iron and steel chaps of Warwickshire, and to other makers or sellers of useful things, there would come an abundance of all these useful things into this valley from Lancashire and other parts. But if, as is the case, the overproduce goes to the fundholders, the dead weight, the soldiers, the lord and lady and master and miss pensioners and sinecure people, if the overproduce go to them, as a very great part of it does, nothing, not even the parings of one's nails, can come back to the valley in exchange. And can this operation, then, add to the national wealth? It adds to the wealth of those who carry on the affairs of state. It fills their pockets, those of their relatives and dependents. It fattens all tax-eaters. But it can give no wealth to the nation, which means the whole of the people. National wealth means the commonwealth, or common weal, and these mean the general good or happiness of the people, and the safety and honour of the state, and these are not to be secured by robbing those who labour, in order to support a large part of the community in idleness. Devizes is the market-town to which the corn goes from the greater part of this valley. If, when a wagon-load of wheat goes off in the morning, the wagon came back at night loaded with cloth, salt, or something or other, equal in value to the wheat, except what might be necessary to leave with the shopkeeper as his profit, then indeed the people might see the wagon go off without tears in their eyes, but now they see it go to carry away, and to bring next to nothing in return. What a twist a head must have before it can come to the conclusion that the nation gains in wealth by the government being able to cause the work to be done by those who have hardly any share in the fruit of the labour! What a twist such a head must have! The Scotch philosophers, who seem all to have been by nature formed for negro drivers, have an insuperable objection to all those establishments and customs which occasion holidays. They call them a great hindrance, a great bar to industry, a great drawback from national wealth. I wish each of these unfeeling fellows had a spade put into his hand for ten days, only ten days, and that he were compelled to dig only just as much as one of the common labourers at Fulham. The metaphysical gentleman would, I believe, soon discover the use of holidays. But why should men— why should any men work hard? Why, I ask, should they work incessantly if working part of the days of the week be sufficient? Why should the people at Milton, for instance, work incessantly, when they now raise food and clothing and fuel, and every necessary to maintain well five times their number? Why should they not have some holidays? And pray, say, thou conceited Scotch philosopher, how the national wealth can be increased, by making these people work incessantly, that they may raise food and clothing, to go to feed and clothe people who do not work at all. The state of this valley seems to illustrate the infamous and really diabolical assertion of Malthus, which is that the human kind have a natural tendency to increase beyond the means of sustenance for them. Hence all the schemes of this and the other Scotch writers for what they call checking population. Now look at this valley of Avon. Here the people raise nearly twenty times as much food and clothing as they consume, they raise five times as much, even according to my scale of living. They have been doing this for many, many years. They have been doing it for several generations. Where, then, is their natural tendency to increase beyond the means of sustenance for them? Beyond, indeed, the means of that sustenance, which a system like this will leave them? Say that, Sawneys, and I agree with you. Far beyond the means that the taxing and monopolising system will leave in their hands. That is very true, for it leaves them nothing but the scale of the poor book. They must cease to breed at all, or they must exceed this mark. But the earth, give them their fair share of its products, will always give sustenance in sufficiency to those who apply to it by skilful and diligent labour. The villagers down this valley of Avon, and indeed it was the same in almost every part of this county, and in the north and west of Hampshire also, used to have great employment for the women and children in the carding and spinning of wool for the making of broadcloth. This was a very general employment for the women and girls, but it is now wholly gone, and this has made a vast change in the condition of the people, and in the state of property and of manners and of morals. In 1816 I wrote and published a letter to the Luddites. 
the object of which was to combat their hostility to the use of machinery. The arguments I there made use of were general. I took the matter in the abstract. The principles were all correct enough, but the application cannot be universal, and we have a case here before us at this moment, which in my opinion shows that the mechanic inventions, pushed to the extent that they have been, have been productive of great calamity to this country, and that they will be productive of still greater calamity, unless indeed it be their brilliant destiny to be the immediate cause of putting an end to the present system. The greater part of manufactures consists of clothing and bedding. Now, if by using a machine we can get our coat with less labour than we got it before, the machine is a desirable thing. But then, mind, we must have the machine at home, and we ourselves must have the profit of it. For if the machine be elsewhere, if it be worked by other hands, if other persons have the profit of it, and if in consequence of the existence of the machine we have hands at home who have nothing to do, and whom we must keep, then the machine is an injury to us, however advantageous it may be to those who use it, and whatever traffic it may occasion with foreign states. Such is the case with regard to this cloth-making. The machines are at Upton Level, Warminster, Bradford, Westbury and Trowbridge, and here are some of the hands in the Valley of Avon. This valley raises food and clothing, but in order to raise them it must have labourers. These are absolutely necessary, for without them this rich and beautiful valley becomes worth nothing except to wild animals and their pursuers. The labourers are men and boys, women and girls occasionally, but the men and the boys are as necessary as the light of day, or as the air and the water. Now if Beasley Malthus, or any of his nasty disciples, can discover a mode of having men and boys without having women and girls, then certainly the machine must be a good thing. But if this valley must absolutely have the women and the girls, then the machine, by leaving them with nothing to do, is a mischievous thing, and a producer of most dreadful misery. What, with regard to the poor, is the great complaint now? Why, that the single man does not receive the same, or anything like the same, wages as the married man? Aye, it is the wife and girls that are the burden, and to be sure a burden they must be, under a system of taxation like the present, and with no work to do. Therefore, whatever may be saved in labour by the machine is no benefit but an injury to the mass of the people, for in fact all that the women and children earned was so much clear addition to what the family earns now. The greatest part of the clothing in the United States of America is made by the farm women and girls. They do almost the whole of it, and all that they do is done at home. To be sure they might buy cheap, but they must buy for less than nothing, if it would not answer their purpose to make the things. The survey of this valley is, I think, the finest answer in the world to the emigration committee fellows, and to Jerry Curtis, one of the members for Sussex, who has been giving evidence before it. I shall find out, when I get to see the report, what this emigration committee would be after. I remember that last winter a young woman complained to one of the police justices that the overseers of some parish were going to transport her orphan brother to Canada, because he became chargeable to their parish. I remember also that the justice said, that the intention of the overseers was premature, for that the bill had not yet passed. This was rather an ugly story, and I do think that we shall find that there have been, and are, some pretty propositions before this committee. We shall see all about the matter, however, by and by, and when we get the transporting project fairly before us, shall we not then loudly proclaim the envy of surrounding nations and admiration of the world? But what ignorance, impudence, and insolence must those base wretches have, who propose to transport the labouring people as being too numerous, while the produce which is obtained by their labour is more than sufficient for three, four, or five, or even ten times their numbers. Jerry Curtis, who has, it seems, been a famous witness on this occasion, says that the poor rates in many cases amount to as much as the rent. Well, and what then, Jerry? The rent may be high enough too, and the farmer may afford to pay them both, for a very large part of what you call poor rates ought to be called wages. But at any rate, what has all this to do with the necessity of emigration? To make out such necessity, you must make out that you have more mouths than the produce of the parish will feed. Do then, Jerry, tell us, another time, a little about the quantity of food annually raised in four or five adjoining parishes. For is it not something rather damnable, Jerry, to talk of transporting Englishmen on account of the excess of their numbers, when the fact is notorious that their labour produces five or ten times as much food and raiment as they and their families consume. However, to drop Jerry for the present, the baseness, the foul, the stinking, the carrion baseness of the fellows that call themselves country gentlemen, 
is that the wretches while railing against the poor and the poor rates while affecting to believe that the poor are wicked and lazy while complaining that the poor the working people are too numerous and that the country villages are too populous the carrion baseness of these wretches is that while they are thus bold with regard to the working and poor people they never even whisper a word against pensioners placemen soldiers parsons fundholders tax-gatherers or tax-eaters they say not a word against the prolific dead weight to whom they give a premium for breeding while they want to check the population of labourers they never say a word about the too great populousness of the wen nor about that of liverpool manchester cheltenham and the like oh they are the most cowardly the very basest the most scandalously base reptiles that ever were warmed into life by the rays of the sun in taking my leave of this beautiful vale i have to express my deep shame as an englishman at beholding the general extreme poverty of those who cause this vale to produce such quantities of food and raiment this is i verily believe it the worst used labouring people upon the face of the earth dogs and hogs and horses are treated with more civility and as to food and lodging how gladly would the labourers change with them this state of things never can continue many years by some means or other there must be an end to it and my firm belief is that the end will be dreadful in the meanwhile i see and i see it with pleasure that the common people know that they are ill-used and that they cordially most cordially hate those who ill-treat them during the day i crossed the river about fifteen or sixteen times and in such hot weather it was very pleasant to be so much amongst meadows and water i had been at nether raven about eighteen years ago where i had seen a great quantity of hares it is a place belonging to mr hicks beach or beach who was once a member of parliament i found the place altered a good deal out of repair the gates rather rotten and a very bad sign the roof of the dog kennel falling in there is a church at this village of nether raven large enough to hold a thousand or two of people and the whole parish contains only three hundred and fifty souls men women and children this nether raven was formerly a great lordship and in the parish there were three considerable mansion houses besides the one near the church these mansions are all down now and it is curious enough to see the former walled gardens become orchards together with other changes all tending to prove the gradual decay in all except what appertains merely to the land as a thing of production for the distant market but indeed the people and the means of enjoyment must go away they are drawn away by the taxes and the paper money how are twenty thousand new houses to be made all at once building in the wen without people and food and raiment going from this valley towards the wen it must be so and this unnatural this dilapidating this ruining and debasing work must go on until that which produces it be destroyed when i came down to stratford dean i wanted to go across to laverstoke which lay to my left of salisbury but just on the side of the road here at stratford dean rises the accursed hill it is very lofty it was originally a hill in an irregular sort of sugar-loaf shape but it was so altered by the romans or by somebody that the upper three-quarter parts of the hill now when seen from a distance somewhat resemble three cheeses laid one upon another the bottom one a great deal broader than the next and the top one like a stilton cheese in proportion to a gloucester one i resolved to ride over this accursed hill as i was going up a field towards it i met a man going home from work i asked how he got on he said very badly i asked him what was the cause of it he said the hard times what times said i was there ever a finer summer a finer harvest and is there not an old wheat rick in every farmyard ah said he they make it bad for poor people for all that they said i who is they he was silent oh no no my friend said i it is not they it is that accursed hill that has robbed you of the supper that you ought to find smoking on the table when you get home i gave him the price of a pot of beer and on i went leaving the poor dejected assemblage of skin and bone to wonder at my words the hill is very steep and i dismounted and led my horse up being as near to the top as i could conveniently get i stood a little while reflecting not so much on the changes which that hill had seen as on the changes the terrible changes which in all human probability it had yet to see and which it would have greatly helped to produce it was impossible to stand on this accursed spot without swelling with indignation against the base and plundering and murderous sons of corruption i have often wished and i speaking out loud express the wish now may that man perish for ever and ever 
who having the power neglects to bring to justice the perjured the subordinating the insolent and perfidious miscreants who openly sell their country's rights and their own souls from the accursed hill i went to laverstoke where jemmy burrow as they call him here the judge lives i have not heard much about jemmy since he tried and condemned the two young men who had wounded the gamekeepers of ashton smith and lord palmerston his lordship palmerston is i see making a tolerable figure in the newspapers as a share man i got into salisbury about half-past seven o'clock less tired than i recollect ever to have been after so long a ride for including my several crossings of the river and my deviations to look at churches and farmyards and rickyards i think i must have ridden nearly forty miles End of chapter 21「Ride from Salisbury to Warminster, from Warminster to Froome, from Froome to Devizes, and from Devizes to Highworth. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver, and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat? Shall not the land tremble for this, and every one mourn that dwelleth therein? I will turn your feasting into mourning, saith the Lord God, and your songs into lamentations. Amos chapter 8, verses 4 to 10 Hatesbury, Wiltshire, Thursday, 31st August, 1826 This place, which is one of the rotten boroughs of Wiltshire, and which was formerly a considerable town, is now but a very miserable affair. Yesterday morning I went into the cathedral at Salisbury about seven o'clock. When I got into the nave of the church and was looking up and admiring the columns and the roof, I heard a sort of humming in some place which appeared to be in the transept of the building. I wondered what it was, and made my way towards the place whence the noise appeared to issue. As I approached it the noise seemed to grow louder. At last I thought I could distinguish the sounds of the human voice. This encouraged me to proceed, and, still following the sound, I at last turned in at a doorway to my left, where I found a priest and his congregation assembled. It was a parson of some sort, with a white covering on him, and five women and four men. When I arrived, there were five couple of us. I joined the congregation until they came to the litany, and then being monstrously hungry, I did not think myself bound to stay any longer. I wonder what the founders would say if they could rise from the grave and see such a congregation as this in this most magnificent and beautiful cathedral. I wonder what they would say if they could know to what purpose the endowments of this cathedral are now applied. And above all things I wonder what they would say if they could see the half-starved labourers that now minister to the luxuries of those who wallow in the wealth of those endowments. There is one thing at any rate that might be abstained from by those that revel in the riches of those endowments, namely to abuse and blackguard those of our forefathers from whom the endowments came, and who erected the edifice, and carried so far towards the skies that beautiful and matchless spire, of which the present possessors have the impudence to boast, while they represent as ignorant and benighted creatures those who conceive the grand design, and who executed the scientific and costly work. These fellows, in big white wigs, of the size of half a bushel, have the audacity, even within the walls of the cathedrals themselves, to rail against those who founded them, and Rennell and Sturgis, while they were actually, literally, fattening on the spoils of the monastery of St. Swithin, at Winchester, were publishing abusive pamphlets against the Catholic religion, which had given them their very bread. For my part, I could not look up at the spire and the whole of the church at Salisbury, without feeling that I lived in degenerate times." Such a thing never could be made now. We feel that as we look at the building. It really does appear that if our forefathers had not made these buildings, we should have forgotten before now what the Christian religion was. At Salisbury, or very near to it, four other rivers fall into the Avon, the Wiley River, the Nadder, the Bourne, and another little river that comes from Norrington. 
These all become one at last, just below Salisbury, and then under the name of the Avon, wind along down, and fall into the sea at Christchurch. In coming from Salisbury I came up the road which runs pretty nearly parallel with the river Wiley, which river rises at Warminster, and in the neighbourhood. This river runs down a valley twenty-two miles long. It is not so pretty as the valley of the Avon, but it is very fine in its whole length from Salisbury to this place, Hatesbury. Here are watered meadows nearest to the river on both sides, then the gardens, the houses, and the cornfields. After the cornfields come the downs, but generally speaking the downs are not so bold here as they are on the sides of the Avon. The downs do not come out in promontory so often as they do on the sides of the Avon. The ha-ha, if I may so express it, is not so deep, and the sides of it not so steep as in the case of the Avon, but the villages are as frequent. There is more than one church in every mile, and there has been a due proportion of mansion-houses demolished and defaced. The farms are very fine up this vale, and the meadows, particularly at a place called Stapleford, are singularly fine. They had just been mowed at Stapleford, and the hay carried off. At Stapleford there is a little cross valley, running up between two hills of the down. There is a little run of water, about a yard wide at this time, coming down this little vale across the road into the river. The little vale runs up three miles. It does not appear to be half a mile wide, but in those three miles there are four churches, namely Stapleford, Uppington, Berwick St. James, and Winterbourne Stoke. The present population of these four villages is 769 souls, men, women, and children, the whole of whom could very conveniently be seated in the chancel of the church at Stapleford. Indeed, the church and parish of Uppington seem to have been united with one of the other parishes, like the parish in Kent, which was united with North Cray, and not a single house of which now remains. What were these four churches built for, within the distance of three miles? There are three parsonage houses still remaining, but, and it is a very curious fact, neither of them good enough for the parson to live in. Here are seven hundred and sixty souls to be taken care of, but there is no parsonage house for a soul curer to stay in, or at least that he will stay in, and all the three parsonages are, in the return laid before Parliament, represented to be no better than miserable labourers' cottages, though the parish of Winterbourne Stoke has a church sufficient to contain two or three thousand people. The truth is that the parsons have been receiving the revenues of the livings, and have been suffering the parsonage houses to fall into decay. Here were two or three mansion-houses, which are also gone, even from the sides of this little run of water. Today has been exceedingly hot, hotter, I think, for a short time, than I ever felt it in England before. In coming through a village called Wishford, and mounting a little hill, I thought the heat upon my back was as great as I had ever felt it in my life. There were thunderstorms about, and it had rained at Wishford a little before I came to it. My next village was one that I had lived in for a short time, when I was only about ten or eleven years of age. I had been sent down with a horse from Farnham, and I remember that I went by Stonehenge, and rode up and looked at the stones. From Stonehenge I went to the village of Steeple Langford, where I remained from the month of June till the fall of the year. I remembered the beautiful villages up and down this valley. I also remembered very well that the women at Steeple Langford used to card and spin dyed wool. I was therefore somewhat filled with curiosity to see this Steeple Langford again, and indeed it was the recollection of this village that made me take a ride into Wiltshire this summer. I have, I dare say, a thousand times talked about this Steeple Langford, and about the beautiful farms and meadows along this valley. I have talked of these to my children a great many times, and I formed the design of letting two of them see this valley this year, and to go through Warminster to Stroud, and so on to Gloucester and Hereford. But when I got to Everley I found that they would never get along fast enough to get into Herefordshire in time for what they intended, so that I parted from them in the manner I have before described. I was resolved, however, to see Steeple Langford myself, and I was impatient to get to it, hoping to find a public house, and a stable to put my horse in, to protect him for a while against the flies, which tormented him to such a degree that to ride him was work as hard as threshing. When I got to Steeple Langford I found no public house, and I found it a much more miserable place than I had remembered it. The steeple, to which it owed its distinctive appellation, was gone, and the place altogether seemed to me to be very much altered for the worse. A little further on, however, I came to a very famous inn called Deptford Inn, which is in the parish of Wiley. I stayed at this inn till about four o'clock in the afternoon. I remembered Wiley very well, and thought it a gay place when I was a boy. I remembered a very beautiful garden, belonging to a rich farmer and miller. 
I went to see it, but alas, though the statues in the water and on the grass plat were still remaining, everything seemed to be in a state of perfect carelessness and neglect. The living of this parish of Wiley was lately owned by Dampier, a brother of the judge, who lived at, and I believe had the living of, Mayon Stoke in Hampshire. This fellow, I believe, never saw the parish of Wiley but once, though it must have yielded him a pretty good fleece. It is a rectory, and the great tithes must be worth, I should think, six or seven hundred pounds a year at the least. It is part of our system to have certain families who have no particular merit, but who are to be maintained without why or wherefore, at the public expense, in some shape or under some name or other, it matters not much what shape or what name. If you look through the old list of pensioners, sinecures, parsons, and the like, you will find the same names everlastingly recurring. They seem to be a sort of creatures that have an inheritance in the public carcass, like the maggots that some people have in their skins. This family of Dampier seems to be one of these. What in God's name should have made one of these a bishop and the other a judge? I never heard of the smallest particle of talent that either of them possessed. This rector of Wiley was another of them. There was no harm in them that I know of, beyond that of living upon the public. But where were their merits? They had none to distinguish them, and to entitle them to the great sums they received. And, under any other system than such a system as this, they would in all human probability have been gentlemen's servants, or little shopkeepers. I dare say there is some of the breed left, and if there be I would pledge my existence, that they are, in some shape or other, feeding upon the public. However, thus it must be, until that change come, which will put an end to men paying fourpence in tax upon a pot of beer. This Deptford Inn was a famous place of meeting for the yeomanry cavalry, in glorious anti-Jacobin times, when wheat was twenty shillings a bushel, and when a man could be crammed into jail for years for only looking awry. This inn was a glorious place in the days of Peg Nicholson and her knights, strangely altered now. The shape of the garden shows you what revelry used to be carried on here. Peel's bill gave this inn, and all belonging to it, a terrible souse. The unfeeling brutes who used to brandish their swords and swagger about at the news of what was called a victory have now to lower their scale in clothing, in drink, in eating, in dress, in horse-flesh, and everything else. They are now a lower sort of men than they were. They look at their rusty sword and their old dusty helmet and their once gay regimental jacket. They do not hang these up now in the parlour for everybody to see them. They hang them up in their bedrooms or in a cockloft, and when they meet their eye they look at them as a cow does at a bastard calf, or as the bridegroom does at a girl that the overseers are about to compel him to marry. If their children should happen to see these implements of war twenty or thirty years hence, they will certainly think that their fathers were the greatest fools that ever walked the face of the earth, and that will be a most filial and charitable way of thinking of them, for it is not from ignorance that they have sinned, but from excessive baseness, and when any of them now complain of those acts of the government which strip them, as the late order in council does, of a fifth part of their property in an hour, let them recollect their own base and malignant conduct towards those persecuted reformers, who, if they had not been suppressed by these very yeomen, would long ago have put an end to the cause of that ruin, of which these yeomen now complain. When they complain of their ruin, let them remember the toasts which they drank in anti-Jacobin times. Let them remember their base and insulting exultations on the occasion of the 16th of August at Manchester. Let them remember their cowardly abuse of men, who were endeavouring to free their country from that horrible scourge which they themselves now feel. Just close by this Deptford Inn is the farmhouse of the farm where that Gourlay lived, who has long been making a noise in the court of Chancery, and who is now, I believe, confined in some place or other for having assaulted Mr. Broom. This fellow, who is confined, the newspapers tell us, on a charge of being insane, is certainly one of the most malignant devils that I ever knew anything of in my life. He went to Canada about the time that I went last to the United States. He got into a quarrel with the government there about something, I know not what. He came to see me at my house in the neighbourhood of New York, just before I came home. He told me his Canada story. I showed him all the kindness in my power, and he went away, knowing that I was just then coming to England. I had hardly got home before the Scotch newspapers contained communications from a person pretending to derive his information from Gourley, relating to what Gourley had described as having passed between him and me, and which description was a tissue of most abominable falsehoods, all having a direct tendency to do injury to me, who had never, either by word or deed, done anything that could possibly have a tendency to do injury to this Gourley. What the vile Scotch newspapers had begun, the malignant reptile himself continued, after his return to England, and, in an address to Lord Bathurst, endeavoured to make his court to the government by the most foul, false, 
and detestable slanders upon me, from whom, observe, he had never received any injury, or attempt at injury, in the whole course of his life, whom he had visited, to whose house he had gone, of his own accord, and that too, as he said, out of respect for me, endeavoured, I say, to make his court to the government, by the most abominable slanders against me. He is now, even now, putting forth, under the form of letters to me, a revival of what he pretends was a conversation that passed between us at my house near New York. Even if what he says were true, none but caitiffs as base as those who conduct the English newspapers would give circulation to his letters, containing, as they must, the substance of a conversation purely private. But I never had any conversation with him. I never talked to him at all about the things that he is now bringing forward. I heard the fellow's stories about Canada. I thought he told me lies, and besides, I did not care a straw whether his stories were true or not. I looked upon him as a sort of gambling adventurer, but I treated him, as is the fashion of the country in which I was, with great civility and hospitality. There are two fellows of the name of Jacob and Johnson at Winchester, and two fellows at Salisbury of the name of Brodie and Dowding. These reptiles publish each couple of them a newspaper, and in these newspapers they seem to take particular delight in calumniating me. The two Winchester fellows insert the letters of this half-crazy, half-cunning Scotchman, Gurley, the other fellows insert still viler slanders, and if I had seen one of their papers before I left Salisbury, which I have seen since, I certainly would have given Mr. Brodie something to make him remember me. This fellow, who was a little coal merchant but a short while ago, is now, it seems, a paper money maker, as well as a newspaper maker. Stop, Master Brodie, till I go to Salisbury again, and see whether I do not give you a check, even such as you did not receive during the late run. Gurley, amongst other whims, took it into his head to write against the poor laws, saying that they were a bad thing. He found, however, at last, that they were necessary to keep him from starving, for he came down to Wiley three or four years ago, and threw himself upon the parish. The overseers, who recollected what a swaggering blade it was, when it came here, to teach the moon-rakers hoot farm one, did not see the sense of keeping him like a gentleman, so they set him to crack stones upon the highway, and that set him off again pretty quickly. The farm that he rented is a very fine farm, with a fine large farmhouse to it. It is looked upon as one of the best farms in the country. The present occupier is a farmer born in the neighbourhood, a man such as ought to occupy it, and Gurley, who came here with his Scotch impudence to teach others how to farm, is much about where and how he ought to be. Jacob and Johnson of Winchester know perfectly well that all the fellow says about me is lies. They know also that their parson readers know that it is a mass of lies. They further know that the parsons know that they know that it is a mass of lies, but they know that their paper will sell the better for that. They know that to circulate lies about me will get them money, and this is what they do it for. And such is the character of English newspapers, and of a great part of the readers of those newspapers. Therefore when I hear of people suffering, when I hear of people being ruined, when I hear of unfortunate families, when I hear a talk of this kind, I stop, before I either express or feel compassion, to ascertain who and what the sufferers are, and whether they have or have not participated in, or approved of, acts like those of Jacob and Johnson and Brodie and Dowding. For if they have, if they have malignantly calumniated those who have been labouring to prevent their ruin and misery, then a crushed earwig or spider or eft or toad is as much entitled to the compassion of a just and sensible man. Let the reptiles perish. It would be injustice. It would be to fly in the face of morality and religion to express sorrow for their ruin. They themselves have felt for no man, and for the wife and children of no man, if that man's public virtues thwarted their own selfish views, or even excited their groundless fears. They have signed addresses, applauding everything tyrannical and inhuman. They have seemed to glory in the shame of their country, to rejoice in its degradation, and even to exult in the shedding of innocent blood, if these things did but tend, as they thought, to give them permanent security in the enjoyment of their unjust gains. Such has been their conduct, they are numerous, they are to be found in all parts of the kingdom. Therefore, again I say, when I hear of ruin or misery, I must know what the conduct of the sufferers has been, before I bestow my compassion. Warminster, Wiltshire, Friday, 1st September I set out from Hatesbury this morning about six o'clock. Last night, before I went to bed, I found that there were some men and boys in the house, who had come all the way from Bradford, about twelve miles, in order to get nuts. These people were men and boys that had been employed in the cloth factories at Bradford, and about Bradford. I had some talk with some of these nutters, and I am quite convinced not that the cloth-making is at an end, but that it never will be again what it has been. Before last Christmas these manufacturers had full work at one shilling and threepence a yard at broadcloth weaving. 
they have now a quarter work at one shilling a yard one and threepence a yard for this weaving has been given at all times within the memory of man nothing can show more clearly than this and in a stronger light the great change which has taken place in the remuneration of labour there was a turnout last winter when the price was reduced to a shilling a yard but it was put an end to in the usual way the constable's staff the bayonet the jail these poor nutters were extremely ragged i saved my supper and i fasted instead of breakfasting that was three shillings which i had saved and i added five to them with a resolution to save them afterwards in order to give these chaps a breakfast for once in their lives there were eight of them six men and two boys and i gave them two quartern loaves two pounds of cheese and eight pints of strong beer the fellows were very thankful but the conduct of the landlord and landlady pleased me exceedingly when i came to pay my bill they had said nothing about my bed which had been a very good one and when i asked why they had not put the bed into the bill they said they would not charge anything for the bed since i had been so good to the poor men yes said i but i must not throw the expense upon you i had no supper and i have had no breakfast and therefore i am not called upon to pay for them but i have had the bed it ended by my paying for the bed and coming off leaving the nutters at their breakfast and very much delighted with the landlord and his wife and i must here observe that i have pretty generally found a good deal of compassion for the poor people to prevail amongst publicans and their wives from hatesbury to warminster is a part of the country singularly bright and beautiful from salisbury up to very near hatesbury you have the valley as before described by me meadows next the water then arable land then the downs but when you come to hatesbury and indeed a little before in looking forward you see the vale stretch out from about three miles wide to ten miles wide from high land to high land from a hill before you come down to hatesbury you see through this wide opening into somersetshire you see a round hill rising in the middle of the opening but all the rest a flat and closed country and apparently full of wood in looking back down this vale one cannot help being struck with the innumerable proofs that there are of a decline in point of population in the first place there are twenty-four parishes each of which takes a little strip across the valley and runs up through the arable land into the down there are twenty-four parish churches and there ought to be as many parsonage houses but seven of these out of the twenty-four that is to say nearly one-third of them are in the returns laid before parliament and of which returns i shall speak more particularly by and by stated to be such miserable dwellings as to be unfit for a parson to reside in two of them however are gone there are no parsonage houses in those two parishes there are the sites there are the glebes but the houses have been suffered to fall down and to be totally carried away the tithes remain indeed and the parson sacks the amount of them a journeyman parson comes and works in three or four churches of a sunday but the master parson is not there he generally carries away the produce to spend it in london at bath or somewhere else to show off his daughters and the overseers that is to say the farmers manage the poor in their own way instead of having according to the ancient law a third part of all the tithes to keep them with the falling down in the beggary of these parsonage houses proved beyond all question the decayed state of the population and indeed the mansion houses are gone except in a very few instances there are but five left that i could perceive all the way from salisbury to warminster though the country is the most pleasant that can be imagined here is water here are meadows plenty of fresh-water fish hares and partridges in abundance and it is next to impossible to destroy them here are shooting coursing hunting hills of every height size and form valleys the same lofty trees and rookeries in every mile roads always solid and good always pleasant for exercise and the air must be of the best in the world yet it is manifest that four-fifths of the mansions have been swept away there is a parliamentary return to prove that nearly a third of the parsonage houses have become beggarly holes or have disappeared i have now been in nearly threescore villages and in twenty or thirty or forty hamlets of wiltshire and i do not know that i have been in one however small in which i did not see a house or two and sometimes more either tumbled down or beginning to tumble down it is impossible for the eyes of man to be fixed on a finer country than that between the village of codford and the town of warminster and it is not very easy for the eyes of man to discover labouring people more miserable there are two villages one called norton boven and the other bishop's trow which i think form together one of the prettiest spots that my eyes ever beheld the former village belongs to bennett the member for the county who has a mansion there in which two of his sisters live i am told there is a farm at bishop's trow standing at the back of the arable land 
up in a vale formed by two very lofty hills, upon each of which there was formerly a Roman camp, in consideration of which farm, if the owner would give it to me, I would almost consent to let Ottewell Wood remain quiet in his seat, and suffer the pretty gentlemen of Whitehall to go on without note or comment, till they had fairly blowed up their concern. The farmyard is surrounded by lofty and beautiful trees. In the rickyard I counted twenty-two ricks of one sort and another. The hills shelter the house and the yard and the trees most completely, from every wind but the south. The arable land goes down before the house, and spreads along the edge of the down, going, with a gentle slope, down to the meadows, so that going along the turnpike road, which runs between the lower fields of the arable land, you see the large and beautiful flocks of sheep upon the sides of the down, while the horned cattle are up to their eyes in grass in the meadows. Just when I was coming along here, the sun was about half an hour high, it shined through the trees most brilliantly, and to crown the whole I met, just as I was entering the village, a very pretty girl who was apparently going a-gleaning in the fields. I asked her the name of the place, and when she told me it was Bishop's Trow, she pointed to the situation of the church, which she said was on the other side of the river. She really put me in mind of these pretty girls at Preston, who spat upon the individual of the Derby family, and I made her a bow accordingly. The whole of the population of the twenty-four parishes down this vale amounts to only eleven thousand one hundred and ninety-five souls, according to the official return to Parliament, and mind I include the parish of Fisherton Anger, a suburb of the city of Salisbury, which contains eight hundred and ninety-three of the number. I include the town of Hatesbury, with its one thousand twenty-three souls, and I further include this very good and large market-town of Warminster, with its population of five thousand so that I leave in the other twenty-one parishes only four thousand one hundred and seventy souls, men, women, and children, that is to say, a hundred and ninety-eight souls to each parish, or reckoning five to a family, thirty-nine families to each parish. Above one half of the population never could be expected to be in the church at one time, so that here are one in twenty churches built for the purpose of holding two thousand and eighty people. There are several of these churches, any one of which would conveniently contain the whole of these people, the two thousand and eighty. The church of Bishop's Trow would contain the whole of the two thousand and eighty very well indeed, and it is curious enough to observe that the churches of Fisherton Anger, Hatesbury and Warminster, though quite sufficient to contain the people that go to church, are none of them nearly so big as several of the village churches. All these churches are built long and long before the reign of Richard the Second, that is to say, they were founded long before that time, and if the first churches were gone, these others were built in their stead. There is hardly one of them that is not as old as the reign of Richard the Second, and yet that impudent Scotchman, George Chalmers, would make us believe that in the reign of Richard the Second, the population of the country was hardly anything at all. He has the impudence, or the gross ignorance, to state the population of England and Wales at two millions, which, as I have shown in the last number of the Protestant Reformation, would allow only twelve able men to every parish church throughout the kingdom. What, I ask, for about the thousandth time I ask it, what were these twenty churches built for? Some of them stand within a quarter of a mile of each other. They are pretty nearly as close to each other as the churches in London and Westminster are. What a monstrous thing, to suppose that they were built without there being people to go to them, and built too without money and without hands. The whole of the population in these twenty-one parishes could stand, and without much crowding too, in the bottoms of the towers of the several churches. Nay, in three or four of the parishes the whole of the people could stand in the church porches. Then the church yards show you how numerous the population must have been. You see in some cases, only here and there, the mark of a grave, where the churchyard contains from half an acre to an acre of land, and sometimes more. In short, everything shows that here was once a great and opulent population, that there was an abundance to eat, to wear, and to spare, that all the land that is now under cultivation— and a great deal that is not now under cultivation, was under cultivation in former times. The Scotch beggars would make us believe that we sprang from beggars. The impudent scribes would make us believe that England was formerly nothing at all till they came to enlighten it and fatten upon it. Let the beggars answer me this question. Let the impudent, the brazen scribes, that impose upon the credulous and cowed-down English, let them tell me why these twenty-one churches were built, what they were built for, why the large churches of the two Codfords were stuck up within a few hundred yards of each other, if the whole of the population could then, as it can now, be crammed into the chancel of either of the two churches. Let them answer me this question, or shut up their mouths upon this subject, on which they have told so many lies. 
as to the produce of this valley it must be at least ten times as great as its consumption even if we include the three towns that belong to it i am sure i saw produce enough in five or six of the farmyards or rickyards to feed the whole of the population of the twenty-one parishes but the infernal system causes it all to be carried away not a bit of good beef or mutton or veal and scarcely a bit of bacon is left for those who raise all this food and wool the labourers here look as if they were half starved they answer extremely well to the picture that fortescue gave of the french in his day talk of liberty indeed civil and religious liberty the inquisition with a bellyful is far preferable to a state of things like this for my own part i really am ashamed to ride a fat horse to have a full belly and to have a clean shirt upon my back while i look at these wretched countrymen of mine while i actually see them reeling with weakness when i see their poor faces present me nothing but skin and bone while they are toiling to get the wheat and the meat ready to be carried away to be devoured by the tax-eaters i am ashamed to look at these poor souls and to reflect that they are my countrymen and particularly to reflect that we are descended from those amongst whom beef pork mutton and veal were the food of the poorer sort of people what and is the emigration committee sitting to invent the means of getting rid of some part of the thirty-nine families that are employed in raising the immense quantities of food in each of these twenty-one parishes are there schemers to go before this conjuration committee wiltshire schemers to tell the committee how they can get rid of a part of these one hundred and ninety-eight persons to every parish are there schemers of this sort of work still while no man no man at all not a single man says a word about getting rid of the dead weight or the supernumerary parsons both of whom have actually a premium given them for breeding and are filling the country with idlers we are reversing the maxim of the scripture our laws almost say that those that work shall not eat and those who do not work shall have the food i repeat that the baseness of the english landowners surpasses that of any other men that ever lived in the world the cowards know well that the labourers that give value to their land are skin and bone they are not such brutes as not to know that this starvation is produced by taxation they know well how unjust it is to treat their labourers in this way they know well that there goes down the common foot-soldier's single throat more food than is allowed by them to a labourer his wife and three children they know well that the present standing army in time of peace consumes more food and raiment than a million of the labourers consume ay than two millions of them consume if you include the women and the children they well know these things they know that their poor labourers are taxed to keep this army in fatness and in splendour they know that the dead weight which in the opinion of most men of sense ought not to receive a single farthing of the public money swallow more of good food than a third or fourth part of the real labourers of england swallow they know that a million and a half of pounds sterling was taken out of the taxes partly raised upon the labourers to enable the poor clergy of the church of england to marry and to breed they know that a regulation has been recently adopted by which an old dead-weight man is enabled to sell his dead-weight to a young man and that thus this burden would if the system were to be continued be rendered perpetual they know that a good slice of the dead-weight money goes to hanover and that even these hanoverians can sell their dead-weight claim upon us the country gentlemen fellows know all this they know that the poor labourers including all the poor manufacturers pay one half of their wages in taxes to support all these things and yet not a word about these things is ever said or even hinted by these mean these cruel these cowardly these carrion these dastardly reptiles sir james graham of netherby who i understand is a young fellow instead of an old one may invoke our pity upon these ancient families but he will invoke in vain it was their duty to stand forward and prevent power of imprisonment bills six acts ellenborough's act poaching transportation act new trespass act sunday tolls and the hundreds of other things that could be named on the contrary they were the cause of them all they were the cause of all the taxes and all the debts and now let them take the consequences saturday september second after i got to warminster yesterday it began to rain which stopped me in my way to froome in somersetshire which lies about seven or eight miles from this place but as i meant to be quite in the northern part of the county by to-morrow noon or thereabouts i took a post-chaise in the afternoon of yesterday and went to froome where i saw upon my entrance into the town between two and three hundred weavers 
men and boys, cracking stones, moving earth, and doing other sorts of work, towards making a fine road into the town. I drove into the town, and through the principal streets, and then I put my chase up a little at one of the inns. This appears to be a sort of little Manchester, a very small Manchester indeed, for it does not contain above ten or twelve thousand people, but it has all the flash of a Manchester, and the innkeepers and their people look and behave like the Manchester fellows. I was, I must confess, glad to find proofs of the irretrievable decay of the place. I remembered how ready the bluff manufacturers had been to call in the troops of various descriptions. Let them, said I to myself, call the troops in now, to make their trade revive. Let them now resort to their friends of the yeomanry and of the army. Let them now threaten their poor workmen with the jail, when they dare to ask for the means of preventing starvation in their families. Let them who have in fact lived and thriven by the sword now call upon the parson magistrate to bring out the soldiers to compel me, for instance, to give thirty shillings a yard for the superfine black broad cloth made at Froome, which Mr. Rowe at Kensington offered me at seven shillings and sixpence a yard just before I left home. Yes, these men have ground down into powder those who are earning them their fortunes. Let the grinders themselves now be ground, and according to the usual wise and just course of providence. Let them be crushed by the system which they have delighted in, because it made others crouch beneath them. Their poor work people cannot be worse off than they long have been. The parish pay which they now get upon the roads is two shillings sixpence a week for a man, two shillings for his wife, one shilling threepence for each child under eight years of age, threepence a week in addition to each child above eight who can go to work, and if the children above eight years old, whether girls or boys, do not go to work upon the road, they have nothing. Thus a family of five people have just as much an eight pence over as goes down the throat of one single foot soldier. But observe, the standing soldier, that truly English institution, has clothing, fuel, candle, soap, and house-rent, over and above what is allowed to this miserable family." and yet the base reptiles, who are called country gentlemen, and whom Sir James Graham calls upon us to commit all sorts of acts of injustice in order to preserve, never utter a whisper about the expense of keeping the soldiers, while they are everlastingly railing against the working people of every description, and representing them, and them only, as the cause of the loss of their estates. These poor creatures at Froome have pawned all their things, or nearly all. All their best clothes, their blankets and sheets, their looms, any little piece of furniture that they had, and that was good for anything. Mothers have been compelled to pawn all the tolerably good clothes that their children had. In case of a man having two or three shirts, he is left with only one, and sometimes without any shirt. And though this is a sort of manufacture that cannot very well come to a complete end, still it has received a blow from which it cannot possibly recover. The population of this room has been augmented to the degree of one-third, within the last six or seven years, there are here all the usual signs of accommodation bills, and all false paper stuff called money, new houses in abundance half finished, new gingerbread places of worship, as they are called, great swaggering inns, parcels of swaggering fellows going about, with a vulgarity imprinted upon their countenances, but with good clothes upon their backs. I found the working people at Froome very intelligent, very well informed as to the cause of their misery, not at all humbugged by the canters, whether about religion or loyalty. When I got to the inn, I sent my post-chase boy back to the road, to tell one or two of the weavers to come to me at the inn. The landlord did not at first like to let such ragged fellows upstairs. I insisted, however, upon their coming up, and I had a long talk with them. They were very intelligent men, had much clearer views of what is likely to happen than the pretty gentlemen of Whitehall seem to have, and it is curious enough that they, these common weavers, should tell me that they thought that the trade never would come back again to what it was before or rather to what it has been for some years past. This is the impression everywhere, that the puffing is over, that we must come back again to something like reality. The first factories that I met with were at a village called Upton Lovell, just before I came to Hatesbury. There they were doing not more than a quarter work. There is only one factory, I believe, here at Warminster, and that has been suspended during the harvest, at any rate. At Froome they are all upon about a quarter work. It is the same at Bradford and Trowbridge, and, as curious a thing as ever was heard of in the world is, that here are, through all these towns, and throughout this country, weavers from the north, singing about the towns ballads of distress. They had been doing it at Salisbury just before I was there. 
The landlord at Hatesbury told me that people that could afford it generally gave them something, and I was told that they did the same at Salisbury. The landlord at Hatesbury told me that every one of them had a license to beg given them, he said, by the government. I suppose it was some pass from a magistrate, though I know of no law that allows of such passes, and a pretty thing it would be to grant such licenses or such passes, when the law so positively commands, that the poor of every parish shall be maintained in and by every such parish. However, all law of this sort, all salutary and humane law, really seems to be drawing towards an end in this now miserable country, where the thousands are caused to wallow in luxury, to be surfeited with food and drink, while the millions are continually on the point of famishing. In order to form an idea of the degradation of the people of this country, and of the abandonment of every English principle, what need we of more than this one disgraceful and truly horrible fact, namely, that the common soldiers of the standing army in time of peace subscribe in order to furnish the meanest of diet to keep from starving the industrious people who are taxed to the amount of one half of their wages, and out of which taxes the very pay of these soldiers comes? Is not this one fact, this disgraceful, this damning fact, is not this enough to convince us that there must be a change, that there must be a complete and radical change, or that England must become a country of the basest slavery that ever disgraced the earth? Devizes, Wiltshire, Sunday morning, 3rd September. I left Warminster yesterday at about one o'clock. It is contrary to my practice to set out at all, unless I can do it early in the morning, but at Warminster I was at the south-west corner of this county, and I had made a sort of promise to be to-day at Highworth, which is at the north-east corner, and which parish indeed joins up to Berkshire. The distance, including my little intended deviations, was more than fifty miles, and not liking to attempt it in one day, I set off in the middle of the day, and got here in the evening, just before a pretty heavy rain came on. Before I speak of my ride from Warminster to this place, I must once more observe that Warminster is a very nice town. Everything belonging to it is solid and good. There are no villainous gingerbread houses running up, and no nasty, shabby, genteel people, no women traipsing about with showy gowns and dirty necks, no Jew-looking fellows with dandy coats, dirty shirts, and half-heels to their shoes. A really nice and good town. It is a great corn-market, one of the greatest in this part of England, and here things are still conducted in the good old honest fashion. The corn is brought and pitched in the market before it is sold, and when sold it is paid for on the nail, and all is over, and the farmers and millers gone home by daylight. Almost everywhere else the corn is sold by sample. It is sold by juggling in a corner. The parties meet and drink first. It is night-work. There is no fair and open market. The mass of the people do not know what the prices are, and all this favours that monopoly which makes the corn change hands many times, perhaps, before it reaches the mouth, leaving a profit in each pair of hands, and which monopoly is, for the greater part, carried on by the villainous tribe of Quakers, none of whom ever work, and all of whom prey upon the rest of the community, as those infernal devils, the wasps, prey upon the bees. Talking of the devil puts one in mind of his imps, and talking of Quakers puts one in mind of Jemmy Cropper of Liverpool. I should like to know precisely, I know pretty nearly, what effect late panic has had, and is having, on Jemmy. Perhaps the reader will recollect that Jemmy told the public, through the columns of Bay Spot Smith, that Cobbett's prophecies were falsified as soon as born. Jemmy, canting Jemmy, has now had time to ruminate on that. But does the reader remember James's project for making Ireland as happy as England? It was simply by introducing cotton factories, steam engines, and power looms. That was all, and there was Jemmy in Ireland speech-making before such lords and such bishops and such squires as God never suffered to exist in the world before. There was Jemmy, showing, proving, demonstrating, that to make the Irish cotton-workers would infallibly make them happy. If it had been now, instead of being two years ago, he might have produced the reports of the starvation committees of Manchester to confirm his opinions. One would think that this instance of the folly and impudence of this canting son of the monopolising sect would cure this public of its proneness to listen to Kant. But nothing will cure it. The very existence of this sect, none of whom ever work, and the whole of whom live like fighting cocks upon the labour of the rest of the community, the very existence of such a sect shows that the nation is almost in its nature a dupe. There has been a great deal of railing against the King of Spain. Not to be called the King of Spain is looked upon as a proof of want of liberality. And what must it be, then, to applaud any of the acts of the King of Spain? This I am about to do, however, 
think Dr. Black of it, what he may. In the first place, the mass of the people of Spain are better off, better fed, better clothed, than the people of any other country in Europe, and much better than the people of England are. That is one thing, and that is almost enough of itself. In the next place, the King of Spain has refused to mortgage the land and labour of his people for the benefit of an infamous set of Jews and jobbers. Next, the King of Spain has most essentially thwarted the Six Axe people, the Manchester 16th of August, the Parson Hay, the Sidmouth Circular, the Dungeoning, the Ogden's Rupture people. He has thwarted and most cuttingly annoyed these people, who are also the poacher-transporting people, and the new trespass law, and the apple felony, and the horse police, or gendarmerie, and the Sunday toll people. The King of Spain has thwarted all these, and he has materially assisted in blowing up the brutal big fellows of Manchester, and therefore I applaud the King of Spain. I do not much like weasels, but I hate rats, and therefore I say, success to the weasels. But there is one act of the King of Spain, which is worthy of the imitation of every king, ay, and of every republic too, his edict for taxing traffickers which edict was published about eight months ago. It imposes a pretty heavy annual tax on every one who is a mere buyer and seller, and who neither produces, nor consumes, nor makes, nor changes the state of, the article or articles that he buys and sells. Those who bring things into the kingdom are deemed producers, and those who send things out of the kingdom are deemed changes of the state of things. These two classes embrace all legitimate merchants. Thus, then, the farmer who produces corn and meat and wool and wood is not taxed, nor is the coachmaster, who buys the corn to give to his horses, nor the miller, who buys it to change the state of it, nor the baker, who buys the flour to change its state, nor is the manufacturer, who buys the wool to change its state, and so on. But the Jew or Quaker, the mere dealer, who buys the corn of the producer to sell it to the miller, and to deduct a profit, which must at last fall upon the consumer, this Jew or Quaker, or self-styled Christian, who acts the part of Jew or Quaker, is taxed by the King of Spain, and for this I applaud the King of Spain. If we had a law like this, the pestiferous sect of non-labouring, sleek and fat hypocrites could not exist in England, but ours is altogether a system of monopolies, created by taxation and paper money, from which monopolies are inseparable. It is notorious that the brewer's monopoly is the master even of the government. It is well known to all who examine and reflect that a very large part of our bread comes to our mouths loaded with the profit of nine or ten or more different dealers. And I shall, as soon as I have leisure, prove as clearly as anything ever was proved, that the people pay two millions of pounds a year in consequence of the monopoly in tea. That is to say, they pay two millions a year more than they would pay, were it not for the monopoly. And mind, I do not mean the monopoly of the East India Company, but the monopoly of the Quaker and other tea-dealers, who buy the tea of that company." The people of this country are eaten up by monopolies. These compel those who labour to maintain those who do not labour, and hence the success of the crafty crew of Quakers, the very existence of which sect is a disgrace to the country. Besides the corn market at Warminster, I was delighted and greatly surprised to see the meat. Not only the very finest veal and lamb that I had ever seen in my life, but so exceedingly beautiful that I could hardly believe my eyes. I am a great connoisseur in joints of meat a great judge, if five and thirty years of experience can give sound judgment. I verily believe that I have bought and have roasted more whole sirloins of beef than any man in England. I know all about the matter. A very great visitor of Newgate Market. In short, though a little eater, I am a very great provider. It is a fancy. I like the subject, and therefore I understand it. And with all this knowledge of the matter, I say, I never saw veal and lamb half so fine as what I saw at Warminster." The town is famed for fine meat, and I knew it, and therefore I went out in the morning to look at the meat. It was, too, twopence a pound cheaper than I left it at Kensington. My road from Warminster to Devizes lay through Westbury, a nasty, odious, rotten borough, a really rotten place. It has cloth factories in it, and they seem to be ready to tumble down, as well as many of the houses. God's curse seems to be upon most of these rotten boroughs. After coming through this miserable hole, I came along, on the north side of the famous hill, called Bratton Castle, so renowned in the annals of the Romans, and of Alfred the Great. Westbury is a place of great ancient grandeur, on the north side of the famous hill, and it is easy to perceive that it was once ten or twenty times its present size. My road was now the line of separation between what they call South Wilts 
and north wilts the former consisting of high and broad downs and narrow valleys with meadows and rivers running down them the latter consisting of a rather flat and closed country the former having a chalk bottom the latter a bottom of marl clay or flat stone the former a country for lean sheep and corn and the latter a country for cattle fat sheep cheese and bacon the former by far to my taste the most beautiful and i am by no means sure that it is not all things considered the most rich all my way along till i came very near to devizes i had the steep and naked downs up to my right and the flat and enclosed country to my left very near to bratton castle which is only a hill with deep ditches on it is the village of eddington so famed for the battle fought here by alfred and the danes the church in this village would contain several thousands of persons and the village is reduced to a few straggling houses the land here is very good better than almost any i ever saw as black and apparently as rich as the land in the market gardens at fulham the turnips are very good all along here for several miles but this is indeed singularly fine and rich land the orchards very fine finely sheltered and the crops of apples and pears and walnuts very abundant walnuts ripe now a month earlier than usual after eddington i came to a hamlet called earl stoke the houses of which stand at a few yards from each other on the two sides of the road every house is white and the front of every one is covered with some sort or other of clematis or with rose trees or jasmines it was easy to guess that the whole belonged to one owner and that owner i found to be a mr watson taylor whose very pretty seat is close by the hamlet and in whose park pond i saw what i never saw before namely some black swans they are not nearly so large as the white nor are they so stately in their movements they are a meaner bird highworth wiltshire monday fourth september i got here yesterday after a ride including my deviations of about thirty-four miles and that too without breaking my fast before i got into the rotten borough of Carn, i had two tributes to pay to the aristocracy namely two sunday tolls and i was resolved that the country in which these tolls were extorted should have not a farthing of my money that i could by any means keep from it therefore i fasted until i got into the free quarters in which i now am i would have made my horse fast too if i could have done it without the risk of making him unable to carry me End of chapter twenty two